Chapter 1 North Pleasant Street, Amherst, Massachusetts, 2013 Special Agent Nora Wexler hadn't been this excited about getting into a boy's bedroom since she was 16 years old. The only problem was that the handsome and well-built guy standing next to her felt more like a chaperone than a date. But even if Agent Travis Greer wasn't exactly gung-ho about this mission that led them to the plain brown door of apartment 2B, right above a Starbucks near UMass Amherst campus, it wasn't going to stop her from savoring the pleasure of taking down a particularly slimy perp. Casting a coy grin at Greer, she reached out and knocked twice on the door. He sighed, crossing his arms and slightly widening his stance. It was showtime. Rap music playing behind the door suddenly ceased, and Nora noticed a flicker in the center of the peephole before the door swung open to reveal a slim man wearing a thin gray T-shirt and a tight pair of jeans. In his early 20s, with moosed hair, he blinked when he took stock of them, but leaned comfortably against the door frame with one arm over his head. Are you Milo Lotus? Nora asked. Yeah. Is there something I can help you with? He asked, taking a moment to look her up and down. You have no idea, Nora thought, that the young man didn't suspect them was written all over his narrow, well-tanned face. It shot another thrill down Nora's spine that someone who had done what he did could look them in the eye and not realize what kind of trouble he was in. I'm Agent Wexler, and this is Agent Greer of the FBI. If you don't mind, we'd like to ask you a few questions. It should only take a couple of minutes, she said. Lotus pushed off from the doorframe, glanced at their creds, and shrugged. Sure, whatever. Come on in, he said, turning his back and taking a few steps into his loft apartment. Her eyes lighting up, Nora looked again at Greer, who nodded in return and gestured for her to lead the way in. The two of them had made a bet on the way over that she'd be able to get them in without a warrant or help from the landlord. She knew guys like Milo Lotus. They were laid back, cocky, and had the impression that they could do whatever they wanted with impunity. Lotus slid into a black swivel office chair positioned by a desk underneath his loft bed. Except for a pile of dirty clothes in one corner, the room was cleaner than she would have thought. He had some shoe boxes arranged below a green futon against the opposite wall, near a dresser with bottles of cologne, deodorant, and a few condoms on top. Lacrosse equipment hung in an open closet. A browning plant, maybe a gift from Mom, sat on the long window sill overlooking the street. To her disappointment, there was nothing incriminating on the walls, as she had suspected there would be. Before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Nora asked as she moved toward the center of the room. From here, she could see the laptop on the desk and the screensaver, depicting a white box bouncing around on a black background. All right, he said, pursing his lips. You already know my name. I'm a senior at Amherst studying engineering. I play lacrosse on a club team here, which is kind of a rip because I started in high school. Twenty-two years old. Is there anything else you need to know? Is this about the hazing going on at one of the frats? I heard about that, but I'm not really involved with him. Looking down at him in his chair, Nora shook her head. She kept her eyes fixed on him, carefully appraising his every expression. This isn't about that. Tell me, do you know Kelly Austerlich, the striker on the U.S. women's soccer team? Before he could even answer, Lotus clenched his jaw and glanced at her with momentary alarm. He must have realized his pronounced expression made it pointless to lie. Yeah, we went to high school together back in Brookline, he said. Lotus looked over at Greer, perhaps noticing for the first time that he was standing directly in front of the exit and nothing short of a Mack truck would be able to get through. Special Agent Travis Greer had spent two tours in Iraq after 9-11 before making the jump to the FBI, where he'd been ever since. Tough as nails and eminently resourceful, he was a tried-and-true agent in his early thirties, and he had the kind of looks that could make a woman forget her own name to boot. Sort of like Tom Selleck, without the mustache. Nora cleared her throat to draw Lotus's attention back to her. 
School records made it obvious the two had known each other, but Nora wondered how much further she'd have to go before he felt he needed to lie. Were you too close? Nora asked. You mean with Kelly? Not really, he said. Behind his eyes, his thoughts must have been running a mile a minute. Trying to recapture some of his cool after his curt response, he added, The lacrosse team and the soccer team didn't mix much, outside of the occasional party. And have you kept in contact with her since? Nah, haven't heard from her since high school. So close. But did you try to contact her? Send her messages or emails or anything? Nope. There might have been some group emails or something we were both a part of. But I'm not even sure I know what her email address is, he said. Just kind of drifted our separate ways, I guess. I haven't really thought about it. This time, Nora was the one who had to hold her expression in check. Lotus's comment put the line between truth and fiction in stark relief. She was well aware that he'd tried to contact Kelly many, many times since high school, and when his emails didn't receive the responses he wanted, something much darker had taken their place. Really? You wouldn't happen to be aware that Kelly Austerlich has been receiving threatening messages off and on via Twitter from an account named DriveTide151 for almost two years now, would you? I'm talking about the kind of vile and malicious comments that would make your stomach turn. At one point, the owner of the account promised to rape her with the barrel of a gun and fill her with lead from the bottom up before driving her body around to show everyone what she was made of. Lotus cringed. If Nora hadn't already known the truth, she might have mistaken the performance for an authentic reaction. It took someone with a truly black soul to use anonymous accounts to stalk and harass young women over the Internet, making them feel powerless to stop the never-ending stream of attacks. That's horrible. What kind of person would do that? My thoughts exactly, Nora agreed, careful not to lay it on too thick lest she tip her hand. There was one interesting detail in the hundreds of messages sent from Drive Tight 151. The particular car the account owner threatened to prop her up in was a Jaguar F-Type R. That's one pricey car. Have you ever heard of it? But Lotus's peering squint through his boyish dark brown eyes told her he was starting to put it together, that he was in the hot seat. He didn't squirm exactly, just shifted forward to give her more of his attention. His confidence was still there, a reminder of how in his head he was miles away from that account and those very public threats of rape and murder. Nah, I've never heard of that kind of car before. Wait, you don't think that I'm the one sending those messages, do you? I told you I've basically forgotten about her, he said. Nora exchanged a quick look with Greer, who nodded almost imperceptibly. Now he was convinced. So you are not the owner of the Twitter account, DriveTide151? No. Then you have nothing to worry about. After all, anybody can create an email address and Twitter account in a couple of minutes without giving any personal information, making it extremely tough to find out who the owner is. But details like that car do help. Here's another question. Have you ever visited or used the web forum Motor Monkeys? Nora asked. Never heard of it. I'm not really into cars, Lotus said. His breathing grew shallow now, another crack in his iron facade. Let me tell you, then, that there's one user there named Los Gatos, whose favorite car in the world is the Jaguar F-Type R. It's his avatar, something he knows every detail of, and he gets into long arguments about the entire Jaguar line. But despite the anonymity of this account, some revealing details crept in. First, a few months ago, he made a comment about how annoying rotaries are. So what? Lots of people like jaguars, and just as many don't like rotaries, Lotus cut in, rolling his eyes and fully displaying his annoyance with the situation for the first time. You might not be aware, but there's only one state in the country that refers to them as rotaries. Roundabouts, traffic circles. You won't find them called rotaries in any place except Massachusetts. 
That means whoever owns these accounts has to not only be in this state, but has to have been here for a long time, Nora explained to Lotus, who grew increasingly guarded. I'm sure I'm the only one Kelly Austerlich knows from Massachusetts, the state she grew up in, he said, his voice dripping with sarcasm. But he was in too deep, and he didn't know what to do. Two FBI agents were in his apartment, cornering him about something he probably didn't even realize was illegal. There was one more piece of the puzzle left. Los Gatos made one more comment that was instructive. He was a little freer with personal details because he'd developed some friendships. And last spring, he said something about how much he'd rather be tearing up the road than learning about amino acids. It sounded a lot like someone taking organic chemistry, which you mentioned preparing for the final of on your personal Facebook page right around the same time. Can you confirm you took organic chemistry here at UMass Amherst last spring? This time, Nora allowed herself a smile as Lotus's mouth hung open and his face grew paler. It all finally hit home. He couldn't bring himself to answer, couldn't produce a lie that would be so easily disproven. Nora leaned in and hunched over, careful to leave some room between herself and the young man, just a few years younger than herself, who was about to lose his freedom. He was nearly hyperventilating and could do something unpredictable. After hundreds of comments across three different accounts, he'd given himself away. Mr. Lotus, we're here because we know you're the one who's been tormenting Kelly Austerlich, telling her over and over in countless different ways how you're going to catch her one day when she's alone, rape her, and murder her. You said you were never close to her, but what you left out was that you were never as close as you wanted. People you knew in high school told us how you'd repeatedly asked her out and referred to her as your girlfriend, even when she kept rejecting you. Then you resented her national athletic success, which ate away at you after you couldn't even make it onto your school's lacrosse team after four years of trying. That's why you decided it was time to carry out your plans. Cyberstalking is a serious crime, one that you'll have plenty of time to think about from a cozy prison cell. This is ridiculous, Lotus gasped as a bead of sweat trickled down his temple. You have no proof at all. Some accounts and what, some words? I didn't do any of this. I'm calling my lawyer. The both of you can get out now. Lotus stood up abruptly, which knocked his rolling chair back against his desk. The impact shook the mouse enough to dispel the screensaver, revealing a desktop background of a sleek blue Jaguar F-Type R. Nora noticed, and then Milo looked over his shoulder to see, his eyes going blank, cheeks slack, and mouth open as if he couldn't find any air to breathe in the room. Just then, Agent Greer took a step from the door and slid his foot under the pile of clothes, kicking out the box for a brand new 44 Magnum still in its original packaging. Milo Lotus, I'm placing you under arrest, Nora said, removing a pair of cuffs. The young man was broken, the guilt oozing out of his every pore. Agent Greer took a step closer to help restrain their suspect. He gave Nora a warm nod and a pat on the back. Sounds like an airtight case to me, Greer said in his thick, manly voice. There's only one thing I'm puzzled about. What's Twitter? Chapter 2 I-90 West, Massachusetts Travis Greer may not have known about Twitter or most of those Internet time sucks, but he did know a few things concerning Agent Wexler's case that she didn't have a clue about and wasn't going to like. After handing off Milo Lotus to the local PD, where he'd be detained, Travis and Agent Wexler had climbed into their black sedan to take the mass pike back to their field office in Albany where they'd report back to Special Agent Lance Boffman and handle the necessary paperwork. Neither task held much appeal to Travis, but there was a light at the end of the tunnel. You must be feeling pretty good about yourself, Travis said, after noticing Agent Wexler smiling as she watched the trees fly by. She was a strawberry blonde with a perfect profile no man could fail to notice. With dark blue eyes, high cheekbones, and hair hanging over half her forehead that was otherwise wrapped in a tight bun behind her head, it was a wonder she hadn't gone into modeling. 
but from the moment Travis had met her, he could tell some inner drive was pushing her onward. I can't get over how oblivious these guys are to breaking the law. They think because it's the Internet there aren't any rules, that it's some mad free-for-all built entirely for their amusement. But we took a step toward changing that today. Do you think this will get much coverage in the papers? She asked, looking over at him. It's hard to say, Travis said, without taking his eyes off the road. But he knew the answer well enough. Without a grisly body or a big pile of money or drugs involved, the best this story could hope for was a blurb buried in the back pages. He couldn't tell her that, not when his instructions had been to let her run the show, even though it was her first case, and the way she operated it was the antithesis of how he would have. Someone's going to want to know about this, Wexler went on, her voice throaty enough to have an edge to it. Even if it's just Kelly Austerlich, that makes it all worth it for me. She'll be able to rest easy tonight. That she will. Be sure to keep that in mind when we get our next case. Anything could come our way, and it's not likely to be as fun as this one. Oh, no, I'm just getting on a roll. This is the beginning of a sea change when it comes to online harassment like this, and I'm going to make sure no one is able to get away with making these kinds of vicious attacks from their keyboards. Almost every woman who speaks out in the public sphere online is immediately introduced to a dark undercurrent of hatred and misogyny that seeks to undermine her credibility and shake her resolve through threats of sexual assault and physical violence. It's not right, and I won't stand for it. Travis pursed his lips and tightened his grip on the wheel as he veered left with the road. He admired her focus, but she didn't understand how things were done. The hope had been that months of training at Quantico and the chance to pursue her own mission right out of the gate, outside of their jurisdiction no less, even spiking the football right in Milo Lotus's face in a way Travis never did, would have calmed her down, but that didn't appear to have worked out at all. Nora. Federal agents aren't always able to pick their own cases or pursue personal goals. There's a lot of pressing stuff going on that Boffman could toss in our laps as soon as we get back, and it's our job to handle it with as much focus and talent as we bring to the table. Then why was I able to open my own case right as soon as I walked in the door? She asked. As an agent, Travis knew an interrogative question when he saw one, and at the moment, he felt just as much pressure as some of those he'd arrested must have. It happened to work out like that, he said, maintaining his composure. He could tell she was already on the verge of figuring out that the entire position at the field office in Albany was a way to placate her father, a senator from a nearby state. Sure, Nora had some impressive talents on the computer and with linguistic analysis, if given 100 sentences written by 99 people, she could tell which two were alike. But she was untested during the rough stuff, and her ability with a firearm was improving but still questionable. She'd made it out of Quantico, but the real training was about to begin. Then maybe it'll happen to work out like that again, she said defiantly, stretching her arms and shifting in her seat. If I want to have the biggest impact, that means I need to be right on the front lines of this battle, really get in up to my ears and all of the nastiness that's out there. That place exists online where every day thousands upon thousands are subjected to cruelness designed to wear down their victims. Social media, texting, email, secret web forums. These electronic methods of communication are right where it all happens and no one's paying any attention. Travis grunted his approval about wanting to be right in the middle of the action, but for him that meant a much different brand of judicial purview. If he had to make a list of his tools of choice, it'd be DNA analysis, facial recognition software, luminol, audio-video surveillance, fingerprints, and last but not least, the Glock he kept at his side. That was what he needed to identify, hunt down, and bring in criminals. Anything else was a distraction. If you ask me, spending that much time on the Internet should be a crime of its own, Travis said, shaking his head. It's the way of the world now, Nora replied, rolling her eyes but smirking as well. I'm serious, 
Travis continued, though he was far from it. You said yourself there's all kinds of horrid behavior online. Maybe we should shut the whole thing down. How bad does it have to get before we decide the idea was bunk and do away with it? Then we could all go back to real living outdoors, where things actually matter. Nora tilted her head toward him. We could. But then you'd have plenty of new neighbors at your next secret campsite in the Adirondacks. Even the thought of it sent a chill down his spine. Oh, good point. Well, until we do away with it all, I don't have any choice but to keep pursuing these cases. And if anybody doesn't like it, they can get their heads screwed on straight and take another look at the law, she said, crossing her arms over her stomach. Travis swallowed as they crossed the Hudson and watched Albany looming ahead of them. Far from getting it out of her system, Nora was about to get a reality check by the name of Lance Boffman, and Travis didn't want to be anywhere nearby when it happened. Chapter 3 FBI Field Office, Albany, New York The one question on Nora Wexler's mind was whom she'd be able to take down next. She felt like some kind of solitary warrior, carrying the banner of justice that everyone would recognize was leading them on a better path. One day, these wouldn't be problems. One day, people would look back on today and wonder why people behaved like this. Sitting in her small office, set apart from the main floor space by thin wooden walls and single glass panes, Nora started filling out her reports with all the depth and detail her memory could muster. There was no way Milo Lotus would be let off the hook because her mind slipped on something he'd said or a point she'd overlooked. But her attention kept drifting to an old manila folder, almost six inches thick, that sat on a chair against the left wall. It was calling to her, demanding action. Other than the folder, she hadn't had time to bring almost anything of her own into her office other than a laptop, phone charger, and a hula girl bobblehead she'd gotten in Hawaii after graduation. When the door to her office creaked open, the lack of a knock signaled the kind of garden-variety rudeness she'd quickly come to expect from the special agent in charge of the Albany division, Lance Boffman. I'm almost done she said, riding with her head down, hoping he'd take it as a hint that now was not the best time for a chat. But the black slacks in her field of vision, just beyond the desk, didn't budge. It wasn't that she didn't want to have great relations with everyone in her office, but Boffman never managed to see her point of view and wasn't the type to give up any ground in an argument. It can wait for a few more minutes, he said, his voice ringing with a strong nasal component to it. She put down her pen and looked up at him with a polite smile. Boffman was in his late thirties, had lost most of his hair, and had a mole near the side of his lips in almost the exact same spot as Cindy Crawford, the way he liked to take long, noisy glugs from a can of Pepsi constantly compelled her to call him Cindy. If you don't mind, I really need to keep focused on this, or I might forget some of the facts. We wouldn't want to spoil the big win we had today, Nora said. Moffman hummed judiciously with his face scrunched up and head tilted to the side. Well, I'd call it a small win if we're being honest about it, but we need to talk about some other active cases we might want to move you into, he said. His hands were clasped and hanging in front of his waist. Nora squinted and cleared her throat. A small win? It's not every day you get to unequivocally improve the life of an American sports icon, she said, causing Boffman to put on a pained look and suck his teeth. To put this in perspective, you arrested a college student for cyber-stalking. He had a license for the gun and no real plan in place to use it. At best, we'll put him away for a few years, and even that might be a struggle, depending on if there's a plea. We have to keep in mind that this is not the most effective way for an agent to spend her time, he said. You think it's a waste of time? Nora shot back. Boffman sighed, and Nora knew she was in for his unvarnished opinion now. 
when I hand this off to the DA's office, they're going to look at me like I have three heads. They'll ask me why my specially trained agents are fishing for minnows when there are sharks out there. Think about the huge amount of resources both the prosecutors and ourselves will have to put in to secure a conviction. It just doesn't make sense, he said, his voice growing louder. But it's the law, and if the punishment isn't enough to satisfy you, then maybe that needs to change. We already have a computer crimes unit, Boffman said, hands on his hips. A short, sharp laugh erupted from Nora's lips. She knew all about the computer crimes unit. <laughs> you mean those guys who hang around in chat rooms all day, playing pedophile bait? I'm not saying that isn't important, but that's not the only kind of computer crime there is. I wanted to get into the Criminal Investigative Division for a reason, and I've got a file right there full of cases that need to be pursued now, she said, growing flushed. She needed to calm down because they were starting to get the attention of people out on the main floor. Being professional was paramount. Lance Boffman was her colleague and boss, who deserved her respect, mole and all, she told herself. Please enlighten me about the contents of your file, he said. Nodding at him, she left her chair and picked up the file, flipping through pages until she found one with a yellow tab on it in the middle. With pleasure. Here we've got a man with twin toddler girls who told a network news anchor that he wanted to cut off her legs and then rape her. Boffman flinched when he heard her. The ugly truth of it was enough to get through to even the most recalcitrant soul. And you want him to go to jail for just one message? Take him away from his girls, even for this? Boffman asked, squinting. Nora clenched her jaw. Everyone needs to know that this kind of harassment is not okay. Some of these people need help, but some do need to go to jail, she said, flipping to a red tab. Like this state representative, who's been using fake accounts to bombard the Facebook page of a colleague over her stances in order to compel her to resign. I just need to investigate these things a little more, but it's all there. Agent Wexler, you and I can't be doing this. This is the FBI, not a touchy-feely sociology class at UC Berkeley. And what I say has to go. Otherwise, you have to go. We're positioned smack dab between New York City and Montreal because of everything that gets carried in between. We can use your help, but you have to follow orders 100% of the time. Sometime in the future, you might be able to do something about that folder of printed screenshots. But until then, I need to know I can count on you. Can I? He said. Nora didn't want to fight, and even though there was something burning in her gut, she knew he was right. She started to see that being in the FBI wouldn't allow her to run her own crusade against one particular type of crime. Their motto was fidelity, bravery, integrity and being a part of the team touched on all of those attributes. This was a wake-up call, one that she decided would be smart to listen to. Yes, you can. The hard steel bar slid slowly up and down the track of the gym's squat machine. Blowing off some steam after a confrontation with Boffman, Nora had worked up quite a sweat. Her T-shirt clung tightly to her moist skin as she flexed her thighs and lifted the bar running along her shoulders. In front of her was the mirror. She strained as she bent her legs and dipped, her breath elevated but controlled. Moving like this allowed her to think. She knew getting into the FBI would mean growing in ways she'd never expected, and at the moment that meant finding a way to prove herself to her colleagues. But would being a great supporter ever give her the opportunity to lead? It seemed like the only option was to find out. The door across the stuffy basement gym cracked open, immediately drawing Nora's attention away from the mirror in front of her. She was the only one working out until Agent Greer walked in and dropped a duffel bag on a bench off to her left, which she could just see in the mirror. He glanced quickly at her, forcing Nora to refocus attention on herself, 
but it was impossible not to notice when he pulled off his shirt and replaced it with a workout tee from his bag. Nora really hoped he didn't catch her eyeing him when he happened to look over at her again. Greer dropped his pants to reveal he was wearing shorts underneath, and Nora nearly lost control of the bar. That was enough for that set. Taking a step away from the squat machine and doing her best to mind her own business, she noticed him walking over to her with a water bottle in hand. I haven't explored the entire building, but I'm pretty sure there are changing rooms, she said, eliciting a carefree shrug from him. A little quieter down here, isn't it? he asked, his point stinging, even if he tried to be casual about it. I'm sure that was pretty bad, she said, looking up at him. For a moment she wondered if he tried to touch her shoulder or hand as a show of sympathy, but he didn't. Boffman's been known to raise his voice from time to time, so I wouldn't take that part of it personally. My only bit of seasoned advice— seasoned like self-caught venison with Montreal steak seasoning, of course, is for you to realize that the Bureau is like a moose. It's always moving, but it moves slowly. Take the long view, he said. So there was something else to take personally. Nora sighed and shook her head. It was time to do her last set. I'm not going to apologize about the issues I'm most invested in, but I get that the impact I can have here is bigger than any one area. I'll have my head in whatever pops up next, and we can tackle it together, I promise. Agent Greer grinned and nodded in a rueful sort of way that was puzzling. That sounds good, except I won't be around to do it with you. I'm leaving. What? Nora asked, unable to hold back her concern. He was the only one in the office that she'd kind of, sort of, gotten to know. The only one in the entire city, for that matter. Did you request a transfer to somewhere else? You're not hanging it up for good, are you? He threw his head back and chuckled before crossing his thick arms in front of his chest. Not yet I'm not, but I have earned a couple weeks of honest-to-goodness vacation. I'm flying back home to Seattle in a few hours to visit my family. A little fishing, a little trapping, a little hunting. What more could a person ask for? Greer explained, getting a hazy shine in his eyes as if he were already there. Don't you see enough dead things at work? Most people try to do something different on their vacations. You're lucky the animal kingdom doesn't have any enforcement of its own, because it sounds like you're about to go on a rampage, Nora said, amused. I guess I am, but it is different. You've got to respect the habitat you're drawing from. If I ever have a son someday... I'd want him to be able to enjoy these same kinds of activities. But not a daughter? Nora asked. Greer blinked as if he'd just woken up. I'd take a daughter out, too. No question about it, he said. Nora nodded in general agreement. That last set was calling to her. When she didn't say anything, Greer scratched the back of his head and looked over at his bag. I guess I'd better get started if I'm going to squeeze this work out in before my flight leaves. I'll let you get back to it. Good luck with your next assignment. I'm sure you'll do fine. Just don't stick your butt out, he said, turning away. Huh? Nora asked. Of all the investigative metaphors she'd heard, sticking her butt out wasn't one she was familiar with. You're lifting with your back and throwing out your rear end, he said stopping but not turning to look at her. No, I'm not. I know how to do a squat, and I've been doing them since track in high school, she said. I know what I saw, Greer said, taking a sip of water from his bottle and holding back laughter. He shook his head at her. This wasn't something she could let go. Get over here, she said, ducking under the bar and facing the mirror. Pulling the bar's hooks off the supports, she slowly lowered down and then straightened up. There, that's what I'm talking about. Your center of gravity is too far behind the bar. You've got to keep underneath it by bending your knees. Don't look at the mirror in front of you. Look at the one to your right and you'll see. Gritting her teeth at the prospect of being wrong about her form, she looked to the right and saw she was being a little lazy about keeping her back straight. I'm just doing it now on purpose, so you don't feel bad about being mistaken. I don't mind at all. 
Chapter 4 Southwest Thistle Street, Seattle, Washington Agent Greer hadn't spent a full day in Seattle before a call came in from his boss back in Albany. He'd just hopped back in his father's pickup truck after making a quick run for pancake mix and milk, which he tossed onto the passenger seat before his phone started going off in his pocket. Looking at the number, he knew making it out to the wilderness wasn't likely to happen today. You calling to wish me a relaxing vacation? Travis asked, leaning back against the seat. We've got a situation, Boffman said. They'd worked together long enough that his superior must have known it only took a few words like those to capture his interest. Travis scratched his neck as he noticed a surge in awareness. He loved hunting animals, but he loved hunting criminals more. Tell me. There's a high-speed chase north on I-5, somebody making a break for the border, that's left both the local PD and our guys with their hands full. Special agent in charge Lawrence Johnson put the word out that they could use a hand with a body discovered in one of the office buildings, downtown at Fifth and Pike, he said. Travis was already licking his chops. A chase had obvious appeal, but the odds were high it'd be over by the time he caught up. On the other hand, showing up first to the report of a body was not something he'd ever passed up in his career. This time wouldn't be any different. What's the deal with a body? he asked, keeping his excitement in check. Boffman cleared his throat and coughed. Oh, we don't know much. Just the Jenny Iverson, executive of a company called Team Think, found it and made the call to us herself. She was in hysterics and the call seemed to disconnect involuntarily. We need to get somebody over there now, Boffman explained. Travis already had the car in gear and was thinking how lucky it was he still had the bag in the back of the truck with his FBI jacket and 9 millimeter. I'm on it, Travis said, ending the call and taking two seconds to text his family that brunch would have to wait. An instant later, he was listening to the roar of the truck's engine as he tore through the streets toward the waterfront area, the crystal blue of Elliott Bay to his left. The body must have been gruesome for the executive to lose it like that, or there was still a chance she was in danger. Either way, it must have been the last thing anyone at those corporate offices expected to deal with when they made it to work this morning. Traffic kept him from getting there as fast as he would have liked, but a few creative driving maneuvers landed him in a parking spot nearby that just happened to be open. There was no commotion on the street, nothing to indicate an out-of-the-ordinary situation. By the time he'd climbed out of the truck and thrown on his FBI jacket, he'd noticed a receptionist on the ground floor sitting idly at her desk. An active threat seemed to be off the table, but Travis grabbed the 9mm anyway. Team think? Travis asked the stunned receptionist as he brushed by toward the elevators, careful not to scare her further by revealing his weapon. Tenth floor, she replied. Have you heard anything? No. The elevator doors opened, and Travis pushed the appropriate button, still ravenously curious to find out what was going on upstairs. His mind spun with possible scenarios that would lead to a dead body in an executive's office. An accident with a hypochondriac? An old man having a heart attack? A suicide? A disgruntled employee who lost control? At this point, one guess was as good as another. But if experience was any guide, the truth was likely to be stranger than all of them. When the elevator doors opened to reveal a narrow hallway with gray carpet and white walls adorned with the drawings of children, an entirely new set of possibilities opened up. A feeling of dread bloomed that something had happened to a kid somehow, which Travis wasn't eager to stumble upon. Not that he'd ever admit it. But he was a softy when it came to kids, and it tore him up inside when anything happened to them. But just a few steps down the hall showed no signs of children. Travis exchanged glances with a couple of worried people sitting in offices, seemingly doing nothing. He turned the corner to find a large woman leaving her desk to approach him. Thank goodness you're here. I'll show you to Jenny's office right away, she said, producing an anxious smile. Thank you. Travis said. Is there anything you can tell me? The receptionist shot him a petrified look. It's ghastly. Jenny is inconsolable. Hating going in blind, 
Travis found the situation growing even more uncomfortable when the receptionist led him into a spacious, professional-looking office and gave him a special introduction. Hey, Jenny, there's a sexy agent here to see you, she said in the same kind of voice one would use to tempt a child with ice cream. Jenny Iverson sat on the floor against a heater where she'd been weeping softly until she heard her name and staggered to her feet. She had on a long brown skirt and thick-knit sweater. Travis guessed she was in her mid-thirties and probably looked quite fetching when she wasn't in such a downtrodden state. The receptionist winked at Travis and glanced at his backside as she left, leaving him to scan a mostly immaculate room. The only body was that of the fragile executive trying to compose herself. There was nothing behind her desk, near her couches, or under a table, which supported an open package. No doors suggested there were adjoining closets or washrooms. Travis was about to conclude that the body had been a complete fabrication until a strange, putrid smell hit his nose. What was going on here? The only one who seemed able to tell him had finally wiped away her tears and pulled the silky brown hair from her face. Ms. Iverson, I'm Agent Travis Greer, he said, showing his creds. Please call me Jenny, she said. Thank you for coming so quickly. I don't think I've ever been so far beside myself with grief. Travis nodded, trying to be sympathetic, but still not having any clue what was going on or where the body was, began to frustrate him. The call we got was about a body. We'll be getting a forensics team in here as soon as we can. But right now I'm going to need to see it. Can you point me in the right direction? Jenny's eyes welled up again. She cast a long look at the package on the table where the smell emanated from. Only about a foot long and half as tall, he wondered what body part had been dismembered, stuffed in there, and sent to this poor woman. His mind running on all cylinders, it seemed ready to lock up completely with anticipation. The only thing to do was to look in the standard USPS package to see what was inside. When he took a step closer, Jenny yelped and clutched her hands to her breast. The smell as he got closer became downright rank, imbuing Travis with a disturbed sense of wonder. Looking over the package, its top open to reveal bits of colorful ribbon like a sick birthday present, Travis spotted bits of blood and orange hair sticking to the sides. Fully cringing, he stood over the table and stared blankly at the severed head of a cat and its mangled body lying inside. Travis wondered how that car chase was going. Then something else snuck into his mind, a thought about what had happened to give everybody the impression there was a dead human body here, and not that of a dismembered feline. Even if Iverson or her assistant had been in hysterics on the phone, whoever had taken the call needed to check for a buildup of earwax. Unable to stomach any more, he turned back to Ms. Iverson, whose composure quickly unraveled in front of him. She had a hand up as she fought to keep the tears out of her eyes, and Travis clasped his hands around hers in a show of comfort. I'm so sorry this happened, he said to her. She gave a halting nod, ventured a look at his eyes, and took a deep breath. Two days ago, Dina went missing. That's my cat's name. I have never in my life let her out of the house except to go to the vet, and there aren't any openings she could have run away through. I searched everywhere without any luck. Then today I show up to work, and I'm not here an hour before an unexpected package is delivered. I opened it up and saw Dina inside. It's hard for me to even remember what happened next. I think I fell to the floor because my elbow hurts, she said, getting more and more agitated. Tears streamed down her left cheek. For Travis, the whole thing was disturbing. There were some truly sick people in the world, and the memory of what he just saw ruined his appetite for hunting. Somebody had mutilated that cat with the sole intent to torture Jenny Iverson. It was terrible, but it was not the FBI's jurisdiction. Ms. Iverson, is there another room we can go to that'll be more comforting to talk in? I'd be happy to stay here with you until someone from the Seattle PD can get here, he said, offering a sympathetic smile and hoping it'd help her feel at least a little better. 
Some agents were miracle workers when it came to soothing victims, but Travis knew he wasn't one of them. He didn't always know what to say, and probably often came off as clinical. Or maybe it was just his luck. Ms. Iverson's eyes narrowed at him, the exact opposite reaction of what he wanted. What about getting the forensics team in here ASAP? What about finding out what sadistic wretch did this to my cat? I called the FBI because I wanted serious help. Greer shook his head, knowing he shouldn't have even been there. Somehow, between the car chase and him being in town, Iverson had gotten lucky and managed immediate but unwarranted attention from the Bureau. I'm very sorry, but the FBI doesn't handle... Oh, I get it, she interrupted, channeling all her grief into full-throated outrage. You think it's just a cat and that I should get over it. This doesn't really matter and you can pass the buck to whatever traffic cop has been sitting on his thumb today. I didn't say that. Did you stop to think for one minute what kind of person would do this to an innocent animal who only wanted to scratch up the couch and poop on the kitchen floor? Or what kind of person would do this to me? What did I ever do to have the one thing I cared most about in my life ripped away and dangled lifelessly in front of me? Can you imagine what this feels like? It would have been terrible if anything had happened to my chocolate lab growing up, Travis said. You're a dog person, Ms. Iverson scoffed, rolling her eyes. Travis did his best to cut her slack. She was acting out and would probably regret this later on. Well, maybe you can take a sniff at this and let me know if this situation still isn't worth any of your time. She went over to her desk and used her forefinger and thumb to gingerly pull a sheet of paper off the edge. What's that? Travis asked, swallowing uncomfortably. As she carried it over, the paper twisted, and he saw it had quite a bit of blood on it, enough to spell out a message. You didn't spend much time looking at it, but the package apparently came from San Antonio. How could my cat be shipped to me standard mail from San Antonio when I only lost her two days ago? How does that even make any sense? But I think when you take a look at this... You'll finally understand that the intention here isn't one to be scoffed at, she explained. When she finally held the paper still, Travis's heart sank when he saw the words, You'll be a lovely addition to my collection, in feline blood that dribbled down the page. Travis nodded regretfully and saw the situation a little more clearly for the first time. If what she said was true, this was more than just a home invasion, theft of property, and a death threat for a successful CEO from across the country. A lot of it depended on what the Seattle Division's agent Johnson wanted to do, but odds were good the FBI would at least have a hand in the investigation of a serial killer. Let's put this down over here, Travis said, directing Iverson to set the paper on the table. We can't add any other contamination to it if we're going to lift any fingerprints and run them through our database. Jenny Iverson complied, her anger fading away almost as quickly as it had come. In its place was an emotional determination. She wanted to see action. That's more like it, she said, smiling faintly but enough to show dimpled cheeks. It struck Travis that he wished he could have met her in better circumstances. Like I said previously, is there somewhere else we can go to that will allow us to settle down and collect our heads? He asked. Nodding, Miss Iverson led him out of the room, past the secretary, and down the hall with the children's art on the wall before turning into what looked like a break room with a noisy old coffee maker. Most of the women who work here with me have small children, so we have a daycare room set up. When I screamed, one of the ladies told them I'd found a gray hair and took them all to the aquarium. We should have plenty of time to talk, she said, claiming a seat on a puffy green couch. Travis sat down across from her on an old black couch without much padding. He leaned forward with his elbows on his knees to engage her, a glass coffee table between them. Can you tell me a bit about your company and what you do here? he asked. Ms. Iverson leaned back and put her hand over her eyes. I'm sorry. I'm having a hard time thinking straight. It feels like my soul is bleeding. 
If you need some time, I can go ahead and make some calls about this now, he said, reaching for the phone in his pocket. But she raised her hand to stop him. Please, not yet. I do want to talk. Team Think has been making collaboration software for businesses and educators for about 10 years now. I founded the company on the day I graduated from college, which was a requirement for the business program I was in at UW, the University of Washington. To be honest, I've given everything I could to this company, which has afforded me a lifestyle I never could have dreamed of. And I love all of the people I work with here, she said. Travis nodded, glad she made it through the warm-up without a hitch. Now he needed something concrete from her that he could act on to bring this death threat to rest. I want you to think carefully here, he said, giving her a long look that she didn't shy away from. Do you have any idea who might have done this to you? Is there anybody you consider an enemy or who has threatened you in the past? Ms. Iverson smacked her lips and ran her hand through her hair. After glancing over at the gurgling coffee pot, she rubbed her palms against her thighs. I really can't think of anyone who would possibly do this. I have to say, I'm on pretty good terms with everyone I know in the office park here, in town, and even among my competitors, she said. Travis looked her over again. He knew an optimist when he saw one, and it was possible her generally bright disposition clouded her perception of other people. Packages like the one she received today didn't come by accident. As charming as you are, there must be someone out there who doesn't like you, he said. Careful, Agent Greer. I'm a woman who's an emotional wreck, susceptible to temptation, and anything resembling flirting from a man as alluring as you would have dire repercussions. Whether she had a dry sense of humor or was serious, Travis couldn't guess. The statistics say that the person who did this is most likely somebody you know, so the most important thing you can do to help restore your security is to let us know if there is anybody, and I mean anybody, who has a grievance or has previously lashed out at you in any way. Ms. Iverson crossed her arms and leaned back, looking at the ceiling before shaking her head. Travis's heart dropped with the fear that this case would stall before it was even out of the gate. Actually, there is somebody out there who seems to have a problem with me, she said, making Travis perk up. I keep getting these nasty emails from some wacko on the Internet, but there's no way that would lead to this, right? Travis was in a state of disbelief so severe, his mouth almost hung open. Of all possible things, somehow the case that fell in his lap was a perfect fit for Agent Nora Wexler. Chapter 5. Seattle-Tacoma International Airport, Seattle, Washington It was late, and despite a few bright floor lights, the long terminal at SeaTac Airport had a somber dimness to it that made Nora put up her guard. She was the first one off her plane, the first to grab the bag she'd packed in a frantic rush, and the first to make it through the sliding doors into a muggy night. When she saw the mud-covered pickup truck waiting by the curb, she laughed to herself. Greer had the rough-and-tumble outdoorsman thing down. He rolled down the passenger window as she approached. Don't throw your bag in the back. It's going to start raining any minute. It does that here. Following his advice, she climbed into the passenger seat and put her bag on the floor between her legs. Thanks for picking me up, she said, catching his eyes for the first time in the glow of green light emanating from the dash. Good thing you could make it so quickly, he said, putting the truck in gear and driving past the overhang. A big, fat raindrop smacked against the exact center of the windshield. Yeah, after all that talk of the things you were going to catch and kill, I couldn't believe it when I heard you desperately needed help with one dead animal. Agent Greer shot her a hard look. If he was going to keep calling her up, he was going to have to get used to a little razzing. But your lucky Boffman was willing to go along with sending me out here all in a hurry. He was practically salivating at the opportunity to bury me with a dry bank fraud case. This sounded infinitely more appealing, plus a chance to travel, she said. The raindrops were falling steadily now, the sound of them clattering against the hood and the roof. 
It almost seemed a shame that all of the mud would wash off his pickup's exterior. It made it tough to see much of the city as well, which she imagined would be gorgeous on a dry night. She could barely make out the stadium where the Seattle Seahawks played as they cruised up a mostly vacant highway. I've been doing this for a long while, but I'm not sure I've ever seen a case that was so simple and so perplexing at the same time. How could a cat that's been missing for less than two days show up via standard mail from San Antonio, Texas? That's more than enough time for somebody to drive all that way. Maybe they were on their way to Mexico and dropped it in the mail before leaving the country. It makes me wonder what else they stole from her house that made them leave, because I don't think killing a cat and including a threatening note would do it. Nora glanced over at Agent Greer, who had his lips pursed like he was sucking on something sour. It was a possibility that would need to be proven, but Nora had her doubts. It doesn't add up. I do think there's an imminent threat here. Whoever is behind this is moving closer to the target, not farther away. Speaking of which, we've got eyes on Jenny Iverson's home around the clock. She's agreed to stay home from work tomorrow so we can check out the house. And you'll need to sniff out the internet stalker, work your magic or whatever, he said. Nora nodded, feeling like she was in her element already. If she wasn't able to find out who was behind those emails and the death threat, it could cost Jenny Iverson her life. The only option was to perform, but as it was, the long, tiring flight had taken something out of her. It looks to me like tomorrow isn't that far away at all, she said. Agent Greer took a deep breath. That reminds me. I know you're coming out here on short notice, but there's still a guest room open at my parents' place where you can crash for the night. Nora cast him a sidelong glance. Gee, Trav. We're not even going steady, and you already want me to meet your parents? I'm not sure I'm ready for that, she said. The light made it difficult to tell, but Agent Greer might have been blushing. I'm kidding. I booked a room at a place called the Rainier Inn. I'll get you the address. It's too bad they couldn't have named their B&B &B after some better weather. I think that's actually a reference to Mount Rainier, which you can usually see when it's not pouring. Oh, Right. It wasn't long before they arrived at her accommodations, a modest cottage-looking place with water streaming off of a wooden porch with white pillars. A light was on inside, at least. They made plans for the morning, and Nora exited the vehicle, undaunted by the unbelievable precipitation. If she'd be soaked from head to toe in two steps anyway, what was the rush? The rain continued through the next morning, when it became only marginally lighter than the night before. Her room had been cozy enough, with its girly pink carpets and candles on every surface, but Nora had still managed to catch only an hour or two of anything that might be called sleep. She couldn't shake a feeling in the bottom of her gut that things were going to get worse. "'Where'd you get that?' Agent Greer asked when he picked her up. She slid into her seat and closed the Little Mermaid umbrella she'd borrowed from the B&B &B owner. My five-year-old self sent it through time. It was a quiet drive over to Jenny Iverson's house on the east side of the city near Genesee Park, which allowed them both to fight off any exhaustion and focus on the investigation at hand. Iverson lived in a house that had an impressively modern style on a quiet street with a curling driveway, ornate door of what looked like cherry wood, and lots of diamond-shaped windows. The house couldn't have been more than five years old and must have cost a pretty penny. Come on in, Ms. Iverson said when she answered the door in a sweater and slacks. You've got free run of the house, but the bedroom closet is off limits. That's where I keep my private things. Nora and Travis exchanged suggestive glances as they walked through the doorway. Ms. Iverson, my name is Agent Nora Wexler. I'd like to talk to you about the strange emails you've been getting. Where's your computer? she asked. I'll start looking around for signs of a forced entry or any possible exit point. A few others will come by in a bit and search for fingerprints, if the rain has spared any, Agent Greer said, brushing by them both. Iverson closely watched him pass, even twisting her neck a bit. Actually... Maybe he should check my bedroom closet, she said in a whisper, winking. Nora looked at the clean tile floor and swallowed. 
When we do check for prints, we'll need to be able to eliminate any matches that can't be possible suspects. Are there any guests you've had recently that we should know about? Particularly any males? Nora asked, pulling a notepad from the inside of her jacket. I do date, if that's what you're asking, but I've been so busy with work lately that I haven't had much time for it. The last person who came over was my club friend, Aaron Clausen, about a week ago. We had a few drinks and sat through one of the new romantic comedies that just came out, she explained. And which club are you referring to? Aaron runs her own company in town, too, and along with another friend, we all graduated at the same time and formed the Founders Club to make sure we kept in touch. Nora nodded, getting a sense of the structures Jenny Iverson lived in. A lot of work, a few close friends, and fleeting relationships. Can you tell me who the third friend in the group is? Oh, that's Lila Robex, but we haven't seen much of her lately because her teenage daughter is as demanding as her business. It was always kind of crazy that she came into our program at school, juggling classes and a little girl. And to be honest, I don't think it had a particularly good impact on the girl. Ms. Iverson seemed to have gotten a much better night's rest than Nora did. She'd heard from Greer about the frightful state Jenny was in when she received the death threat. But a day and having a couple of FBI agents around seemed to have made a big difference in her state of mind. She didn't look at all like she was about to fall to pieces. I see. Can we take a look at those emails now? Nora proposed. Ms. Iverson nodded and turned on her heels. While leading her through the house and up the stairs, Nora noticed she was a little taller and had a bit more of an hourglass figure than herself. They entered a room with a computer desk set up and feline paraphernalia all over. A distinct odor hit her nose, and Nora wondered if Iverson had refused to clean the litter box for the last time as a sort of memorial. The computer came to life in front of them as soon as she pushed a button. How exactly did you react to these aggressive emails when you first started getting them? Nora asked, and Jenny turned away from the computer to respond. The first time I saw one was maybe six months ago. I was immediately grossed out and I marked it as spam, figuring it was just some junk and they used whatever trick they have to get my name and it wasn't really about me. But something about it irked me. It made me check my spam folder every once in a while and more often than not there was another horrible message in there from the same sender. Most of the time I wouldn't even look at them, she said. Nora nodded, growing concerned. It was a shame that the most rational thing she'd done would also make it the most difficult to get a read on the sender. Do you happen to know if your email client automatically deletes spam emails after 30 days? Oh, I think it does. Darn. Well, I'm sure there are at least a couple of messages left. They seem to come every few weeks, but actually I don't think one has come lately, Iverson said. The odds of getting anything out of this lead dwindled with everything that she said, but if there were any clues to pick up on, Nora would be able to find them. Let's see what you've got, at least. Can you log into your account and let me have a look around, please? And do you remember the email address that has been sending these messages? Sure. Hold on, she said, bringing up a browser, typing, and then vacating the chair. Nora sat down, brushed a strand of hair away from her eyes, and started searching through the spam folder. I hate that I remember it offhand, but the address is bfsneezer at gmail.com. Can't you hack in and find out who owns the account? Nora zeroed in on the first message she saw from BF Sneezer, a three-line screed in all caps addressed to Iverson, saying he wanted to destroy her from the inside out. There was no salutation, not much even in the way of detail to pick up on, or anything about a collection. It's not that easy to determine who created or who is using an account like this. I'll definitely start digging for information, but there's no telling if what I find will be of any value if this guy is good at hiding. Any name might be completely bogus, and even an IP address isn't a sure thing if the sender has been logging on from a public library or anywhere. If it does lead to a home address, there's a chance we're dealing with someone who's not all that computer proficient, and we might get a hold of him quick, Nora said. I'm really hoping for that, Jenny said. 
I just want this to be over already. I feel like my life's been hijacked. The best thing I can tell you is to be patient and trust that we're here to keep you safe. Hmm, Nora said, coming across another email. This one immediately got Nora's attention because it had a little more meat on its bones, more she could work with. Now this is interesting, she said. Iverson leaned over her shoulder to look. There was more text this time, none of it in all caps, but the email address was the same. The writing style is completely different, almost like it was written by someone else. There are also some key syntactical contrasts between the two, but what really stands out to me is the correctness of the language. It's normal to see a rambling tirade of threats and infer low education or inebriation, but this person seems very level-headed, intelligent even. I'm almost getting the sense that he's trying to dumb it down by using colloquialisms like y'all. But what does it mean? Iverson asked. Nora recognized the apprehension creeping into her voice. It was one thing to brush off threats from lunatics, but hateful messages like these threatening rape and murder from someone in full control of his mind were something else. That's a good question, but we won't find out until we find him. I'll absolutely start working with Google to find out who's behind the account, but it'll take time. Until then, we've got to stay vigilant. This guy must have been trying to mask his speech in various ways, hoping you'd ignore the warning signs, Nora said. But another thought struck her. Or maybe he's actually trying to communicate to more than one person. It's not like anybody else is using my email account, Iverson said when Nora turned to face her. The two shared a worried look that there were somehow other people involved in this. Nora didn't like the profile she was building, and the last thing she wanted was for these messages to get buried in her evidence folder. They needed answers. Come on, let's go see how Agent Greer is doing. We need to find a way to home in on a suspect quickly, and I hate to say it, but some trace around the house would give us a much better angle than anything we're looking at here. Heading downstairs, they met Greer at the back of the house in a dirty kitchen and laundry room. He had been checking the lock on the back door for any signs of tampering, but wasn't having much luck. The three of them spent the morning working with the forensics team that came to go over every window, door, and crevice that could have possibly been used to give someone entry. They were coming up empty-handed, and the pressure of it got to Iverson around one in the afternoon. Suddenly, she shook her head and threw up her hands. Does anybody have any idea how my house was broken into and my cat was stolen? Nora watched Greer's head drop at the accusation and felt for him. Between the two of them, they didn't have a whole lot to go on. If I had to guess at this point, I'd say that the person who entered was either let in or found a door unlocked. There are no signs of forced entry, no strange prints, he said. Jenny Iverson was speechless for a moment. But you guys are the FBI, right? You can do anything. Hack into the email account? Find some video footage from somewhere over the past couple of days? Please, she begged. They had to remember the difficult time she was going through and be understanding. We're going to do everything we can, but you have to be patient, Nora said, just as the ringer from Greer's cell phone went off in his pocket. He pulled it out to see who was calling and then looked at Nora. It's Agent Johnson, he said, offering her a hint of relief that was soon snatched away. The phone call went quickly and seemed to have a devastating effect on Greer. Nora almost didn't want to know what it was when he hung up. Johnson said there's been a murder that may be connected to this case. A man working as the personal assistant to someone named Aaron Clausen was killed. Nora's heart lurched into her throat. It couldn't be. She turned quickly to Iverson, who put it together just as quickly as she did. You were right that he was talking to more than one person in the emails. What has he done to my friend? Chapter 6 Queen Anne Avenue A few members of the team stood by to keep watch over Jenny Iverson allowing agents Greer and Wexler to rush across town to the office of Aaron Clausen, whose personal assistant had just been killed. She worked on the north side of town in the shadow of the famous Space Needle. 
Her company packaged and shipped cleaning supplies to schools and businesses across the country. But that information barely registered among the frantic thoughts racing through Nora's mind. This case was no longer about a single threat that could be contained, analyzed, and dissolved. Now it was an ongoing situation, with more dimensions than they knew, and the first life had already been taken. If they didn't do something quickly, more would follow. Nora had never before dealt with a killer in the middle of a spree. She felt like she was in over her head, struggling for air, but it was exhilarating, too. She'd never done anything so important in her entire life. We have to stop this, she said to Greer, as they parked by a loading zone beside the building. I know, he said, deadly serious. He took a deep breath and popped the door. A cluster of law enforcement vehicles had already arrived, a few of them haphazardly parked right near the front doors, under a big sign that read, Spick and Span. That front door never seemed to close because of the frequency of people entering and leaving the building, all of them in a hurry. Nora wondered how much information they'd really be able to get with all of these people crowding the hallways. After showing her creds and smiles to an officer standing guard outside, they slipped into the building in search of Aaron Clausen, who Nora knew was a member of Jenny Iverson's Founders Club. They followed a group of officers left and then up the stairs to the third floor, where a handful of officers were talking near a plastic partition hung across the hallway. Among the group was a tall, bald man with a mustache, a barrel chest, and a dark complexion. He immediately took a step forward and reached out for them. These are our New York transplants, Special Agent in Charge Lawrence Johnson said. We all know how hard it can be to start a case and not finish it, so they're going to be taking the lead on this one for us. With any luck, we'll all be impressed at how quickly this gets wrapped up. There was a little bit of bite to his words, an insinuation that their participation did actually hinge on their progress. Nora nodded and shook his hand. They'd see soon enough what she could do, but Greer held her up before they could get to the body. I wouldn't call myself a transplant, sir. I'm Seattle born and raised. Just never thought coming home on vacation would leave me the only one available to follow up on a lead. What happened with that car chase, anyway? Johnson eyed him for a moment in an unusually forthright manner, tilting his head to the right as if his bloodshot left eye was the only one capable of perceiving light. He chewed on his lip before taking a deep breath through his flaring nostrils. You all know as well as I do that we're never really off the clock, but that chase was a nasty piece of business. Two young men, both of them barely sixteen, had stolen an SUV and were using it to make drug deliveries. They busted through our first roadblock outside of Everett, and we finally took them down around the Mount Vernon area, but not before they were able to force two other cars off the road. One of the drivers died when the car struck a tree head-on. Really burned me. The DEA are handling it now but it seems there's been a serious rise in criminal mischief around the city lately, he explained. Nora nodded, getting a sense that Johnson was the type to wear his heart on his sleeve. After working with Boffman, she wouldn't mind reporting to a superior who could be counted on to say what he thought. Now that there was a corpse, there was no doubt the case had everyone's full attention. Can you tell us what happened here? Where's Miss Clausen? she asked. Agent Johnson ran his hand along his cheek and looked over his shoulder. He was already feeling the pressure. It'll be quicker if I walk you through myself, and then you can meet with Clausen and the trauma specialist in a conference room downstairs, he said, turning and nodding to the other nearby officers. They ducked underneath a plastic partition that had been hung up. On the other side were a couple more officers, one with rubber gloves and swabs, and the other with a camera and mounted light. Both of them had grim expressions that momentarily distracted Nora from the desk and body near the doorway that was as still as a stone. A dead man was hunched over at his desk, face fallen into a shallow aluminum tray of what appeared to be some soupy chicken dish. The food was splattered everywhere, likely the result of his collapse, but enough of it remained in the tin to submerge the side of his face up to his eye. The man, undeniably attractive, had moose hair, tan skin, 
and wore a metallic blue dress shirt and bright purple tie. It was a flamboyant look that hadn't worked out for him today. His name is Ricardo Lentham, but he went by card, according to some preliminary interviews we've gotten from family members we've reached in Southern California. Age 29, he spent the last two years working at Spick and Span, first as a warehouse grunt, and then quickly jumping straight up to personal assistant. No priors, no degrees. Seems like a young, middle-of-the-road guy who had enough responsibility to cover for his lack of ambition. As Nora looked over the entire room, Greer got in close, kneeling right beside the body, which had one arm on the desk, still clutching a plastic spoon. Have you determined the type of poison yet? he asked. We're not miracle workers, Agent Greer, Johnson replied. We've barely been here long enough to send off a sample. But the theory is that it came from the fusion restaurant, Asian Delights, around the corner. We've shut the place down pending an investigation, but as of yet there have been no other reports of poisoning or illness of any kind. Has Clausen said anything? Nora asked, sighing. She didn't want to be stuck without a clear way forward like they were with Iverson. She thinks the poison was meant for her, because Ricardo had been known to pick up her lunch. Rattled to the core would be the way I'd put it. The rest of the staff is being sent home after we vet them, but I'm not counting on much information there. Everyone is shocked that a co-worker essentially dropped dead right in front of them. He was gone in a snap, too soon for even the EMTs to do anything but call us. Nora cautiously approached the body, trying to keep herself calm. She didn't want to reveal to Johnson or Greer that she was skittish around a cadaver but it was still a new enough experience to be unsettling to her. Looking over the desk didn't reveal what she'd been hoping to find. Agent Johnson, has anyone found a note or other piece of writing? Iverson received one in her package saying she'd be added to a collection. But if this were really intended for Aaron Clausen, then it would have been a dramatic shift from that indirectness. Do you know what I mean? Why threaten one and then go right after another? She turned to look back at Johnson, who had his arms crossed over his chest and stood tall. You got me. That's what you need to figure out. I need to get back to the office, but I want regular reports on your not insubstantial progress. The labs are at your disposal, he said. Understood, Greer replied, but Johnson had already turned and ducked under the partition. Can you give us some space? Nora asked the other two officers, who grudgingly assented. She needed to think, because the scenario that was emerging didn't exactly make sense. Was B.F. Sneezer trying to scare these women to create a sense of control or knock them off as quickly as possible? He needed to have been nearby to poison the single order that Ricardo had received, straining the timeline if he was also in San Antonio recently to send the package to Iverson. She looked at Greer, who must have been asking himself the same perplexing questions. This guy would have to be constantly on the move to pull this off, Greer said, sighing. But do you really think the poison was intended for the assistant or for the boss? Nora asked. It was all guesswork at this point, but if they could just tap into their suspect's disturbed logic, it might put them on the right path. And how come there wasn't a note or mention of a collection? Maybe there wasn't any need for a note. From the sound of Clausen's reaction, the killer knew exactly how to threaten her without ever saying so. He might have known he was knocking off Ricardo Lantham in a way that would be nakedly terrifying to Clausen because of her own habits. I think it fits, he said. If so, he'd have to know an awful lot about his victims for an internet kook, Nora thought. It was an impressive assertion from Agent Greer who might have some brains inside his pretty head after all. But at the same time, it was an equally chilling statement about their suspect, whose cunning had been sorely underestimated. They needed to track him down before he made good on any more of his threats. Let's hope that Aaron Clausen can shed some light on this issue. They walked into a conference room that obviously hadn't gotten much use lately. The strong smell of disinfectant and other cleaning chemicals hit them from boxes stacked against the walls as soon as they'd cleared the door. But the rest of the room, including an oval-shaped table, 
was dusty. A few of the ceiling lights were out as well, making the windowless room seem more like a cave. Erin Clausen, a woman in her late thirties who had straight black hair down to her shoulders, thick glasses, and a pronounced jawline, wore dress pants and a turtleneck as she huddled next to the trauma specialist. Her face was dry, despite some puffiness to her eyes and redness around her nose. When Erin turned her neck to view them, her glasses couldn't fully hide the fear in her eyes. Nora mustered the comforting smile of an old friend as she pulled over chairs for herself and Agent Greer. They needed to get Erin to talk if they were going to have any chance of stopping her assistant's killer from taking her out next. Miss Clausen? Hi. My name is Agent Nora Wexler, and this is Agent Travis Greer. Is there anything I can do for you? Aaron snorted and leaned back against the table, crossing her arms. You can stop talking to me like I'm a child, and while you're at it, you can bring Card back for me, she said, startling Nora with her hostility. I realize how this must be more difficult for you than I could possibly imagine. You're right about that, Aaron interjected but we need your help if we're going to bring the one who did this to justice. I know you've already spoken to a few officers, and you're probably already very tired, but would you mind answering a few questions for us? Nora asked, but her normal tone resulted in further recoiling from Aaron. She crossed one leg over the other and looked away, scrambling Nora's belief that she'd be able to get victims to open up easily to her. It feels like I'm in prison, Aaron said releasing an agonized sigh. One day everything is normal, and then the next you realize you were one lunch order away from dying at your desk. If your questions are anything like the other officers, I'll just go ahead and tell you now that I don't have any idea who did this. Nobody's threatened me in person or on the computer, and I'm not likely to do anything rash to myself because of this. The trauma specialist had her hand on Aaron's shoulder and shot Nora a sympathetic look probably knowing that Aaron's begrudging posture wasn't likely to lead to any breaks. A flicker of frustration bubbled within Nora, who was determined not to fail to get through to Aaron. Can I tell you that I do have some idea what you're going through, and how hard it can be to trust anyone after losing someone you've seen every day for years? Back in college, a friend of mine named Maria went missing after we'd all gone out dancing late one night. We promised we'd stick together, but she met a hot guy she really liked, one none of us had ever seen before. She left with him, and the next morning her body was found in a dumpster by some trash collection people. I never thought I'd be able to have a normal conversation again after that, like my entire life was transported into a war zone, Nora said, feeling an irrational flush of embarrassment after realizing how intently Greer was listening to her. She swallowed and straightened up in her seat. Oh, the dangers of being young and slutty, Aaron said, rolling her eyes. It felt like a slap to Nora, who appeared to have no chance of getting through, no matter what she did. It stung her pride to have to look over to Agent Greer for help getting out of this rut. It's been a long day for us, too, he said to Aaron, yawning and stretching in his seat. He extended his arms behind his head and scratched the back of his neck. Nora almost got lost in the sight of it until she realized what he was doing. Greer then asked the trauma specialist to give them some time alone. He laboriously adjusted his tie. I think what we all want is to go home, get into bed, and sleep this one off. But to do that, you've got to tell us more about what we're facing here. Erin took off her glasses and cleaned them against the hem of her jacket, putting them on again and giving Greer another look. She uncrossed her legs and nodded slightly. You're right about that, Agent Greer. I really can't say who's been watching me enough to know where I might get my lunch on any given day. But I do have a thought that going after Card to get me was no accident, she said. Nora blinked, feeling like they were on the verge of something. Was it possible the assistant had had prior contact with the killer, if Aaron Clausen hadn't? How would you characterize your relationship with him? Greer asked, leaning forward. The relationship has been on again and off again for some time, Clausen said, surprising Nora. They've been sleeping together. 
That wasn't what she expected to be going on between a flamboyant Latin man and a shrew who looked like she could pass for a hobbit. It's not something anyone else at work even knows about, but if someone were watching me, really watching me, then they'd know that every once in a while we'd sneak off together or just stay in here at the office. Do you know what they say about office romances between a female boss and a male subordinate? She's in it for love, and he's in it for a promotion. I guess now we'll never know if that's true. Nora raced through some mental calculations about the implications their relationship had on the case. She'd already had her suspicions about how much B.F. Sneezer knew about his victims, but there was a big difference between knowing where someone goes for lunch and who she's secretly inviting into bed. Whether it was that knowledge or the ability to break into Jenny Iverson's house without a trace, this suspect must have known both of these women personally. But somehow, neither of them had the slightest clue they were personally dealing with their potential killer. Nora needed to find out how the killer knew them and was getting his information. Questioning Clausen about recent acquaintances got them nowhere, and soon the trauma specialist returned and provided a good opportunity to depart. Nora never considered herself an angsty person, but having to wave a white flag so that Agent Greer could pluck a key piece of information like that aided her insights. They had plenty to do when it came to combing through Ricardo Lantham's contacts, but there was another possibility worth checking out that seemed even more pressing. If somebody poisoned Lantham's dish, it had to have been done in person. What do you say I buy you a late lunch at Asian Delights? Nora asked Greer, making him chuckle as they walked through the hallway. You want me to try the same cashew chicken? How sweet of you. Chapter 7. West John Street The puzzle became that much more perplexing when the agents arrived at Asian Delights, walked around back, and discovered that a loading platform for deliveries that had a clear path to the kitchen was left wide open. Just by standing on the street, they could see a large Asian man in a suit, the owner, using a ladle to chase a cook around the area where prepared dishes would be handed off to those working the front counter. After confirming with another officer that the bay door had been open all day, Nora slumped against one of the damp steps and leaned against the slimy brick near the opening. This is getting ridiculous. It really looks like somebody could just pop into the kitchen while the cook's back was turned and squirt something into a tray, she said. This wasn't how cases were supposed to work. Someone committed a crime, law enforcement revealed his identity and location, and then all it would take was tracking him down with a pair of handcuffs to end it. Now come on, Greer said, standing in the middle of the alley where the rain could drizzle down his chiseled face. We can't get discouraged so quickly. You'd think with so many moving parts that there'd be an obvious slip-up. But if there's not, it's even more reason to stay focused. It means we've got an intelligent, ruthless killer out there on the loose, and we can't let him in our heads. We've got to find a way through, no matter what. It was inspiring, but Nora wasn't in the mood for it. That's easy for you to say. Do whatever it takes, including putting on a show for the victim by flexing your muscles in order for her to tell you she's been sleeping with her assistant. Is that what you've got a problem with? That you're not scoring more points than me? Greer asked, hands on his sides and oblivious to the rain. It's not a competition between us, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get the information we need to move forward. Including playing the part of brainless man candy? Somehow I thought joining the FBI would give people a reason to listen to me, even if I don't arch my back or bend over to pick something up. I won't do it. Agent Greer exhaled and wiped some of the rain from his brow. Look at what happened, Nora. Some women just respond better to men. My read on the situation was that Clausen felt subconsciously threatened by your appearance, and I luckily happened to ask about how she interacted with Lantham in a way that opened the door for her to mention their affair. And she volunteered the info as a way of trumpeting her own appeal. Nora shrugged. A woman can talk to a man with another woman in the room without feeling like she's competing with her. I'm sure that's true but in this case it didn't look like it. You can make up rules about what you don't want to do, 
but I can promise you that one day you'll hit a stone wall and have to break them. There'll be some guy with lips puckered tighter than a steel trap, and it'll only be your eyes and the coy way you smile that'll crack them, if not a few loose buttons and a deep bend to tie your shoes. Count me as unexcited for that day, Nora replied, getting up and brushing herself off. I'd much rather focus on the patterns. We're right smack in the middle of a crime spree. Two members of the same club have been threatened, one with a dead cat and one with a dead assistant. What's the connection? What's the next move? Is he trying to show off how deep he's infiltrated their lives? I don't know, Greer said, shifting his stance and looking up suddenly as footsteps approached the dock. Nora straightened herself out and turned to find the restaurant owner striding out to meet them. She knew from the other officer that his name was Henry Chan, and he looked big enough to wrestle a grizzly bear. I don't mean to interrupt your conversation, but am I allowed to reopen my restaurant? Your people have crawled over the entire place and taken samples of everything. I'm not in the business of poisoning my customers. This nonsense must cease, he said in a voice carrying a hint of an accent. We realize what an inconvenience this is for you, Mr. Chan, Greer said, but we won't be able to allow you to reopen until you're cleared by Agent Johnson. In the meantime, we do have a couple of questions we'd like to ask you. Oh, sure. Great, Chan said with a healthy dollop of sarcasm. What is there possibly left for you to ask? I think at this point you are just fishing for a reason to harass me. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but my entire operation is up to code, and all of my employees have their papers. Nora furrowed her brow. Someone died after purchasing something at your restaurant. Don't you want to figure out how that happened? I recommend you cooperate to the best of your ability, because until we hit on something else, the only reasonable conclusion to draw is that you or one of your workers knowingly handed over food tainted with poison to Ricardo Lantham. It's preposterous, Chen said, but even that much of an accusation shook him up. We've been running this restaurant for ten years and have not had so much as one report of food poisoning. No one saw anyone strange in the kitchen, but we did get our seafood delivery very close to noon when the man with the purple tie came by to pick up his order. It's possible one of the delivery men from the distributor did something. Even that response put Nora in a much better frame of mind. She had a hunch that these delivery positions would see a lot of changeover, enough that someone could quickly pin down a job and orchestrate a scheme like this. Or at least there would be more eyes that could have possibly seen someone. Thank you for that. We'll be sure to pay them a visit, she said, her measured tone making it clear he wasn't out of the hot seat. I always wondered about this Ricardo Lantham, Chan continued, starting to back away. He's come in here many times with the black-haired cleaning supply woman. I didn't realize he worked for her. I thought maybe they were married because they came in one time to celebrate her birthday. Who would do that unless they cared very deeply for each other? Indeed, Nora thought, suddenly getting a chill up her spine. Clausen lost the one person she cared for most today, while Jenny Iverson had lost her most precious friend the day before. The killer was targeting the Founders Club members' most cherished relationships, and that meant the final club member was next in line to lose someone. And Nora knew whom. Grabbing Greer by the sleeve, she yanked him as she bolted for the truck. What is it? Greer asked, not moving his legs fast enough for her. It's the club he's going after, not the individual women. He's picking them apart by tearing away what they love most, and Lila Robix is next. We have to find her daughter before it's too late. Although they raced through the rain to the truck as quickly as they could, once they got in they realized they had nowhere to go. Nora had barely heard Robix's name, and then all of a sudden, Greer was staring impatiently at her while he waited for instructions. When she reached into her pocket for her cell phone, he quickly did the same and started jamming his thumbs against the screen. This is Greer. We think we've zeroed in on the next target. It's the daughter of Lila Robix. We need to secure her fast. Can you pinpoint her location for me? While he spoke, Nora quickly scanned Facebook for the answer. Greer had only just finished speaking when she hit gold. 
Her name is Lori Robix, and she goes to Garfield High School, she said. Never mind, Greer said, ending the call and giving Nora a nod. A moment later, the truck was in gear and lurching onto the road. The windshield wipers whipped back and forth, and the huffing of the defroster struggled to keep the fog off the glass. They'd only gone a few blocks before Greer glanced at the dash and voiced an obvious problem with their plan. It's well after 3 p.m. Is she even likely to be there? It might help to know what she looks like as well, he said. Probably not, Nora admitted. They needed the Robex's address, but in truth, a high school senior could be going anywhere after class is let out. I'll work on that. And Lori has brown curly hair, a very lean face, a small nose, and a dark complexion. I could show you a picture if you want to take your eyes off the road. Just keep your eyes peeled for her and figure out where she might be. We can at least start at the school if we have to. Maybe she's on a team or something, Greer said. Nora could hear the urgency in his voice. With these attacks coming one after another, they couldn't lock this girl down fast enough. Nora flipped through her contacts and came to Jenny Iverson. The last thing Nora wanted to do was send Iverson into another panic, but they needed to get that information now, and the other members of the Founders Club were more likely to have it than anyone. Connecting the call, Nora listened to the dial tone as if each beep were an SOS call. Jenny, can you help me for a moment? We need Lila Robix's address. No, it's nothing to worry about, but we could really use that now. 1616 30th Avenue? Okay. And you wouldn't happen to know her daughter's phone number or what she normally does after school? I see. Don't worry about it. If you could text me Lila's number, that would be a big help. Thank you. Stay safe. At hearing the address, Greer suddenly twisted the wheel to make a turn onto a different street. It was a good thing he knew the area, otherwise she'd be poring over a map for each new destination. Her phone buzzed a moment later with the number for Lila Robix. Nora had no idea if she knew about the attacks on her club friends, but either way, she was about to be the recipient of some frightening news. Pressing the call button, Nora held the phone to her ear. Is this Lila Robix? My name is Nora Wexler, and I'm with the FBI. We're concerned that you and your daughter might be in danger, Nora said, shutting her eyes while her heart dropped. What? Is this a joke? The voice on the phone said. I'm sorry it's not, Nora went on. You'll be getting another call in a moment from someone coming to meet you at your location, but we need to know where your daughter, Lori, is. We're almost there, Greer said. Um, Robix said, obviously getting emotional. Nora couldn't have guessed what kind of state she was suddenly thrust into. Lori takes the bus home from school before picking up her car to go out with her friends. It's an expensive car, and she doesn't trust it in the school lot. If she's not at home, she could be anywhere. I'll try to call her, but she might not pick up. Nora clenched her jaw. A teenage daughter with her own car, who didn't feel the need to answer anyone's calls, could be hard to find. Please do give it a try. If you reach her, tell her not to go anywhere or do anything. Call me back immediately with her location. Thank you. That must be it, Greer said, leaning forward in his seat to peer forward. Nora put away her phone and squinted at the flashy car in a driveway beside a modest one-story home. What kind of car do you think that is? Nora asked. Red with tinted windows, the sleek car in the driveway had a fin in the back and looked designed for drag racing. The flecks of rain gave it a shine that made it seem brand new. That's one of those Scion sports cars. Not as expensive as you'd guess, maybe 30000 but that might be a quarter of the cost of this entire house, Greer said. The house had a plain, flat exterior of white siding that obviously needed to be replaced. The roof had some damage to it, possibly where a tree had fallen onto it. A stump beside the house told the tale. They might have considered themselves lucky it hit the house and not the car, or maybe the daughter did. Altogether, the house presented a picture of a struggling family that differed greatly from Jenny Iverson's comfortable affluence. Greer pulled the truck to the curb a short distance from the driveway and hopped out. Judging from the windows, there was no sign anyone was here, but the car made it likely that Lori hadn't left yet. 
Nora raced across the grass to the front door, feeling like her heart was going to beat out of her chest. I'll check the back door, Greer said, jogging around. Nora pulled open a ragged screen door and prepared to knock when the door swung open from the other side, revealing a stunned young woman in a brown leather jacket. Are you Lori Robix? Nora asked, a little stunned. No, I'm not, the young woman said, stepping through the doorway and moving toward the car. It was obviously a lie, but why? Lori, you have to listen. I'm Agent Wexler with the FBI. Your life may be in danger, she said, but nothing she said slowed Robex down except catching her by the elbow. Let go of me, Lori said, jerking her arm. She was going to have to be restrained. Hopefully Greer heard the struggle and would come around to help. The next thing Nora noticed was that Lori Robex had her car keys in her hand. The thought crossed Nora's mind that the girl would attempt to use the keys as a weapon, but instead she was reaching for a remote starter. The girl clearly loved her car, and the killer planned to use it to attack Lila Robex's daughter. Despite struggling with Nora and dragging her closer to the car, Lori pushed her thumb against the remote starter, causing a short beep, followed by a wall of fire that seemed to engulf Nora's eyes and ears. The explosion knocked the women off their feet, slamming them against the side of the house as pieces of the vehicle exploded in all directions. Chapter 8 UW Medical Center Boyfriend? Co-worker, Travis replied to the nurse when he stopped by Nora's room on the hospital's fourth floor. I guess that's good news for the rest of us. My name is Wendy, she said. The nurse was college-aged, had her bleached blonde hair up, and wore one of those multicolored smocks that looked like it was made out of a shower curtain. Travis shook her extended hand and tried not to think too much about what she was thinking while looking at him like that. It's nice to meet you. Can you tell me how Nora and Lori are doing? Sure, Wendy said, leading him out of the hall and into Nora's dimly lit single-bed hospital room. Nora slept in bed in a weirdly contorted position that looked like a sprinter in full stride. At least her face was peaceful enough. It wasn't until the nurse cleared her throat that Travis realized he'd been staring at her. Ms. Wexler suffered a mild concussion and should be right as rain with a little rest. That's more than I can say for Ms. Robix, whose head injury is much more severe and who has a number of lacerations and bruises. She'll need to be watched for a while and there may be some memory loss. Travis pursed his lips and crossed his arms over his chest. It had been a day since he had come around the house on 30th Avenue to find the car exploded and two bodies slumped against the front wall. He was sure they were both goners, but when he got over to them, he discovered they had been just far enough away to avoid life-threatening injuries. In truth, Travis had had injured partners before, and it was always a terrible thing, but there was something about the possibility of Nora getting hurt that chewed him up inside. So you figure once she wakes up, she'll be good enough to go? He asked. I wouldn't go that far. We'll have to see how she's feeling. Maybe run another test or two to make sure there's nothing we missed. Don't be in a rush to cart her away so quickly when she might feel woozy or collapse as soon as she's walked out the doors. Understood. Travis was anxious to get back to the case and pin the killer's nuts to the wall. The more time that passed, the more likely it was that the trail would go cold, or they'd come across another victim. At least there were no more members of the Founders Club who hadn't yet been identified. There is something else strange, though. Miss Wexler has some bizarrely restless sleeping behaviors, punching out and twisting violently. I know I wouldn't ever want to be caught in bed next to her, She's probably the type to sleepwalk and talk in her sleep, too, Wendy said, though Travis wasn't sure if this was just another subtle advance. At the same time, the thought of patient confidentiality had never seemed to cross her mind. Has she said anything? Travis asked, raising an eyebrow. No, but there has been a lot of mouth movement. Travis was about to ask her what kind of medication Nora was on when he sensed someone in the doorway behind him. Looking over his shoulder, he spotted Agent Johnson taking up nearly the entire entrance. Even though he was wearing a black suit and tie, the man looked like he was meant to be a linebacker and could punch through a concrete wall. Could you give us a minute? 
he said to the nurse as he came in. She meekly ducked out without a word, after giving Travis one more up-and-down glance. It's kind of you to stop by, Travis said, shaking the division chief's hand. I couldn't imagine anything less for an agent injured in the line of duty. How is she doing? Johnson asked, but went on after Travis had only enough time to nod. This situation is becoming more complicated than we thought, but at this point we should have everything contained. Iverson, Clausen, and the elder Miss Robix are all at the office. SPD will handle guarding the younger Miss Robix here until she's well enough to talk and we can bring her in. Good, Travis agreed. At this point, I'm confident we'll be able to get a lead on who's doing this as soon as Nora and I can sit down with the three of them and find out whom they've all had contact with. If any names we get match the email account owner Nora is tracking down, we'll have a real target to shoot for. Johnson crossed his arms and took a long look at the woman sprawled across the hospital bed. That's what I wanted to talk to you about, Johnson said, leaning in and lowering his voice. I'm having my doubts whether Agent Wexler is really up to handling this case. What? Travis asked, nearly gasping. He could tell Johnson was serious, but he was still blindsided by the accusation. Look, this has escalated to the point where it's starting to get some real attention. Dead bodies and exploding cars are magnets for the new trucks, but this is starting to come up in talks with the Bureau's head offices. I need to make sure I've got the best people possible on this case, and I'm not sure if Agent Wexler has the necessary experience and ingenuity to be able to handle it. I don't question you, but she might do better behind a desk at a computer than on the streets. For some reason, Travis's heart rate kicked up as he looked at Nora, who was blissfully unaware of how her job was being torn away from her. It wasn't right, and Travis couldn't let her get pulled off the case like this. With all due respect, sir, it was Nora who anticipated the killer's next move and reacted in time to save Lori Robix's life. I think she's got a knack and the passion for it that transcends her time on the job. Pulling her off the case now would be a mistake. You're sure about that? Johnson asked, giving a careful eye to Travis. It was clear his reputation was being put on the line as well. We've got a number of leads out already that will only take a little time to mature. There's Google and the Gmail account, the source of the package from San Antonio, the analysis of the poison we're waiting on, the seafood distributor, and I know we'll get something solid picking through the remnants of the bomb fixed to the Scion starter. Any one of those could give us a fix on our suspect, Travis explained. That's true, but I can tell you it won't be the package that tips us off. There's not a fingerprint on it. Must have been using gloves. And the transaction was made in cash. I'm optimistic we'll get a visual once we can run through the security tape, but so far this B.F. Sneezer, as we're all calling him, has been smart enough not to leave us with anything. We don't even have a clear motive. What did these women do to him to make him so mad? Johnson started to get agitated. That's what we need Nora to find out. Fine, but if we don't start reeling this fish in soon, I'm going to cast a different line, Johnson said. It might have been the stern tenor of Johnson's voice that lifted Nora's lolling eyelids, startling Travis and raising the possibility that she'd heard what they were talking about. It was good to see her awake and yawning. You guys couldn't wait to sneak into my bedroom, could you? She asked, rolling over and pulling up the blankets. The humor was lost on Johnson, who showed a hint of embarrassment when she suddenly regained consciousness. Just wanted to check in and make sure you were doing all right. I've got to get back to it, he said, giving Travis one last look before breaking for the door and disappearing into the hall. Travis sighed and turned back to Nora, who was now sitting up with her hand on her forehead. How are you feeling? You came really close to sticking your hand in the fire there. I don't want to think about what would have happened if you'd been standing right next to the car when that bomb went off. I, um, my head... I'm doing fine. Sorry to be caught napping on the job. What were you and Johnson talking about anyway? She asked. Travis's chest tightened. Good thing he wasn't attached to a lie detector. Nothing important, he said, sitting down on the side of the bed. 
The last thing she needs is more pressure. I remember the first time my father took me out hunting. I was barely seven years old and suddenly had a gun in my hand with the intent to kill something weighing a hundred times my own weight. I was scared to death of letting him down, so much so that I couldn't keep my aim straight. He sensed my nerves and told me that it was okay to fail, that sometimes failing a thousand times was necessary to have one success. It's a good thing he wasn't working a murder case, Nora said. He wasn't sure if she'd understood what he was trying to get across. In his mind, he was taking her out hunting for the first time. There would be substantial costs if they failed, but being so desperate for success would prevent them from achieving it. Being afraid to fail can ensure that it happens, he said. Nora had eyes blue as the sky, and her hair draped across the pillow almost like tentacles. The first time he saw her, he wondered if someone so cute could be cut out for this kind of work, but she'd proven to him that she had the fire for it. I had another dream about my friend Maria while I was asleep. It happens sometimes, usually when my mind is already packed full of other stuff. I always kick myself that I let her leave with that guy no one knew. That was my failure. Somehow back in college, a hot guy meant that you could throw the rules out the window. There's nothing I hate worse than being blind, and that's how I feel right now with this case. Nora seemed alert for someone who had just spent a night in a hospital for a concussion. Travis sympathized with her regrets and her drive, but he was afraid that it'd end up leading them in the wrong direction. At least you're doing better than Lori Robix. She's stable but still out cold, and not likely to be going anywhere for a while, Travis said. Nora nodded and bit her lip, calculating something. And what about her mother? She's back at the division office with Iverson and Clawson, where they'll be safe, he said. Nora's eyes lit up like she was watching fireworks. That's perfect. If we can get over there, we can finally pinpoint who's got it in for them, she said, throwing the blankets off and swinging her legs off the side of the bed. Hey, the nurse said you've got to stick around for more tests and rest, he said, reaching for her arm and missing as she got to her feet. That's a crock, and you know it. Talking to the victims isn't going to be like I'm running a marathon or anything, she said. The back of your gown is open, Travis shot back, but Nora had already scooped up an armful of clothes and shut herself into the bathroom. Talking to the Founders Club would lead them deeper into this mess. He got up from the bed and looked around. He had to laugh that she was going to try to escape from the hospital before release, considering he probably would have been tempted to do the same thing. Walking out couldn't have been easier, and the best Travis could tell, Nora wasn't unsteady for a moment. Soon they had endured the rain and climbed in the truck, which started up like a charm and took them to the FBI offices at 1110 Third Avenue. A tower of plain gray concrete with windows, there may not have been a more quintessential government building in the country. They learned that the three victims were in a lounge on the eighth floor. When they opened the door to enter, only Jenny Iverson offered a smile of recognition. Aaron Clausen watched them warily, and Lila Robix was still a wreck after her daughter's brush with death. Nice to see you again, Nora said before introducing herself to Lila, who ran a bar downtown. The establishment was trendy and relatively popular, but her business wasn't nearly the size of Iverson and Clausen's and only provided a meager income. But Robix was dressed nicely enough, with a striped blouse and jeans over her curvy figure. Her black hair was pulled back in a puff behind her head. You're lucky to be up and walking around, she said. Travis detected a hint of resentment that Norma had recovered much faster than Lila's daughter. The last thing they needed was another obstacle. I am terribly sorry about the shock you've been through. Her condition is improving and will be fine with just a little more time, Nora said. No, I'm sorry, Robix added, shaking her head and closing her eyes. If it weren't for you, my daughter would be dead right now. It's hard not to even be able to leave this room to see her, but nothing could be worse than that. Travis pulled over a couple of folding chairs that were leaning against the wall and set them up near the three women, who were already sitting around a table covered in colorful magazines. He grabbed a remote to click off the TV, which sat on a stand in the corner. 
Now that we've got you all here together, we're hoping this will be a turning point in the case. Right now, there's a man out there targeting your club and threatening your lives. He has considerable information about you with access to your homes, knowledge of your habits, and a regrettably diverse repertoire of skills. Unless Ms. Robix can add anything to the contrary, none of you are aware of any individual who would purposefully be doing this to you. That means we're just trying to dig into any common links of people whom you all might have come in contact with, no matter how benign. Lila Robix glanced at the other women, leaned back, and brushed something off her pant leg. Other than some of the lice that hang around the bar begging for drinks and rides home, I can't really think of anyone who has a negative impression of me. Well, there might be some bill collectors I know who would want to pull something like this, but so far they've been happy enough to harass me over the phone, she said. Travis nodded, impressed with her candor. She had no qualms going right into difficulties she had. Right, Travis said, glancing over and seeing Nora had her eyes closed. It had been a mistake to just let her run out of the hospital like that. Who else do you all know? And I'm talking about anybody. Any old member of your club, a friend you met with occasionally, a florist you used, anybody. The three of them spent a moment cogitating before Jenny Iverson leaned forward. We all know the professors we had back at UW, most of whom were men, she said, getting nods from Clausen and Robix. Have you had any contact with any of them lately? Were you particularly close to any of the professors, or any of the other students for that matter? Iverson tilted her head and sucked her teeth. She sat up with her hands holding the side of the chair and her arms straight. Having seen her for a third time, it was clear long skirts and tight sweaters composed her outfit of choice. But as days had passed since she discovered her cat, the color had returned to her cheeks, and her light brown hair had been meticulously arranged. I saw one of our professors a few months ago at the grocery store or something. I smiled, but he went right by without noticing. It was Professor Harris, she said to the other two. I don't even think he knew me when I was in his class, Clausen said, adjusting her thick glasses. This professor didn't seem like a high priority, but they'd have to check him out. As for the other students, most of them drifted away immediately. These are the only two I've kept in touch with, and even that's been difficult, Iverson said. I've got a few more that I talk to sometimes, Robick said, but I guess it doesn't matter that much if Aaron and Jenny don't know them. At this point, we're looking for anybody all three of you might know. When you spend time together, do you often go to the same place where you know a waiter or bartender? Nora asked, seeming a little more lucid. She took a deep breath. What do you want us to do? Put a list together of every guy we've ever known so we can compare? Clausen asked. I can tell you all of the guys I work with, the guys I know who live in my apartment building, the guys I date. I thought you were in a relationship. Travis interjected. You are? Robix asked. Clausen became very circumspect of the women on each side of her. It was clear none of them were aware of her dalliance with her assistant. Card and I were occasionally feeling things out to see if it would work, she said, a flush of embarrassment coming over her. Let me guess what things you were feeling, Robix said under her breath. It was casual. Clausen went on, crossing her arms in front of her. But I was still meeting other men when they came along. Where did you meet these men? Nora asked. Online, mostly. I get messages sometimes from Match.com when people try to contact me. You're on Match.com, too? Iverson said, leaning back and laughing. That site is ridiculous. Everything on there is a lie. Robix nodded. Wait. So all three of you are on this site? Nora asked. Somehow talking about the Internet seemed to breathe more life into her. I am, but I'm on everything, Robix said. Match.com, eHarmony, Adult Friend Finder? What? Nothing's wrong with that if that's what you want. Clausen put her hand over her mouth. Have any of you ever received messages that were strange or threatening? Nora asked. Not me, Iverson said. Oh, of course you haven't, Clausen said, more than a little jealousy in her voice. I'm sure the guys save all of the crazy for me. 
Why would you even need to go on a site like that? All you'd need to do to get dates is go to a bar, sit there, and wait for someone to buy you a drink. I'd much prefer going to a bookstore and waiting for someone to pick me up by buying me a book. But it can be hard to meet men who are still single. That's why I gave in to the ever-present gravitational pull of online dating, Iverson said. Let's get back on top. Nobody here is judging what anybody does in their personal lives. We just need to know if there are any connections that could lead us to this killer. Ms. Clausen, you said you were getting strange messages? Yes, she said, settling down. Mostly they're just inappropriate requests for me to send pictures of my body parts that I immediately ignore. I don't know why I bring that out in people, but I can show you everything I've been sent. But I have met a few decent people there, though, even if Sparks were completely non-existent. Their names were Larry Stern, Jonathan Prick, and the last one was Christopher Walden. Wait, you actually went out with someone named Christopher Walden? Robix asked, setting her hand on Clausen's knee. I did, too, Jenny Iverson said, and a breathless kind of silence ensued. Nora and Travis exchanged glances. He felt like celebrating with her on a trampoline. A gut feeling said they were onto something crucial. Chapter 9 FBI Offices, Seattle Division, 1110 Third Avenue All five of them dashed from the lounge and commandeered the nearest office with a computer, practically throwing another agent into the hall. Within seconds, Jenny Iverson had logged into her account and brought up the page of Christopher Walden, whose profile picture was a basic portrait of a man with almond-colored hair a few inches long, somewhat chubby cheeks, and green eyes. That's definitely him. I'd almost forgotten what he looked like, Clausen said. One night of my life I'll never get back, Robix added, shaking her head. All he did was go on and on about the movies he'd seen lately. It was like I'd watched a dozen flicks in one night. I don't even think we left the restaurant together. He seemed nervous and awkward when we were out early this year, but there was no chemistry, and I think he could tell I wasn't interested in a second date because he never asked. I recall spending a lot of time in the bathroom, Iverson said, glancing back over her shoulder at them. As much as it seemed like something clear to go on, it was Travis's job to poke holes in the emerging theory. So none of you ever said anything to each other about going on a date with the exact same person you met on the same website? He asked. Unless the guy is spectacularly bad or relatively promising, there's not much to talk about. Bringing up your blot date from last night isn't a conversation starter that's going to lead anywhere other than a feeling of loneliness, Iverson said. I only saw him once and it was a few years ago. I was anxious to completely forget about it as soon as possible. Robix added. I saw him last year, Clausen said, leaning closer to the screen. And now that I think about it, this guy might have been hanging around my building lately, except he'd grown a mustache and always wore a Seahawks cap. I can't believe I didn't put it together sooner. Nora and Travis exchanged another glance. They needed to find this Christopher Walden guy fast. But let's wait a second. Does three bad dates spaced out over a couple of years really result in this kind of stalking and murder from someone who loves movies and, according to the profile, loves doing crossword puzzles in his boxers? Nora wondered. Travis figured the dates were more than enough to go on for now. They could find out more when they brought him in and put him through the ringer. Didn't he have a birthmark, something lower on his face, between the back of his jaw and his ear? Iverson asked pointing at the man's image. Not that I recall, Robix said. I don't remember it. If you ask me, I don't think he did, Clausen said, shaking her head. Well, did he have one or not? Travis asked, getting impatient. He needed to get a research team in motion to start scouring for information on this guy. If they acted quickly, they could be able to nab him before he knew they were onto him. His head is tilted to the side a little, so even if he did have one, you might not be able to see it. Or it was photoshopped out, Clausen added. Both were plausible scenarios. Whether he had a birthmark or not, we'll find him and see how much involvement he had in this, Travis said, ducking out to tip off some of the researchers downstairs. 
When he returned to the office, he found the group looking at the messages received from Walden on Match.com. Another window displayed the emails from B.F. Sneezer, most prominently the one that was not in all caps. Do you see the similarities? Nora asked, breaking into a big grin. There aren't even any identical phrases, but there's a rhythm to the construction that matches. Some of the vocabulary, like cuisine instead of food from Walden, and even tramp instead of something more uncouth from B.F. Sneezer, suggests that he's got a little more depth to him, some calculating tendencies, or perhaps just an affinity for language. It doesn't sound like someone blinded by rage. It's more thoughtful, calculating. Creepy. Iverson interjected. I'm not sure I can stand much more talk about how dangerously collected this guy is. I don't think I'll be able to sleep until he's locked up in jail, but I'll have to try. Travis agreed that what they'd provided would be more than enough for now, and considering how late it was in the day, it would probably be best for them to head home. Each residence would have someone nearby keeping an eye out, and additional security measures had been installed to instantly alert rapid response teams of any sign of an intrusion. Telling them that wasn't as much comfort as saying they had a suspect in custody, but for now it'd have to do. Handing them off left Travis alone until he returned to the office to find Nora still poring over the computer. She was running searches for Walden's address while struggling to keep her eyes open. Hey, the guys downstairs are going to handle this. We just need to give them some time to dig it up and get back to us, he said. When Travis tugged on her sleeve to pull her away from the computer, she brushed him away. I'm already getting some references to San Antonio in these searches. If I can just zero in on an address, we might be able to prove that this guy was the one who sent the package to Jenny Iverson, she said. Are you going to be able to figure out how he went back in time to send her the dead cat before it had been taken, too? Travis asked, gently mocking her. What we need to do right now is call it a day so we can roll up our sleeves and tackle this properly tomorrow. Nora glanced at him absently and blinked. When she returned her attention to the screen, she was having trouble clicking on a link she wanted. I'm fine, she said. You're practically a zombie. Travis laughed, grabbing the arm of the wheelchair and dragging it around the desk and toward the office door. How about a home-cooked meal at my place? And who's going to provide that? You? Nora asked. She tried to grab onto some nearby furniture. I would have if I'd spent the day lying in a marsh with my 12-gauge like I wanted. But as it is, we'll have to see what my mom's whipping up, he said. She raised an eyebrow, and he knew he was in for it. Did she pack your lunch for you, too? She goaded him, smiling broadly as he wheeled her right out of the office and toward the elevator. Some people walking by gave them funny looks. No, she didn't. Did she do your laundry and fold it nicely on your bed? She asked, really pressing Travis's buttons. If that's what you think all moms do, you're going to be very surprised by my mom. Travis endured quite a bit more taunting during the drive through the rain to his parents' place on the southern side of town. Nora was in high spirits about needling him, but he had a feeling his mother was going to serve up some just desserts. He pulled into a gravel driveway by a house surrounded by tall pine trees. Fallen needles covered most of the lawn, except for a chicken coop and pen visible in the back. After parking behind his brother's truck, he got out and led her along a row of bushes to the concrete front steps, supporting a wicker rocking chair and waist-high pile of beautiful white marble stones. The wooden door creaked as it opened, allowing them into a spacious interior featuring a roaring fire and stained wooden furniture. When they came around the corner, they found Travis's mother, father, and bear of a brother cracking walnuts with hammers. They looked at Nora as if she were a ten-point buck. Hope you don't mind, but I invited someone over for a dinner that doesn't come in a plastic sleeve. This is Nora Wexler, a new FBI agent. The family lumbered over, all smiles. It's so nice to meet you, Nora said. Is there anything I can do to help? Great, Travis's mother Loretta said. Do you want to hold down the chicken while it gets slaughtered? What? Nora asked, 
glancing back at Travis with the first hints of trepidation in her eyes. She just got out of the hospital today, so it'd be good if we could take it a little easy on her. That, and I wouldn't want to deprive you of helping your mother, Nora said, making Travis grind his teeth. On second thought, let her have it, he said. How about something a little easier? We could use a hand chopping some firewood, Loretta proposed. Both Travis and Nora peeked through a window to the backyard, where there wasn't a pile of wood in sight. Where's the wood that needs to be chopped? Nora asked. Travis's father, Marshall, chuckled and scratched his thick beard. There's a maple over there that's leaning toward the house and needs to go. The axe is right next to the shed, he said. Nora's mouth hung open, possibly because she was thinking about how she might end up crushing their house under a fallen tree. Maybe I'm better off with the meat. I did eat vegan for a while during college, but not anymore, she said, catching the interest of Travis's burly brother, Kent. You ate vegan? What animal does that come from? Is it anything like veal? Kent asked. Travis shook his head at his simple-minded younger brother who had somehow managed to live his entire life inside a subscription to Field and Stream magazine. His beard was darker and shorter than their father's, but Kent was a bit leaner and had a more affable look to him. It's the opposite of eating meat, you knucklehead, Marshall scolded his son, who seemed hopelessly confused by the concept, as did his father, come to think of it. Not been eating meat? Loretta piped up, giving Nora a quick shake of the shoulder. Can't say I'm surprised. You're nothing but skin and bones. Probably not enough meat in there for a full meal. But maybe I'm wrong. Come on with me to the kitchen for dinner preparations. Loretta clasped Nora's arm and started dragging her away. It's nice to meet you, I think, Nora muttered, but her eyes said, help. Travis was tempted to tell her there was only a small chance she'd end up on the menu for the evening, but she'd figure it out on her own. Where'd you rustle that one up? Kent asked with something furtive in his eyes. Other than hunting and fishing, Travis's younger brother always had a keen interest in his personal life, probably because he didn't meet too many women at the bait and tackle shop. She's really just a co-worker. We were put on a case together back in Albany, and her computer skills were a good match for the one thrown in my lap when I got here. Kent, I wish I was out there with you soaking in the wide open spaces and getting up close and personal with wildlife, but this case is a puzzler that's too good to pass up. We're finally starting to close in on the person we think has been rampaging around, and at this point all we need to do is sleep on it. That's not all you need to do. Now don't think just because you brought an extra set of hands you can get out of doing your chores, Marshall said to Travis. We need to get the storm drains unclogged, because this deluge isn't showing any signs of stopping. Might have the whole Pacific Ocean on our heads before it's done. Knowing better than to argue and face the wrath of his father, Travis nodded in agreement and prepared to brave the rainstorm and clean out the storm drains running along the roof of the house. It took the better part of an hour to drag a ladder around and scoop out all the nasty muck that had collected. But when he was finally done, the rumble in his stomach and the anxious feeling to cast off his gloves and stuff his face were overwhelming. After he put the ladder away and returned inside through the back door, he was surprised to find Nora and his mother laughing together as they prepared chicken wings with butter and cayenne pepper sauce. His shirt was drenched and dripping on the floor, but he lingered a moment while taking off his boots to listen to what they were saying. They were laughing about angry birds, which could be pretty pesky unless you toss them some stale bread. It certainly wasn't what he expected to see the two of them become friends so fast. Need something, Trav? Loretta called without looking up. Travis scooted on with his head down as though he'd been caught. More laughter. But after cleaning up, he was treated to a dinner table covered in chicken wings, mashed potatoes, meatloaf, garlic bread, and even some leftover duck. The smell was enough to make his mouth water. Kent was nearly drooling. This looks amazing, but what are you all going to eat? Travis said as he sat down. The others chuckled and began loading up their plates. You'd better get in there, honey, Loretta said to Nora, who'd been waiting patiently for her turn. This is winner take all. Travis said you're doing a lot of work with computers. 
Why'd you get into that? Marshall asked between bites. Nora had managed to secure a few wings and some bread, which she seemed content enough with to answer. When you look at the numbers, one of the fastest growing categories of crime is computer crimes. It's an incredibly broad category in itself. Everything from identity theft to hacking to cyber harassment. What interests me the most is how criminals use basic internet tools, like emails accounts or messengers, to deceive their victims about the legitimacy of something. People have to be on their guard about everything they do, or they could lose it all to some clever phishing, she explained. Passwords, bank account numbers, addresses, social security numbers, phone numbers, any sensitive data that can be recorded by keeping track of your keystrokes on a computer. Most people think phishing attempts are just links in spam messages, but they're getting increasingly sophisticated. So much so that these fake messages seem exactly like messages you'd get from your friends or colleagues, she said. Heh, yeah, back when I was in the service, most of the computer work was related to radar anyway. I wasn't much involved with that and still don't have any use for the Internet. I guess I'm pretty safe from these sort of crimes, Marshall said. At least now Nora knew where Travis got his Luddite ways from. Obviously, you can't lose any information you don't put online, but with the way everything is connected, if you so much as use your credit card anywhere, there's a chance someone could hack into that store system to get your information. I hope it never happens to you, but there's a chance, Nora said. That's what you think, Marshall went on, grinning. The woods we hunt in don't take credit cards. Heck, I closed my bank account once this house was paid for. Now all my money's buried in old shotgun shell cases in an undisclosed location. Ain't nobody gonna find it. Oh, Nora said, nodding and glancing at Travis. She was getting an eye-opener for sure. They continued talking through the rest of the meal, only stopping when they were all stuffed. Travis helped clear away the dishes, giving Nora time to roam the house. By the time everything was cleaned, he started looking around to see where she'd gone only to discover her asleep on the couch by the fire. He draped a blanket over her and watched her snooze for a moment, hopeful that it would relieve her of any after-effects of her ordeal. Sleep tight, Agent Wexler. Tomorrow we bag us our suspect. Chapter 10, FBI Recon Center, 1110 Third Avenue Nora had woken up with a headache, but that was nothing compared to how disoriented she'd felt the day before. Remembering what she'd done or said was like walking through a thick fog, but the one feeling that never left her since the explosion was that the case now felt more personal than ever before. In her mind, she'd been attacked, and under that kind of pressure, she was the type to fight back. Showering and breakfast at Greer's house had gone by in a blur, and all of a sudden she found herself sitting next to him in a back row of the division's high-tech surveillance room. Agent Johnson stood at the front, flipping through papers near a number of large monitors hooked to FBI reconnaissance equipment. There were satellite feeds juxtaposed with some of the web profiles and messages they'd been unearthing over the past few days. Johnson appeared groggy, as did many of the agents and technicians filing in and taking seats behind the laptops littering the desks in the room. Many of them must have put in most of the night, connecting the dots on their suspect, and now it was time to see what they had. Let's get started, Johnson said, his voice firm and authoritative as he surveyed the room. Three days ago, Jenny Iverson received a death threat and the body of her dead cat in the mail, sent from San Antonio, Texas, via the U.S. Postal Service. Two days ago, Aaron Clausen's personal assistant, Ricardo Lantham, was poisoned, and Lila Robix's daughter, Lori, was nearly killed when a bomb implanted in her car went off. Our primary suspect for these crimes is this man, seen here in his Match.com profile, which he used to contact and pursue the three women who make up the Founders Club. His name is Christopher Walden, and he's in his late thirties, a Seattle native who moved to San Antonio about six months ago to work in a fulfillment center just north of the city. We've got his address, and the San Antonio Division is dispatching a team to intercept him today. 
Nora leaned forward and felt her heart rate accelerate. It was news to her that Walden had moved to San Antonio about six months ago, which was right around when Iverson received her first threatening email from B.F. Sneezer. It all seemed to click. Moving away for a new job may have caused some sort of separation anxiety relating to no longer being able to keep tabs on his target. Perhaps he was lonely in his new city and needed to revisit the women who had spurned him, triggering his violent tendencies. On the main monitor here, we've got a feed from the agents in the van, preparing to close in on his home while Walden finishes up his 3 a.m. to noon shift. There are eyes on the fulfillment center, in case anything tips him off and we need to arrest him early, but we wanted to sweep through his house once by ourselves and then have him there to start working on a confession based on what we find. Nodding, Nora imagined what a surprise it'd be for him when he got home to discover that they'd got him. He was going to pay for what he'd done. Wait, if he's been working all this time, how could he have possibly been in Seattle to commit these crimes? Greer asked, dousing Nora's enthusiasm with a bucket full of cold water. Her head jerked to Johnson, hoping for a good answer. As it turns out, this is Walden's first shift after a week-long vacation, Johnson said. What a way to spend a vacation, Nora said, relieved. Indeed. Let's take a look at the potential timeline. First, we have security footage on this monitor of a post office in San Antonio, where Walden sent out the package containing the carcass he got from Seattle and the death threat. Next, we have Iverson recognizing that her cat is missing, only for it to arrive at her office two days later. At no point were any plane or train tickets purchased for any of this, and a drive from Seattle to San Antonio typically takes about 36 hours straight. The man on the screen mesmerized Nora, and she stared blankly at the security footage of a man nonchalantly sending a dead cat through the mail. With the chubby cheeks and matted hair, it was undeniably him. His head bobbled as though he were humming a tune to himself. It was sickening how unfazed he was by the events he was setting in motion. It took three days for the package to reach Iverson, during which time he drove back to Seattle to commit two more crimes and then immediately turned around to drive home. I think it's pretty obvious that there's something we're missing, because even if he's used to 12 or 14 hour shifts, Driving across the country four times in about a week is a step beyond even the most mind-boggling things criminals have done during my career. Nora pursed her lips and sighed, trying to piece it together in her mind. She knew that this was the guy who did it. Heck, they had footage of him sending the cat in the mail from six states away. But the unpleasant truth was that it seemed like a stretch. The only question was where the timeline broke down. Maybe the cat theft, poisoning, and car bomb installation had actually all happened at the same time right at the start. The bomb could have been remotely activated, and the poison could have built up over time, maybe in a substitute for a vitamin Lantham took daily at lunch. These theories required more answers, and Nora was burning to know. What if he really put the pedal to the metal? Would it then have been possible for Walden to make those drives if they took 30 hours each? I might have been able to swing that, Greer said, leaning back as he made a nakedly macho boast. Johnson looked at him and clicked his tongue as he contemplated. Until we bring him in and talk to him, get a look at his car, this is the best we have to go on. I will say that screaming across the country back and forth at a hundred miles an hour the entire way, without encountering a single highway patrol, seems luckier than drawing four royal flushes in a row. They're arriving at the residence, sir, one of the technicians said. Good. Bring it up on the main screen. We're looking for anything related to the three women. Pictures, notes, anything. Keep a tail on Walden and let me know when he departs, Johnson said. The video feed showed the van pulling up beside the gravel driveway at a ranch-style home featuring a wooden corral fence and some hanging plants full of radiant flowers. The house number and the name, Walden, were clearly visible by the door. There were even some bright pinwheels on the lawn spinning in the slight breeze. The place looked cheerful in a way Norma wouldn't have guessed. The team exited the van and approached the door, 
while the video gave them a good look at one of the agents using some tools to pick the lock. After going through the trouble of digging into the keyhole, the agents had a good laugh when they simply turned the knob to open the unlocked door. As they stepped into a foyer featuring a few tall cacti, Nora started to feel restless in her plastic seat. We're really supposed to just sit here and watch them pick through the house? Nora asked, whispering to Greer. Beats flying back and forth, he said, shrugging. But his answer was unsatisfactory when what she really wanted was to come face to face with Walden and question him herself. She could just imagine pinning him against the wall and telling him exactly how disgusting he was for what he'd done. Not much in the house seemed to gel with that disgustingness. Not the hundreds of DVD cases stacked around a top-of-the-line entertainment center, the six-pack of Sierra Nevada Pale Ale in the fridge that Greer lusted after, or the pictures of friends and family on the walls. The most lascivious thing they found was a pack of condoms in the sock drawer. It's always the deranged lunatics that are most concerned about safe sex, one of the agents on location said over the comm link. Johnson cast a wary glance at Nora, who suddenly felt like she was on the hook for her lead. The neat and cozy home didn't disqualify Christopher Walden as a suspect, but they certainly hadn't found the smoking gun they were looking for. Best they could tell, he didn't even have a computer at home, which was inexplicable. My take is that this guy's got a double life going, Nora said, burying her doubts. What we're seeing is a friendly guy who, under most normal circumstances, behaves in a way that would never cause any alarm. But something about these women set him off, exposing something completely at odds with his day-to-day -day habits. The supposition was good enough for Johnson, who abandoned his look and pulled a laptop over on the desk in front of him. Do we have any other points of contact other than these three dates and the emails? He asked, adjusting his tie. Not anything significant from the looks of it. While living in Seattle, he didn't do any business with Team Think or Spick and Span. It's possible he visited Rob X's bar, Tank Top, but she doesn't ever recall interacting with him there. There aren't even any phone or text records. No missed calls or voicemails. Deciding not to pursue a relationship with these women appears to be something he mutually participated in, one of the technicians in the room said while hunched over a keyboard. If all we're looking at are these dates, is it possible there's something the victims aren't telling us about what happened? Walden seemed to have gone on dates with a dozen other women in the area, but why target only these three? Is it possible he was humiliated in some way? Johnson asked. The question took Nora aback. She'd been going on faith that Iverson, Clausen, and Robix had been telling her the full truth. But what if something had happened that had turned a few poor dates over the span of a few years into a motive for murder? What if the three women had conspired to humiliate him in some way? It's something we'll have to look into, Nora said, casting a sidelong glance at Greer while reaching for her pad to make a note. They'd need to get much more out of the Founders Club about where the dates were held, what they did, and what they talked about. Walden's on the move, one of the technicians said. Nora nearly gasped when she saw that now familiar face on the screen ahead of her. A drone flying overhead documented his exit from work, his walk through a large parking lot, and how he climbed into a blue Honda Accord. What year is that vehicle? Johnson asked. 1998. This time, Greer shifted uncomfortably in his chair. He glanced over at her and opened his mouth, but she didn't want to hear it. I know, she whispered. A car that old was already on its last legs, and four flawless and fast trips across country would have been a miracle. Maybe he had another car somewhere, one that he borrowed from one of those friends in the pictures. It burned that every tiny detail had to come with a justification or excuse. After Walden hit the road and made a few turns, it was clear he had opted to deviate from the route they expected him to take. Nora wasn't sure if she should be nervous or excited that he was throwing another wrench into their plan, or that he might be running for it. Do we have any inkling why a man who just worked the dead man's shift wouldn't go home to sleep? Make sure the follow car is in position. Johnson said. He continued to talk to the agents in the San Antonio division, 
but the deviation was simply to pick up a slice of pizza that he consumed while driving the rest of the way home. Nora felt her hands get clammy as he drove past the FBI van and pulled into his driveway. Taking shallow breaths, she watched him walk to the front of his house and open the door. Her eyes shifted from the drone's cam to that of the agent standing behind the door, who immediately ordered him onto the floor with his hands behind his head, guns drawn. The look of wild dismay on the man's face was almost delicious. Now he had a taste of what the women in the Founders Club had gone through when their tragedy struck. Walden complied immediately, whimpering as he sprawled onto the tile floor. Seattle, we've got him, one of the agents said. Johnson cracked a smile while others in the room cheered and hooted. Greer slapped a hand on Nora's shoulder, but still she could tell they shared the same doubts. With Walden in the bag, they were depending on him to fill in the gaps about how he had done what he did. Nora found herself increasingly drawn to the idea that all three crimes had been committed at once at the very start, which would completely eliminate the need for so many cross-country dashes. Well done, Johnson said. See if he can point you to any computer hardware in the house, and then take him in for questioning. Let me know if he tells you anything useful immediately. Johnson removed his headset and placed it on the table, took one last look at the monitors and the operation they'd successfully pulled off, and strode down the center aisle for the exit. He gave the slightest nod to Nora on his way out. It all depended on what Walden said and what they could prove. Greer got up to stretch his legs when his phone went off. He glared suspiciously at the screen before motioning to answer. It's about time they called me, he said. Who is it? Nora asked, curious. Yeah. Uh-uh. Understood. We'll be right over. No, that's fine. I appreciate it. Bye. Nora got to her feet and crossed her arms, growing miffed that she was in the dark about something Greer made perfectly obvious was important. So? Greer grinned at Nora, seeming to revel in leaving her in the dark. She resisted the urge to pout and stamp her feet about it. Finally, he cracked. You said you'd rather get out and do something rather than sit around here and watch. Now we've got some place to go. That was the hospital. Lori Robix is awake and trying to make a run for it. What kind of idiot would do such a thing? Nora wondered. Let's get right over there. Chapter 11, UW Medical Center Nurse Wendy met them at the large sliding glass doors of the hospital, with her hands on her hips and a noticeably new layer of makeup on her face. As the young nurse glared momentarily at Wexler, Travis wondered if she'd ignored her patience to put on all that makeup. Agent Greer, she called, as they passed by toward the spacious reception area and the elevators. Suddenly she had wormed in between the two of them and was looking up longingly at him. Don't worry. Lori Robix is safely in her room after trying to run away while the police officer guarding the door went to the bathroom. One of our janitors saw her and wrestled her down. The girl is in rough shape and really shouldn't be going anywhere. Travis mulled the situation over in his head as the elevator doors closed in front of them. It was a short ride up, barely enough time for him to scratch the surface at why an injured high school senior would try to run after her car had exploded in front of her. But walking down the hall and seeing the police officer leaning against the wall by Robix's door gave him something else to think about. You couldn't wait to take a leak, he said, garnering a blank, only here to collect a paycheck stare from the middle-aged officer that Travis hoped he'd never display. Robix must have been pretending to sleep until an opportunity presented itself for her to at least clear the room. Wendy unlocked the door, then feigned opening it to draw Travis in closer. The scent on her was an odd mix of citrus and bleach. Travis wondered why she was so taken with him. The way things were, even asking her one question would have been too much permission for her to continue harping on him. You're looking exhausted. If you need to lie down somewhere quiet, I can arrange that, she said. Travis reached out for her hand on the knob and helped her push the door open. He breathed a little easier when he and Wexler left her behind to enter. Maybe you should take her up on it. Pump her for information, using your sex appeal, 
Wexler said. I'm not sure the latest hospital gossip will help the case, he said, turning his attention to the young woman in the hospital bed. Lori Robix had a number of bandages on her face and arms, many with blood staining them. It must have taken a Herculean effort for her to make it as far as she did, especially with the lethargic look in her eyes. Maybe they put her on a sedative. Lori, do you remember me? I'm Agent Wexler, and I met you in front of your house right before the explosion, she said. The way the young girl's eyes widened and she scooted back in bed made it clear her memory was both intact and causing her alarm. And I'm Agent Greer. After you were knocked down, I called for the ambulance that brought you here. I'm glad to see you're going to make it through. Do you mind if we talk to you for a few minutes about what happened? He asked. It's fine, she said, perhaps figuring she had no choice in the matter. A strap across her waist kept her held to the bed. Travis noticed a strand of black hair hanging over the bandage by her temple. She was a beautiful girl who'd been thrown into something terrible. First, why did you try to leave the hospital without permission? And why did you struggle with me outside of your house? We want to help you, but you have to admit you're not giving us much of a chance to trust you, Wexler said. Robix glanced at one of the walls, evasive. I'm sorry about that. Maybe it's because of some of the situations that have happened at my mom's bar, but I can't say I'm all that comfortable around police. I didn't want to deal with you then, and I don't like having somebody standing outside of the door all day keeping me trapped in here, she said with convincing candor. What we want to do is figure out exactly what happened to you and bring the person who did it to justice, but in order for us to do that, we need your help. Before the explosion, when was the last time you'd driven your car? Wexler asked, sitting in a chair by the bed and leaning closer. It was apparent to Travis how intently Nora searched the girl's every expression for an answer. Lori Robix rested her head against the pillow and let her shoulders drop. I'd driven it after school the day before, she said. Nora pursed her lips. Travis was well aware of her new theory that all of the crimes had been committed at once when Dina the cat was stolen. It wasn't out of the question that the bomb had been installed days before it was remotely armed, but it was another hoop to jump through. Had you seen anyone around your car in the prior week? Has anyone been repeatedly driving by? Did you notice anything different about your car in the week before this happened? Nora asked. Um, not really. Lori Robix said. She had a singer's voice, one that could probably make her a lot of money someday. But when I'm at school and the car is sitting there in the driveway, I guess anybody could do whatever they wanted to it, so long as my mom was at the bar. I was stupid to leave it out there. Do you have any idea who might have done this to you, or for what reason? Travis asked as he watched Nora reach for her phone. He knew what she was going to do, but wanted to hit Robix with a question that wouldn't lead her first. No, she answered, shaking her head slightly and looking down at her hands. It made Travis stop to think. Can you take a look at my phone and tell me if you've ever seen this man before? His name's Christopher Walden, and he used to live in the area up until about six months ago, Wexler said, bringing up the man's profile picture on the screen. Robix winced in pain when she leaned over, but it wasn't because of the picture. I don't know him, and I haven't ever seen him before, she said. Are you aware that he went on a date with your mother once? Wexler asked, but Robix simply gave a shake of her head. The girl's behavior increasingly intrigued Travis, who found it surprising how little reaction she had when presented with the picture of a man they were suggesting had tried to blow her up. Travis put his hand on Wexler's shoulder to indicate that he wanted to take this in a different direction. There was no doubt Robix didn't have a clue about what had been done to her car. Can you tell us more about you and the kinds of activities you're involved in? Travis asked. Robix sighed and glanced over at the door. Yeah, I can tell you about that. I'm basically like anyone else my age. I like spending a lot of time at the mall picking out new clothes with my friends. We go to a lot of shows and dance performances around town on the weekends. Soul, some pop, hip-hop. I used to belong to a step dance team, 
but gave that up about a year ago, she said. Talking about herself seemed to calm her down a bit. Footsteps coming quickly down the hall hit Travis's ears, putting a sudden sense of urgency in his mind. Where have you worked in the past year? he asked. I don't have a job. Laurie, you said you spent a lot of time shopping for clothes, and we know that your car was paid for with cash. If you don't have a job, where are you getting the money for all of this? Travis asked. Robix was frozen for a moment in her bed until the footsteps ceased and her face lit up with a bright smile. Good God, girl, you scared me half to death, Lila Robix said, rushing into the room and practically burying her daughter in a hug. Travis and Wexler exchanged a quick glance. She understood what he'd been homing in on. Wexler stood up alongside Travis, and the two of them watched the touching mother-daughter scene playing out in front of them. After a few words of sympathy for Lori's wounds, Lila finally gave her daughter space enough to notice that the agents were right there. Did you figure out what happened to her car? She asked them. We're still working on it. Shouldn't be too much longer. But we do have a suspect in custody, Travis said. What are you hanging around here for, then? Lila prodded. Go figure it out, so by the time we're set to get out of here, we don't have to worry about any of this nonsense at home. We'll do our best, Wexler said, turning for the door. They were unlikely to get much more information out of Lori with her increasingly indignant mother around. Now was not the time to make a scene. Travis wished Lori a speedy recovery and exited into the long hall. They passed the police officer guarding the door on their way to the elevator across from a supply closet. When Wexler reached to press the button to call the elevator, Travis stopped her. You think she's hiding something? What? Wexler was sharp as a tack. It had been a while since he'd worked with a good partner who could quickly pick up on his cues. Travis scratched the back of his head and glanced up and down the hall to make sure no one was around. We know enough about her mother and the bar to conclude that they are not her primary sources of income. What is she involved in that's generating that kind of cash? Whatever it is, her mother doesn't seem to have the slightest notion about it, Travis said. You think it's something bad? Wexler asked. She had a way of looking at him that was both soothing and challenging. He didn't want to be wrong in front of her, but he wasn't sure if this direction mattered at all. It may very well be. Think about what we've seen so far and what we're trying to pin on Walden. There's a dead cat, a dead assistant, and then a car bomb. The sweep through the San Antonio residence didn't produce the slightest trace of any evidence that he could produce a bomb. That doesn't mean he didn't do it, Wexler said. True. I can understand a seemingly normal guy with an impulse to kill, but nobody can just slap together a car bomb to carry out a whim like that. So you think other people might be involved? She asked. Travis shrugged. We won't know until we find out more. But the real question is if there's any connection between Lori Robick's secret profession and these other people who helped Walden get his hands on the explosive. What if it wasn't just a way to threaten the mother? What if Lori tried to run because she thought she was still in danger? Travis wondered. That doesn't fit the pattern, Wexler said, some frustration appearing on her face. I know there haven't been any more attacks or follow-ups on the threat since then, but that's because we've kept such a close eye on the founders and Walden's in custody. Travis couldn't bring himself to tell Wexler the conclusion he was drawing. He reached over to press the button to call the elevator, crossed his arms, and tried to think through the mess of possibilities. It aches how close we are to the answers here, but even if they're right in front of our faces, we don't have enough information to spot them, he said. The elevator door opened, and the pair walked in and turned around. Travis hit the button for the ground floor, and when he looked up, he noticed that the door to the supply closet across the hall was slightly ajar. An eye floated in the gap from someone leaning over from behind it. The elevator doors closed, sealing them alone together. Someone was listening in on us, Wexler said. Her hair rolled over her shoulder as she looked up at Travis. I have a good guess who, that nurse Wendy, he said. If she wanted to make the jump from merely annoying to potentially troublesome, eavesdropping on conversations like that would do the trick. 
Do you think she'll do anything? Go to the press? A blog? I have no idea. If she's smart, she won't do anything more than revel in an inflated sense of importance for the day. There were a few bits of information he'd said that weren't public knowledge, such as the suspect's name. But mostly the issue was that the nurse had heard a number of unfounded theories. It made for an uncomfortable elevator ride in silence. When the doors opened and they passed a few people getting on, their attention turned to what was going on with the suspect they held in custody. I can't wait to get back to the office and find out what Walden said when they threw the hard questions at him, Wexler said. Ahead, the large glass windows of the spacious lobby gave them a great view of the ongoing storm and the pouring rain. When Travis reached for the door handle and braced for the rain, his buzzing phone kept him from following through. In a second, he'd backed away from the door and got up close and personal with some tall potted plants to take the call. Hello, this is Greer, he said. Wexler was right at his side, watching him with impatience. Okay, we'll be right there. Thanks for the call. How come I never get any of these revelatory phone calls? Wexler asked, following Travis as he ducked into the rainstorm. That was Agent Encore, one of Johnson's top guys. He's over at Asian Delights with the owner and one of the distributor's trucks. He says it's important, Travis explained. Maybe we can get to the bottom of how Ricardo Lantham was poisoned, Wexler said. Chapter 12, West St. John Street The agent strolled around behind the restaurant to see the now familiar back alley littered with damp cardboard, reeking dumpsters, and the open loading dock where a large delivery truck from the distributor was positioned. It blocked the entire opening of the building, leaving only a foot or two of room to get in via some narrow steps on either side. As they came over, Travis noticed Agent Angkor talking to the corpulent delivery man on the dock under a thin canopy. Noticing their approach, Angkor shook the man's hand and came down the steps and around the truck to greet them. Both of his ears were pierced with small hoops, and a tattoo of the Buddha peeked out on his neck above the collar. Of Southeast Asian heritage, Angkor had a slim frame but a powerful mind. If they weren't careful, he'd manage to crack the case on his own and leave them in the dust. How'd a ray of sunshine like you get into this rainy city? He asked Nora, who chuckled while the two of them shook hands. Angkor was also apparently something of a smooth talker. Do you guys even have a sky out here? There must be something above that unbroken cloud cover, she said, glancing up. Not that I know of, Angkor said, turning to Travis. Greer. Hope you don't mind me horning in on your case. Just because you're on vacation doesn't mean you get to have all of the fun. Johnson has me trying to tie up some of the loose ends and keeping track of the lab work, which is starting to produce actionable results. Yeah? What have you got? Greer asked. Angkor was friendly and animated. Even just being around him was fun, which was saying something, considering that they were dealing with minute details and serious subject matter. Right behind me, you can see the exact delivery truck in the same position it was beside the dock when Ricardo Lantham came by to pick up his order last week. The working theory was that the suspect used the open loading bay to sneak in and spike his container of cashew chicken, but there are a number of reasons that we can now emphatically say that that is not the case. Okay, because just having a truck there wouldn't rule it out, Nora said. True, but we've cleared the delivery crew. Nobody from the distributor was involved. In fact, the driver up there always eats lunch here on his route. And on the day of the murder, he was leaning against his truck facing directly into the kitchen. There is no way anybody could have used this entrance without him noticing. Not only that, but we've cleared the entire kitchen. Not a speck of known toxins tainting any of the food, the surfaces, the cookware, anything, Angkor explained. Greer went to the wall of the building and took a look up the steps for himself. Do we even know what poison we're looking for yet? Travis asked, glancing back at Angkor. Yes, and there's not a trace of it, but we'll talk more about that soon, he said. As much as going through the present scene was important, Travis had a burning interest to know what had actually killed Lantham. His bet was that the food contained cyanide, a silent and quick killer. 
Pouring some of it into the plastic tray wouldn't have been difficult, but getting some in the first place was more of a challenge. All right, then. So odds are he didn't enter and exit through the loading bay door to tamper with the food. This is a relatively large building, though, with a number of storage closets, restrooms, refrigerators, etc. The kitchen staff is probably used to seeing people coming in and out to take orders or make deliveries. Especially if the staff doesn't speak English as well as Mr. Chan, they'd be unlikely to question someone about why they were around. That's a good point, Wexler said. It's amazing what you can get away with when there's a language barrier. One time, when I was at a hotel in France, there was a guy going through the laundry bags people put out, who I thought was an employee, but ended up being a random perv. I can't tell you how long I was stuck without underwear. I'm so sorry I wasn't around to help with that situation, Angkor said. Anyway, Travis said, calling Angkor back from the daydream he'd lulled himself into. Is there any chance the suspect was hiding elsewhere in the building? Angkor crossed his arms and zipped up his FBI jacket a little higher. I really don't think so. It'd be impossible for him to know exactly when Lantham came to order, or even if he would come. Remember that Aaron Clausen said they had no plans to eat here, and the decision was made on the spur of the moment. Really, the staff would probably be less hospitable to an unknown person hanging around the back of the restaurant than you might think, he said. Travis had heard enough. He looked over at Wexler to see if she was drawing the same conclusion. She was biting her lip and cringing a bit at the restaurant's damp brick facade. Okay, I'm ready to concede that the poisoning didn't occur here and that there's no evidence of criminal wrongdoing on the part of the restaurant or the distributor. That means the poisoning occurred either on the way to the Spick and Span warehouse or in the actual office, possibly right at Lantham's desk. Is that where you're leading us? Travis asked, impatient just to know it already. Angkor smiled as he strung Travis along a bit. It is, and that makes sense when you realize the substance that killed Ricardo Lantham. This type of poison is virtually undetectable under most conditions because its elements are already commonly found in the human body, and small doses are necessary to live. But a powerful dose of this odorless, colorless poison triggers severe heart arrhythmia until sudden cardiac death occurs within minutes. I spend a lot of time working with controlled substances and chemicals in the lab, and I have to say that this is a deceptively convenient choice for the killer. If Clausen hadn't suspected poison because Lantham was eating, we might have missed it altogether, even though it wouldn't have been hard to come by at all. For all intents and purposes, Lantham died of a heart attack then, Travis observed, scratching his chin and pondering what the poison was. He was familiar with quite a few. Cyanide, arsenic, hemlock, belladonna, dimethylmercury, botulinum, but this wasn't ringing a bell. Oh, he's talking about potassium chloride, Wexler said. Angkor gave her an affectionate pat on the back, nudging her forward so they'd start moving toward the street. Beautiful and smart, Angkor said. Travis had to kick himself for not recalling that compound, which was actually the final one administered in many lethal injections. Of course, and considering Clausen's company ships cleaning supplies, there's a strong chance it could be found right on the premises, Travis said, finally contributing something of value. They rounded the corner and walked along rainy Queen Anne Avenue toward the Spick and Span warehouse. But with potassium chloride, there's no way that it was simply put into his food and ingested, Wexler went on, clearly trying to trump Travis. It had to be injected into him with a hypodermic needle. Walden might have been able to intercept Lantham around the building or even somewhere inside. Clausen said she saw someone who looked like him hanging around lately. There's something else, Travis spoke up. Angkor said it would have taken minutes for him to die, and one would expect some degree of struggle. Clausen said when she found him, he was already dead at his desk. Could someone have managed to make it all the way up to his desk to stick him with a needle? The questions hung in the air, unanswerable by any of them for the time being. But they hoped that would change as they approached the Spick and Span warehouse, which looked much different than it did the last time they were here. Gone were all of the police vehicles and their flashing lights. 
Now it just looked like a plain old office building with an orange sign over the door and the occasional shipping truck coming and going from some loading bays. Everyone was back to work, raising the possibility that whatever they were looking for was long gone. Should we go right up to see Clausen? Ancor asked Travis once they stepped out of the rain and into a small lobby with blue carpet. The stairs were close by, but Travis shook his head. Let's take a look around on our own first, he answered. They pushed on through a door and progressed along a brightly lit hallway until they reached the warehouse, where forklifts were transporting pallets of cleaning materials into trucks. Travis waved down a foreman in gray work clothes carrying a clipboard. He had a mustache, safety goggles, and a name tag identifying him as Mark. His eyes widened when they saw him approach. Excuse me, Travis said, flashing his creds. Would you mind helping us out for a minute? We're trying to get a better understanding of how things work around here. Can you tell us a little bit about what you store and ship? Uh, sure, Mark said, jittery. It's various kinds of cleaning chemicals, mostly. We've got bleach and detergents on the far side over there, all different kinds of soap over here, wood and window cleaners in the back. Some other chemicals are stored in the basement and are transported by the big elevator. Travis nodded, looking around the large room where about a dozen workers were managing the supplies. I see. And do you store potassium chloride on the premises, particularly in the past week or two? Travis asked. Mark flipped through some of the pages on the clipboard. Yes, we do have a few cases containing 90 bottles each in the basement. It's not a popular item, but occasionally we get bulk orders from university laboratories and the like, so we keep it on hand. Travis exchanged glances with Wexler and Encore. Can you show us where those cases are stored? Is the big elevator the only way down? Travis asked. Nope, there's also the stairs. I can show you, but if I'm away from my post for more than a few minutes and Clausen finds out, she'll castrate me in a heartbeat. We'll be quick, Angkor said, gesturing for him to lead the way. Is she a real ball buster? Zero tolerance for lax performance, Mark said, with a weak smile. It might have been a relief for him to talk about it. The foreman took them back to the hallway and opened a door on the left that revealed stairs down to the basement. The floor and the walls were made of concrete, and the doors were steel, making the place seem almost like a dungeon. How would you describe security around here? Are these storage units all locked? Nora asked. It was a good question. If they'd known where to go, they could have made it to the basement without seeing anyone from the warehouse or the upstairs offices, but there were too many unlabeled steel doors to just try them at random. We've never had an incident like this before, so I don't know what to tell you. We're very focused on safety, and we lock up every night, but that's about it, he said, stopping at one of the doors and pushing it open without needing any kind of key. Travis put his hand on the foreman's shoulder to stop him from going in. Once he had his attention, Travis looked him square in the eyes. This is important. Have you heard anything from anyone about someone strange being in the building on the day of the murder? Mark looked nakedly afraid at being asked such a pointed question. It was almost enough to make Travis suspicious, but the more likely reason was just that the man had a nervous way about him. We've had plenty of time to talk about it, but no one said anything about someone strange being in the building, Mark said. He slid against the concrete wall to get some additional space. I've got to get back to my post. You'll find the cases right in there. The foreman turned tail and quickly shuffled away, leaving the agents to themselves in the basement. Wexler sighed. Walden knew an alarming amount about his victims. I thought all along that he's been watching them for a long time. It's not a stretch to think that he might have made it down here and gotten to these cases, she said to Travis. Let's take a look. They pushed the door the rest of the way open and stepped into a room somewhat larger than a walk-in closet. There were about a dozen stacks of cardboard boxes, all of them with labels on the top. Some stacks were taller than others, and when they found the five cases of potassium chloride that came to about waist high, the label noted they'd been received almost a month ago. Something about the tape on the third case down caught Travis's eye. He lifted the top two out of the way. The seal's been broken on this one, 
We'll need to get someone over to check the area for prints, Travis said, almost breathless when he realized what they'd stumbled upon. Do you think? Nora began, only to trail off. Travis used a card in his wallet to slide underneath the lid and slowly lift it up. Inside were white and black bottles of potassium chloride. None were missing. But one did have a puncture hole in the top that was a sure sign that the killer had procured his poison here. I'll let Johnson know. This might even be enough to distract him from the suspect in San Antonio, Ancor said, retreating to the hallway. It was a rush to catch a break in the case. Of course it helped that for once the killer wasn't able to perfectly cover his tracks, as he did when stealing the cat from Jenny Iverson's home. Nora had a broad smile on her face, but she didn't appear to be anywhere close to satisfied yet. Now the question is where the poison was administered, Nora said. And what happened to the needle? When Angkor returned, they decided it was time to pay Erin Clausen a visit to see if she could shed any more light on the line of events that led to her assistant's death. Travis had a few questions he was dying to ask her, and he led the way up the steps to the upper offices. All of the police equipment had been cleared away, but there was still a somber feeling pervading the floor that kept voices in subdued tones. Lantham's desk had been completely removed, which was something of a surprise. Did Clausen decide she no longer needed an assistant at all? They found Spick and Span CEO camped out behind her desk in the far corner of her office. She was on the phone but smiled brightly and waved to the agents as they came in. I'm going to have to call you back, Clausen said, setting down her phone and getting up to meet them. She had on a pinstripe pantsuit and her straight black hair had been styled. If Travis wasn't mistaken, she'd even purchased new glasses with a little more flair. Maybe she had a new lease on life after the incident. I love that suit, Wexler said, feeling the fabric. I want to thank you all for the incredibly hard work you're doing. Having Angkor and the officers from the SPD around make me feel so much safer. Now all we need to do is lock away the guy who did this to Card, and we can move on with our lives, she said. She was remarkably cheerful, not at all prickly as she had been the first few times they'd met her. You don't mind if we ask you a few more questions, do you? Travis asked. Clausen glanced back at the papers and phone on her desk. Not at all. I'm not sure what else there is to tell you. Clausen returned to the chair behind her desk, and the three agents took seats on the other side. Miss Clausen? You can call me Aaron. Aaron? What we'd like is a little more detail about how exactly you found Lantham and what was going on before and after, Travis said, keeping a careful eye on her. She pursed her lips and glanced up and to the right. Things started off normally enough. Around noon, Card told me he was going to grab lunch and invited me to join him, as he usually does. But between being buried in invoices and having an unsettled stomach anyway, I decided that it wasn't going to work. I'm not sure what was disagreeing with me, but I was having some major gastrointestinal issues that day. I'm not even sure when Card got back, because I was in my bathroom there with the vent on full blast, she said, pointing behind them. Travis took a look over his shoulder at the door to a small personal bathroom, which was ajar. It had no windows, so building codes must have required it to have a vent. By the time I was finished, I came out, worked for a few minutes, and then called for Card to find a phone number for me. When he didn't answer, I went out to his room and found him face down in his food. I think I screamed and got some people's attention, and the first thing we did was call the police. Because of how I'd been feeling, it made me wonder if I'd been poisoned too, but it turned out to be a normal stomach bug, she explained. Travis nodded, pondering how much to tip his hand. He seemed to recall her crossing her arms over her stomach after meeting with her. The biggest question in his mind had been what she was doing during the few minutes between Lantham's injection and his death. I'm going to quickly take a peek at the bathroom, if you don't mind, he said, getting up and walking to the door at the back of the room. Other than the toilet and small sink, there wasn't much to see. A pair of switches against the left side caught his eye. He flipped one to make the light come on. When he flipped the other, the vent rattled to life. It was obnoxiously loud, like a lawnmower running over tin cans. He flipped it off and returned to his seat, certain that anyone in there with a the door closed and vent on 
couldn't have heard it if there'd been an AK-47 going off right outside. We've come to the conclusion that Lantham's food had not, in fact, been poisoned. Instead, there's a strong possibility that he'd been injected with poison found right on the premises, and he was most likely attacked somewhere in this building, possibly even at his desk, Travis said. Any sense of cheerfulness on Clausen's face was immediately replaced with shock. Wait, are you kidding me? How could that even be possible? she asked. Can you tell me if you're aware if any of the chemicals in this building could be used as poison? he asked her. Everything in this building is poisonous, she said, her face getting flushed. Are you telling me that the person trying to kill me was probably only a few feet away and I didn't even know it? Miss Clausen, please, Travis said, sure the first names were no longer appropriate. You mentioned seeing someone who resembled Christopher Walden hanging around the building. Is there any way for you to know if he came inside, particularly on the day of the murder? Clausen leaned back in her chair and rolled her head around. She groaned. The only surveillance camera we have covers the large warehouse door in the back. I'm not in the habit of spying on my employees, and it's not like we have a lot of walk-in traffic or cash in a register. It's never been an issue, she said, shrugging. But I guess I'll have to get something now. Travis glanced over at Wexler and Encore, who leaned forward and cleared his throat. We're going to have a forensics team come back through, looking for prints or any other residual evidence from an entry. They'll be looking around in the basement as well, where the killer broke into a case of potassium chloride that was used in the murder. Can you tell me if you keep any hypodermic needles anywhere in this facility? Angkor asked. No, that's not something we carry, Clausen said. She looked pained. I have a question, too, Wexler said. What exactly happened to Lantham's desk and personal effects? Travis was curious as well and kept a close eye on Clausen as she glanced toward the hallway. I donated the desk to a used furniture shop just to get it out of here. Knowing that someone died at it just gave me the creeps. And I couldn't live with myself putting someone else there. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. As for his things, they were given to a sister he has in town, Isabella Lantham, she explained. And what are your plans for the personal assistant position? Travis asked. The woeful look Clausen displayed made him feel bad for asking. I'm sorry, but as you know, Card wasn't just an assistant to me. It's going to take some time for me to adjust and find the right person for the job. I'm not exactly in a rush to hire someone else, not when the killer managed to roam free around here, she said. Ankor opened his mouth but was cut off when Clausen went on. I think this information is going to take some time to absorb, and obviously I've got some calls to make about the security system here. Looks like I'm not nearly as safe as I thought. If you don't mind, I'd really appreciate it if you could close this case so Jenny, Lila, and I can stop wondering if every guy we see is going to pull a needle on us. The chilly look they got from her was much more akin to what Travis was used to. It seemed any unpleasant news was enough to scrape away her kinder side, and he didn't mind moving on now that they'd gotten her version of what had been going on during the murder. The goodbyes were courteous at best leaving Travis with a tense feeling in his chest that didn't dissipate, even when they were out in the hall. What do you think? Wexler asked as they reached the stairs and started down. Once Walden gets charged, I can't say I'll miss coming around here, Travis said. The three agents hung around in the vacant front lobby until the forensics team arrived and took Angkor back down to the basement. It was getting late in the day, the rainy sky turning from merely dreary to outright ominous. Travis's thoughts happened to wander toward the situation with Walden when the ringer of a phone suddenly went off. Surprisingly, it wasn't his. Oh, it looks like I'm getting a call, she said, rubbing it in while she pulled out her phone. It's Agent Johnson. She answered the call and put the receiver to her ear, only to jerk it away quickly at the shouting voice coming through. Any smugness on Wexler's face gave way to panic, while only bits of the message were coherent amidst the jumble of anger. Travis made out a few key phrases like, major problem, completely misguided, and get back here now. We'll be right over, Wexler stammered, looking white as a sheet. 
Although most of Johnson's message was garbled, the subtext he conveyed to her was beyond question. It's your fault. She spent a moment looking at Travis with her mouth hanging open. It seemed she'd never say anything again, but it turned out there was something on the tip of her tongue. I've changed my mind. From now on, you can get all of the revelatory phone calls. Chapter 13 Office of the Special Agent in Charge, 1110 Third Avenue Being chewed out on the phone at full volume wasn't something Nora was used to. But worse than that was enduring the entire ride back without knowing what had gone wrong. She had a few guesses, but without knowing exactly what it was, there wasn't any way for her to prepare to face the music. Instead, all she had was a feeling like everything was crashing down all around her. Greer was too good to betray any sense of dread, if he had any. His calmness was a source of comfort, but it created its own itch as well. Somehow, she was the one in the line of fire, not him. What mistake had she made? Together, they were directed right up to Agent Johnson's corner office on one of the uppermost floors. Unlike down below, the partitions were glass and the windows had blinds up, allowing a spectacular view of Seattle from almost every direction. Being up here made it impossible not to feel the responsibility of overseeing everything. A secretary waved them in, and Wexler received a first glance from Johnson's dark brown eyes. He didn't seem as angry as he did on the phone, more like simmering on the edge of a boil. After gesturing for them to take seats across from his desk, he leaned forward and put his large arms on the surface. Thanks for coming right over, he said, which was more beating around the bush than Norma could stand. What's going on with Walden? she asked. I don't know. What? Where is he? I don't know that either. The nonchalant obliviousness he had concerning their one and only suspect was bewildering to Nora. The crashing feeling she had in her mind was incessant. What do you mean? she asked. I mean that he's already been released and is out in the world doing whatever he likes, as any free man would. It didn't take more than a couple of hours to clear Christopher Walden of any wrongdoing or any involvement in the crimes we're investigating. No, that's impossible, Nora said. Her heart threatened to beat out of her chest. She knew it was him. It had to be. Not only possible, it's certain, Johnson went on. He hasn't returned to Seattle since he left six months ago. People were lining up around the block to say that they'd been with him in the past week. And to top it all off, he said he had no idea who Jenny Iverson was and had never gone on a date with her or even communicated with her. But that's not true. We have the messages. She said... But what about the surveillance recording we have of him at the post office? Nora asked. She tried to calm down, but it felt like she was drowning. At the time of the sending, Walden was signed into a Magic the Gathering card game tournament, where dozens of other players are able to corroborate his presence. There's no way he traveled to and from Seattle even once, shipped the package, or had any knowledge of how to create explosives, Johnson said. His tone made it clear what he said was definitive, but Nora couldn't help herself but to press. But what if he left in the middle of the car tournament and came back? No, Johnson said, flashing some of the anger she'd heard on the phone. This is a major screw-up that we should have all seen coming. I said it was a stretch, but I trusted your judgment on it, and I'm not sure I can put myself in a position to make that mistake again. He was about to go on when Greer coughed to get their attention and put his hand out. Can we just slow down a minute and talk about what this means? You said Walden has no knowledge of Jenny Iverson, but what about Aaron Clausen or Lila Robix? Johnson gave Nora one more cursory look before allowing himself to be distracted by Greer's questions. The Match.com account does belong to Christopher Walden, who used it in order to arrange dates with the two other women but he said he'd forgotten he still had an account running on the site over the last year. Not one to pay close attention to his bank statements, apparently. Nora's eyes widened as she started to see that something really bizarre was going on. 
Greer continued to press the lead, giving her more time to catch her breath. She was going to have to let go of the entire theory she'd been developing. So what we have is a man who looks a lot like Walden, sending Iverson's cat to her through the mail. There are messages sent from Walden's Match.com account to Iverson, most likely from the same impersonator who assumed Walden's identity and took her out on a date. Then there are the threatening anonymous emails from B.F. Sneezer, which could have been written by the same person, Greer explained. Yes, Nora agreed. Now it all made sense. There was a reason Jenny Iverson said Walden had a birthmark between his ear and jaw, while the others didn't. They were talking about two different people. She should have been able to pick up on it from the dating website messages, but hadn't had enough time, and the impersonator hadn't needed to stretch to assume a similarly educated rhetorical style. She'd been rushing, and it had made her sloppy. That seems like a better explanation than what we were going on before, but it still puts us back at square one for identifying a suspect. I'll run it by the NCIC to see if they can help us ID a guy similar to Walden with the facial recognition software. Greer, if you can check in with the SPD databases to see if they have anything. We might be able to fish this guy out if he's still pursuing his victims. What I'm wondering is how drastically the impersonator had to alter his appearance to pass for Walden, Johnson said, leaning back. When Johnson returned his attention to Nora, she knew it wasn't a mistake that he hadn't assigned her a new task. He seemed to hesitate for a moment before leveling with her. She could feel her heart tensing up as he began to speak. Agent Wexler, at this point, I think the best thing for you is to take a flight back to Albany tomorrow morning. There's no other way to say it. You got too invested in the case, and it clouded your judgment, made you believe in things that simply weren't there. We can't afford any more issues like that from here on out, Johnson explained. It was crushing. Sir, excuse me, but we wouldn't know about the hacking and the disguise if it weren't for Wexler. Those aren't inconsequential developments, and the experience... Greer stopped abruptly when Johnson raised his hand. He was a hero for saying as much as he did in her defense, but Johnson shook it off like a slight chill. I've made my decision here. We're not dealing with some run-of-the-mill whack job, and the only people I want on this case are the best of the best. Wexler, I appreciate the work you've put into this, and I know you'll get to that level some day. But you need to refine your skills back home. Arrangements for your flight have already been made. Give my best to Boffman. But that's not fair, she said. If you wanted fair, you should have known better than to get involved with law enforcement. Nora shivered, knowing there was nothing she could say to change his mind. If she even opened her mouth, she had no idea what would escape through the ball in her throat. He gave her the kind of sympathetic smile usually reserved for terminal hospital patients as she got up and went for the door. She'd known enough about the FBI to know that arguing or making a scene with a superior officer wasn't going to do her any favors. Take the orders. Carry out the investigation. Get the suspect. She stepped out of the office, oblivious to what was going on around her. Never looking back, she took the stairs a few floors down before stopping to recover against a black railing. It hurt, but she would be okay in the end. The stairwell, a mass of beige walls and white steps with rubber edges, seemed like a cocoon that no one ever ventured into. But the sound of footsteps above got her attention. Greer came around from the flight above. She noticed the suit stretching over his chest was still a little damp from the rain. His handsome brown eyes had something genuine in them that she wished she could get lost in. Hey, are you all right? he asked. The gentle hand he put on her shoulder was almost too much to bear. Of course I'm all right. What could possibly be wrong? I get to go back with my tail between my legs so Boffman can say he told me I wasn't cut out for this. He'll make me the FBI equivalent of traffic cop for the rest of my life. I'll be pushing paper behind a desk, buried so far underground I'll never see a case this interesting again. It won't be that bad, Greer said. Now his hand was against the center of her back. She turned to face him, holding back the tears. Letting him see her cry wasn't something she would allow. You might think it wouldn't, but you'd be wrong, she said. 
That's the difference between you and me. If you make a mistake, you're just having a bad day. If I make a mistake, suddenly there's something wrong with my judgment, and I can't be trusted to make rational decisions. That's part of the reason why women only make up 20% of FBI agents. I always knew it would be difficult to get in and get some respect for myself, but I didn't think I'd blow it this early. The worst part of it is that there's some truth to what Johnson was saying. I was too committed to putting it all on Walden, and as a result, we took the wrong man into custody. I was one click away from looking at messages from Walden to Clausen and Robix that could have told me I was dealing with two different people, but I didn't do it. You had just gotten out of the hospital. You've got to cut yourself some slack, even if nobody else will, he said. Nora took a deep breath in the hopes it would calm her down, but instead it swirled together an entirely different set of tense emotions. She suddenly wondered why he was there standing next to her and what it meant. What difference does it make to you? she asked. It's not like we're really partners, just two agents assigned to the same case. You'll get someone else working by your side on this, Anchor or whomever, and then when you're back in Albany, maybe I'll see you in the halls every once in a while. We'll say hi to each other, and that'll be it until the years roll by and one of us gets transferred or leaves. Now Greer seemed on the spot, and the way he was looking at her made her wonder what he was thinking. His hand, once on her back, was now stuffed in his pocket. He leaned against the railing and glanced around as if searching for help. That's not how I want things to be. You're not like the rest of the people around here, and you've got different ideas about things that make me stop and question a lot of the stuff I take for granted. At the very least, we should be friends, he said. It was a curious choice of words. And what should we be at the most, she asked. But after an agonizing moment, it was clear he wasn't going to be able to say how he really felt. I'm not sure we could even call each other friends. You hardly know anything about me. That's not true, he said. It surprised her how quickly and forcefully he reacted. I know you're the kind of person who cares deeply about what you do. Even though you laugh a little, you don't hold it against me when I don't know what a hashtag or a meme is. That's your thing. But you felt right at home with my Neanderthal family that still has a rotary phone because my father doesn't trust those newfangled contraptions. You're the kind of person who could have had an easy life floating around from party to party, but you chose something hard because you wanted to make a difference. Do I have that right? Nora couldn't hide from it anymore. She liked the way she looked in his eyes. Yeah, you do, she said. But there's something else, too. I thought I was ready to see a dead body up close like that. But it's like I have Ricardo Lantham's placid face burned into my memory. I didn't want to bring it up because it wouldn't seem like I was a professional, but it really bothered me. Does that get any easier? Travis swallowed and stepped away from the railing. Between Iraq and the FBI, I've seen more dead bodies than a person ever should. Even when it's not particularly grisly, I still feel the loss of life every single time. It's a hard thing to detach yourself from and get used to. I wouldn't say it gets easier, but you find ways to tolerate it, if that makes any sense. It can be worth it if it helps you appreciate life more and propel you to protect those whose lives are threatened. That's why I wanted to help the women in the Founders Club. I do feel this incredible sense of responsibility for them, even when Clausen isn't being all warm and cuddly. That's going to be a hard thing to let go of. I hope you guys pin down a suspect before it's too late, she said, turning to leave. Nora, he said, after she had descended a few steps and was about to turn onto the next flight. She glanced back at him with a tired look that she hoped would convey that there was nothing more that could possibly be said about the situation. It was time for her to go home. Chapter 14, 18 South Holden Street during the cab ride back to the Rainier Inn, Nora closed her eyes and tried to put it all behind her. Everything had happened so fast. One moment she was inches away from closing the case, and the next she was being sent away because she hadn't managed to win with her very first shot. 
Getting out of the cab, she cast a long look at the quaint cottage where she'd stayed every night she was here, except for the one she'd spent with the Greers. The owner, Lucinda Montague, said she was a retired marine biologist, but it was debatable whether she had ever done anything more professional in the field than comb beaches and paddle around the sound. Now she ran a B&B, &B, renting out every room in her home. When Nora had first arrived at the inn and told Lucinda she was with the FBI, the elderly woman with the giant hearing aid said it was about time someone did something about those mangy kids and their skateboards. Now she was in a rocking chair on the porch, watching the rain drizzle down with a fishbowl in her lap. Beautiful day, isn't it? Nora asked. It is if you're a fish, Lucinda said. Nora sighed and came to a halt on the porch. She ran her hand through her hair, trying to shake some of the heat-sapping moisture out of it. Looks like I'll be checking out tomorrow morning, she said. Lucinda looked over and nodded. That's a shame. Someone's got to teach these kids a lesson. All they're doing is necking and smoking up. They need more fiber. Nora agreed absently, wondering if Lucinda had meant to say moral fiber, or if a strong dose of breakfast cereal would resolve the epidemic of wayward youth that haunted her. Moving on to her first-floor room, she closed the door and sat on the bed in the dark, looking at everything she had around her through the streetlight reflecting through a window. Other than a few notebooks, a bag of clothes, and the normal bathroom supplies, she'd been shipped over in such a rush that this was all she had. She flopped back on the bed and pulled out her phone. No messages and no texts. She flipped to her email. She'd been so busy that she hadn't checked it all day. A few new ones appeared in her inbox, including a newsletter from her father's campaign that she deleted without reading, and a message from a friend at Berkeley sharing a link to an article about human rights abuses in Russia that she might try to read on the flight if she was bored. Another email appeared right as she was about to put the phone away. Staring at the name, she unconsciously sat up in bed and looked to make sure the door was shut tight. The message was from B.F. Sneezer, and the subject read, Sleep Tight. Nora reached for her Glock 22 and pointed it at the door, torn between trying to leave and reading the message. Tapping the screen to open it, she quickly scanned the contents while holding her breath. I would have had an easy run of it if not for you. With no boy toy in the burly pickup truck to keep you company, I'm the only one left to send you off to sleep. When the pigs protect the criminals and prosecute the victims, what must follow is slaughter. Although there was nothing outright identifying her in the email, there was no mistake he knew who he was communicating with. Nora's personal email address was norwex at gmail.com, and to find that, he must have found her and known that she went by Nora Wex on Facebook and Twitter. The slight changes had been intended to make it harder for people to search for her, but from the message, it seemed he only needed to see her in Greer's truck to ID her. Somehow, he knew who she was and had been watching her. Getting up and putting her ear to the door, she could hear someone talking to Lucinda by the door on the front porch. The sound of the rain made it difficult to tell if it was simply another one of the guests, but before she could make a conclusive determination, the front door creaked open. They were coming her way and would be there in seconds. Nora struggled to stay calm. Her door was locked, and the only other way out was through the window. The impulse came over her to text Greer, but if the suspect knew his vehicle, there was a chance he'd done something to it. Instead, she wrote three words to Johnson. Help! Rainier Inn! The voices in the hall continued, with Lucinda asking the stranger how well he knew Nora, who was already at the window, trying to budge it open despite old paint sealing it shut. I have better access to her than her best friend, a seemingly normal male voice said. But the comment was so strange, it almost distracted her from trying to run her fingernail through the gap between the window sill and the window. A knock came at the door before the doorknob jiggled. Thank goodness the lights had stayed off, or he would have known she was in there. Nora had no idea what the man would do to Lucinda, but if he was smart enough to ID and track down an FBI agent, he had to be smart enough to come armed. Rather than risk the life of the old woman, she kept digging at the thin paint around the window, 
It was chipping away, any crackling sounds blending in perfectly with the clattering rain. But popping the window open wouldn't be the same story, and Nora dreaded what he would do if he knew she was getting away. Oh, all right then. I have the key right here, Lucinda said. She seemed oblivious to the danger she was in, but as the key touched the lock, Nora knew they were out of time. Hoping the sill was clear enough, she slammed both palms against the window's center frame and jerked it open. The screen behind it was hanging half off anyway, and barely got in her way as she dove through the opening and landed hard on her shoulder. She had an instant to decide whether going to the front or the back of the house would give her a chance to turn the tables on him. Nearly shaking, she gripped the handle of her gun so tightly she imagined it would crack. The momentum of her fall and struggles to get up positioned her closer to the front door, which she figured would be better anyway since she knew the front door was open. She ran around to the front and ducked down beside the porch to try to peek through the window and get an idea of their position. The possibility also existed that he would follow her out through the window to come up behind her. Nora went closer to the front steps and took them up while staying behind a solid section of the house's exterior. Peeking through a window to the side, she couldn't see where they'd gone. When she turned around, the door opened in front of her, and she found herself pointing the barrel of her gun at Lucinda, who barely seemed to notice what she had in her hands because of the dim light. Your friend went to the bathroom, she said more loudly than Nora would have liked. Nora gently scooted Lucinda toward her chair behind a nice thick wall while holding the door open with her other hand. Although the other bedrooms in the house were rented, no one else seemed to be around at the moment. All of the lights were off, leaving only faint glimpses of living room recliners and a chest set on a coffee table. Going in alone was risky, especially with so many blind corners and crevices that her unwelcome visitor could be hiding out in. But the risk that she'd missed her opportunity to catch him was greater. The bathroom was at the end of the long hall past her room and close to the kitchen. She counted on him lying to Lucinda and maneuvered into the living room so she could come at it from the side rather than straight on. Back in Quantico at training, they taught her to keep her arms straight, both hands on the gun, and legs bent when moving. Her finger was on the trigger as she scanned dark shapes lurking in the shadows around the home. She heard breathing as she came around to the bathroom, but realized it was only her own. The bathroom and the kitchen were vacant, as was her bedroom. There was a possibility that he'd gone upstairs, but it was more likely that he'd used the side door by the back dining room to exit the inn. Once Nora breathed a sigh of relief and started to feel the tension fade, sounds of screeching tires echoed in her ear. She went out to the street moments before black vans arrived in front of the inn. Angkor was the first to climb out and perform a more thorough check of the house, but Nora was correct that the suspect had run for it, probably as soon as Nora had escaped her room. He wanted to tip her off when she was trapped and vulnerable, but an even game of hide-and-seek in the dark wasn't part of his plan. Other members of the convoy split up, some opting to drive around the area looking for suspicious vehicles, while others posed a few questions to poor Lucinda Montague, who had no idea what the fuss was about. Despite being right next to him, she wasn't able to tell them any more than they already knew. Chubby cheeks, bushy eyebrows, and brown hair. His height and even whether he had a birthmark by his ear were too much for her. To Nora's surprise, Johnson arrived in a green sedan. It would have been easy for him to simply forward the message to Angkor and wind down for bed, but he'd chosen to come himself to check out the situation. Standing together on the porch with the rain coming down beside them, Nora held out her phone to him so he could see the message she had received. Johnson nodded and wiped some of the moisture from his face. Once I make up my mind, I stick with it, he said. But because you're becoming a focal point for him, there's no way I can let you go. The bottom line is, we have to find out who's behind this Gmail account. I've gone through the normal channels in order to tell who owns the account or who's been using it, but there's just nothing solid to hold on to. It's all smoke and mirrors. He's very good at covering his tracks online, and unless there was some way to take his fingerprints as he's typing on the keyboard, we cannot make a connection between the person doing this and the online accounts, Nora said. 
She could see Johnson was getting anxious. We're going to find out who this is, because right now, this guy could be anywhere in the city plotting anything. Targeting an agent is like walking into the lion's den with a T-bone steak around your neck. It doesn't turn out well. I'll let Greer know about his truck, Nora said to subtle nods from Johnson. His last command was that she clear out of the Rainier Inn and find a couch at the division offices where there would be no question that she was safe. By the time she finally got to sleep, it was already the wee hours of the morning, leaving little time until the office would be buzzing with everyone starting their daily routine right around when the sun came up. When she awoke, it startled her to find Greer lounging in a chair about two feet away with a cup of apple juice and a banana wrapped in bacon. It must have been one of his mother's specialties. "'You should have called me,' he said. Nora's mind was groggy and on the verge of splitting apart. It felt like she hadn't slept at all. "'He knows your pickup truck,' she mumbled, sitting up. "'I don't care. You should have called me. I could have gotten there faster. Maybe caught him,' Greer went on. He was confident, no doubt about it, but it was clear he took it personally that she had been the target. Like Johnson, everybody at the FBI looked out for each other because they knew what they were all facing. Can't you let me get up and take a shower before you chew me out? I thought I got enough of that yesterday, she said, rubbing the sleep out of her eyes. Greer peeled off a slice of bacon and popped it in his mouth, ignoring the banana. It's almost nine o'clock, and you've already missed so much. Now that you're not going anywhere, you can at least help us out he said, getting Nora's attention. What did I miss? Walden was the link tying together Iverson, Clausen, and Robix. But now that we know he wasn't behind any of the crimes, we have to look at the possibility that we're dealing with two or three separate incidents. On the one hand, we've got the cat killer, who Aaron Clausen also said was hanging around her building and may have been involved in killing her assistant. But then we've also got Lori Robix and the car bomb, which we're ready to say is entirely unrelated to the other crimes, he explained. Nora nodded. This was the real fallout from her mistake about Walden. So much for the idea of a mastermind criminal orchestrating a complicated attack on the Founders Club, she said. But how do you know the car bomb is a separate incident? Greer was rubbing his hands together, grinning wildly. He had all of the enthusiasm of a fisherman who had just hooked a big one. Do you remember I mentioned that crazy car chase to Johnson, and he said that it ended at a police roadblock in Mount Vernon before the drivers could make it to Canada? A couple of 16-year-olds driving the stolen SUV were arrested and handed over to the DEA. Who knows what they were thinking, making a run to Canada. They never would have made it across the border, and even if they did, they'd be sent back in a heartbeat. But anyway, the DEA has been grilling them for a few days now, and you'll never guess who they ID'd. Who? Lori Robix. I'm heading over there now to ask them a few questions myself. Nora stared blankly for a moment. If they were wondering how Lori Robix got enough money for nonstop shopping and fancy cars, they now had a clear shot at an answer. But what had happened to make someone try to blow her up? Let me run and brush my hair, Nora said, reaching for her bag. But Greer was already up and moving for the door. Now meant now with him. Wait, hold on! She grabbed her brush, threw on her jacket, and rushed after him. Chapter 15 DEA Offices, Seattle Division, 305th Avenue The Seattle DEA was holed up in a tall building covered in glass windows with an abstract light blue statue out front that looked like someone had thrown a handful of matches at a couple of dominoes. Travis was the type to shake his head at such pointless frills, but as he pulled up out front in a borrowed orange Volkswagen bug, it seemed his focused mind was willing to overlook anything in order to get what he wanted. You look cute hunched behind the wheel of such a tiny car. I feel like I'm heading to the movies with my girlfriends back in college, Wexler said, smirking. Somehow she always knew how to press his buttons. This thing is practically a clown car, he said. The car in front of them nearly backed into the bug's fender, causing Travis to tap the horn that sounded exactly like a clown horn would. See? 
Travis tried to shake it off as he exited the embarrassingly girly vehicle, bumping his head on the way out. Thanks to B.F. Sneezer, his pickup truck was going through a serious inspection, and Johnson was no doubt having a laugh by sticking him with the bug. There were probably a dozen black FBI vans in a garage somewhere collecting dust. Even a golf cart would have been better. Do you think Lori Robex had something to do with the car chase? Did something go wrong that resulted in a retaliatory strike in the form of a car bomb? Wexler asked. Despite her needling about the car, Travis wasn't intentionally keeping her in the dark about the details. Other than that they'd ID'd her, her involvement is anybody's guess. And it might stay that way, depending on how generous the DEA is with their suspects in custody. Is getting access going to be a problem? Hard to say. We might count ourselves lucky that they bothered to give Johnson a call about it. Maybe they'll be helpful, maybe not. If we don't get anything here, we'll have to get it out of Robix herself. They climbed the steps and entered the building, which had a pair of circular water features running just inside. From Travis's experience, the DEA had always been notoriously touchy when it came to the FBI, as if the entire organization had a little brother complex that constantly needed to validate itself by thumbing its nose at everyone else. He walked through the metal detectors with his fists clenched so tight he was surprised an alarm didn't sound. A DEA agent was at the security desk on the other side, going over some papers. Greer saw a chance to bypass the normal bureaucratic hurdles involved with seeing another agency's suspects and jumped at it. Hey, look who it is, Travis announced loudly, donning a broad smile and patting the agent on the back. It's been a long time. How have you been? The agent had a crew cut and straight face that had military written all over him. Travis harbored no doubts that he could convince the man that they'd known each other at one point or another, and then leverage that into a meeting with the captives. Forever by my count, but I'm just getting your clearance tag straightened out, Agent Greer, and then we can go right up to meet the boys. I'm Lauren Amory, he said, shaking Travis's hand. And this is Agent Wexler. Great to meet you, Amory said, shaking her hand. He handed over tags to them and turned to lead them to the elevators. As soon as his back was turned to them, Wexler shook her crushed hand and displayed a silent look of anguish. In truth, Amory had given Travis's hand a squeeze that smarted too, but he could never admit it. He was more blindsided that they were being taken directly to the two young men who'd been leading the car chase without any kind of hand-wringing, arm-wrestling, or threats to run it up the chain of command. As they got into the elevator, Travis grasped the possible explanation. So how are you guys handling the new laws? he asked. Though Amory seemed a straight-laced military guy, Travis knew that didn't mean he was being hostile. Oh, it's had an impact, no doubt about it. Even though nothing's changed from a federal standpoint, we're still working to strike the right balance with state and local law enforcement, he said. Travis nodded, figuring that striking the right balance also meant playing along with the FBI and other departments. Since Washington passed its recent law legalizing marijuana for recreational use, signaling a change in public perception about the drug, there was no doubt the DEA had to adapt with it. If they could demonstrate that they were making real progress combating the distribution of more serious substances, it might restore some of the common faith in the department and remove any vestigial stigma its agents felt. What can you tell us about what we're dealing with here? Wexler asked Amory, who didn't show any signs of holding back. If our analysis is correct, these 16-year-olds are the foot soldiers of a prescription drug ring that sprouted up all over the city. We'd been noticing a jump in the number of teens we were finding hooked on Vicodin, Hydrocodone, Oxycontin, and others. It seemed like all at once there was an epidemic, but there weren't any thefts, the doctors were shrugging their shoulders, and the pharmacies were clean. All we had were high school locker busts and kids as young as 14 saying the pills were being handed out like candy at parties. The natural next step was to scout one of these parties, but they all seemed to be organized spur of the moment where they take over somebody's house and all of a sudden the place is packed with painkillers and you have a couple of kids overdosing on the lawn. One moment nobody knows about the party and then the next everybody knows and it's already in progress making tracing the point of origin almost impossible. Travis cast a look over at Wexler, who seemed deep in thought. 
they got out of the elevator and continued down a hallway to the viewing end of an interrogation room with one-way glass giving them a glimpse of a pair of young men in hoodies and jeans one was nervously tapping his fingers against the table while the other was nodding off what can you tell us about them travis asked amory put his hand on the glass and brought his face close to the surface to peer at them we've got clark duggan on the left and ned barnes on the right they're juniors at garfield high school he said that's the same one lori robix goes to wexler noted and they're the only ones we've been able to pin down who are actually involved in the drug runs they know what kind of hot water they're in but the amount they know is disturbingly limited it's almost like a terrorist network duggan gets an anonymous text message with only an address that tells him where to find an unlocked car with keys in the ignition inside the car is a trunk full of prescription painkillers one hundred dollars for him to take and a written note about where to move the car to amory explained what do you know about the text messages wexler asked or the cars travis added amory scratched his neck and sighed deeply he glanced over at some papers on a table nearby possibly a transcript of all the interviews done so far they're using a texting app called talkatron to send all of the messages it's made by an eastern european developer i believe from belarus and it's just like this black hole of information that you can't get anything out of but somehow it's become an overnight sensation among the high school set that everyone's using have you ever heard of it talkatron i'd heard it mentioned once or twice but never had the time or a reason to actually take a look at it i am familiar with these kinds of apps though download for free and you can start sending texts in less than thirty seconds no information required wexler said the cars are something we're all a little more familiar with like the one used in the chase it was stolen but not by the boys who were driving it not a local vehicle either not by a long shot someone had stolen this one and driven it in from idaho it seems like at least once a week there's a stolen car from who knows where that shows up parked on the street somewhere full of painkillers travis nodded in full understanding if they could only find more of these cars there was a good chance they'd eventually be able to figure out who the thieves were even if they were careful with gloves to prevent any fingerprints a long drive like that would leave hairs on the seat that could provide a dna match so you're welcome to take a run at them and see if they know anything that can help you out amory went on reaching over to pop open a door leading into the room with the two young men we'd better make the most of this travis whispered to wexler as they went in realistically this might be their only shot to try to piece together what was going on between lori robix and the painkillers before johnson shunted them from the case and put somebody else on it travis wanted to be handling everything himself but taking the lead on a killer identity thief and a multi-state drug ring was more than he could hope for after this they'd probably be getting information secondhand and at best serve as backup the two boys looked them over as they stepped into the room clark duggan was a skinny guy with an awkwardly long neck who was chewing his lip travis's first thought was that he might have taken to peddling drugs as a way to get some attention from the girls the other one ned barnes had what appeared to be an eye infection and seemed to really be from the bottom rung the only motion he made was to absently open his mouth and run his tongue over his top set of dirty teeth travis knew real poverty existed in the hills but ned's grungy appearance seemed driven entirely by apathy i'm agent greer and this is agent wexler we're here to ask you a few questions and we expect some honest answers can you handle that he asked as they presented their creds and took seats in the stiff chairs across from them sure clark said immediately his eyes were a little red from strain not infection from the tone of his voice travis could tell he was desperate to improve his situation and would tell them anything he knew he was a young man with a future to lose ned on the other hand barely gave them his attention and made no motion to answer what can you tell us about lori robix clark set his elbows on the steel table and leaned forward she's a grade ahead of me in school and is on the dance team i think it's not like we're friends or have ever really spoken i don't know all that much about her he said 
Yet you mentioned her name to the agents here as someone who was involved in the scheme that sent you boys on an impromptu road trip toward Canada. Why? Wexler asked. Midway through her comments, Travis noticed that Ned was staring unashamedly at her chest. Clearing her throat did nothing to disturb him. One day I got this message out of the blue asking me by name if I wanted to make some extra money. It said it would be easy, but it had to be kept a secret. Nettie, stop it, he said, elbowing his friend, who did nothing to divert his attention from Wexler's torso. I had actually hit a fire hydrant while parking and owed the city some money, so I responded. Since then, I get a message with an address every once in a while. Anyway, the way I know Lori is involved is because I was behind her in lunch line a couple of weeks ago when she got a text that I happened to see. The only thing there was an address. It was different from any of the ones I had gotten up to that point, but it suggested she was in touch with the same people, Clark said. Travis nodded, thinking that finding a way to get a hold of Lori Robix's phone was the only way to find out for sure. But at least Clark was giving honest answers, which was far from a sure thing when dealing with people in the drug racket. Is she also doing what you did with the cars? Wexler asked. But Clark scrunched up his face like he'd bitten into a lemon. I'm not sure what she's doing, but my guess is it isn't the same thing. Do you have any idea who else might be involved, or what the other jobs assigned might be? Travis asked. Clark leaned back, looked over at a nearly unconscious Ned, and rubbed his arm. The best that I can figure is that someone steals the car and drops it somewhere in town. Someone else loads it with the pills. I drive it to another location where somebody else unloads the pills and takes them to the party location. Travis tried to puzzle out the answer, but there wasn't much to go on. There's something I'm not getting. So everybody hears about the party, they all show up, and there are tons of painkillers being illegally distributed there. Is there somebody at the door charging for entry? Do the partiers pay by the pill? How does the money work? This question seemed to get a smirk out of Ned, but he made no motion to answer. To be honest, I'm really not sure. No money changes hands at the party, where everything is just freely given out. But I've never had to pay anything because I had a job with them, Clark said. Wexler reached out and touched Travis's arm. She'd figured something out, but wasn't going to say it in front of the two suspects. And what about the car bomb explosion? How likely do you think it is that those running the drug ring are responsible for it? Travis asked. Clark shrugged inside of his roomy hoodie. I don't see how it couldn't be. These guys are secretive, but I just have this sense in my gut that I'd never want to mess around with them or something really bad would happen. Moving cars and drugs like this, there's no telling what kind of people they have doing this and what they would do. Now that Clark had eclipsed what he actually knew and was venturing into speculation, Travis got the feeling they'd learned everything they would from him. They got up to leave, but before they made it to the door, Travis looked back at the boys. Clark looked repentant for everything he'd done, but Ned had a broad smile on his face that fully displayed his teeth. Don't drown in the rain, he said. Travis shook his head before leaving the interrogation room and rejoining Amory on the other side. After a brief chat about the conversation they'd had with the pair in custody, Travis and Wexler took the elevator down and headed for the exit. We need to pay Lori Robix a visit before Johnson assigns someone else to her or the DEA take over the whole thing. Maybe she'll let us take a look at her phone, he said, as Wexler pulled out hers. I've got a hunch about how the drug ring might work and how Lori was able to afford the car and all of those clothes. What if they're using an SMS payment system where teens pay up front using their phones and afterward receive another message with the address for the party location? she asked, raising an eyebrow and grinning. It was a provocative idea. So you think all of the payments are passing through Lori? Does that mean she's in knee-deep with them, or they're using her to launder their money? Looks like we'll need to get on her bank accounts. I'm not sure, but considering they were trying to blow her up, she doesn't seem to be in with them anymore. Wait a second, she said, when Travis reached for the door handle. There was something serious in the tone of her voice that made him stop. What is it? Wexler was staring at her phone. 
I just got an email from one of the guys in the tech lab with the IP address for BF Sneezer. It's got some attached reports about the tracing and maps pointing to a spot along Spur 10 Gate Road near the Snoqualmie River. Travis was taken aback. He was vaguely familiar with that area out to the east in the mountains because of his hunting, and the only buildings he could recall were isolated hermit cabins. We'd better tell Johnson and get some help before going in. I'm surprised they could even get Internet access out there. It must be dial-up, he said. Dial-up Internet, Wexler howled. This is getting crazy. Chapter 16 7 Spur 10 Gate Road, North Bend, Washington After spending an hour in the FBI's surveillance room scouting out the location, which was a small cabin tucked so far into the woods that the other roads had numbers instead of names, Johnson directed them to move forward with a plan to enter and search the property. Because of the real possibility that they'd encounter an armed suspect, they suited up in Kevlar bulletproof vests and chartered a course to reach the locale from opposite directions. Nora and Greer were in a van heading west, while Angkor and another agent were looping around and coming east. Nora remembered seeing herself in the mirror all decked out in body armor. It was almost impossible for her to recognize herself or believe that this was really what she was doing. The same couldn't be said for Greer, who looked like a raging engine of testosterone with a massive upper body on sturdy legs and couldn't have been more comfortable. He was so hot, Nora had to remind herself to breathe. Johnson had been more than pleased with the break in the case and was certainly ready to nail down this impersonator and bring him in. Nora felt much the same way, and as they crept along the bumpy dirt road, she kept her eyes on the single power line strung up along the side. That wire was what carried so much malice and torment out to the world, and it felt good for Nora to follow it back to the source where it could be eliminated. We're getting close, Greer said at the wheel. They had a GPS mounted on the dash that had a red dot creeping toward the center. The rain was still coming down, and with any luck it would provide enough cover to catch him unaware. What if somebody comes driving toward us? Nora asked. Out here, anybody we see gets stopped. No one is going to get by us. Nora could feel a bundle of nerves forming in her chest. She took deep breaths, trying to keep herself calm and steady. Another fifteen minutes of bumpy driving passed. There, do you see it? Greer asked. Through the rain and haze, Nora could make out a brown structure with a silver tin roof among the trees by the side of the road. The first thing they'd done when they had the address was to look up the owner, a man named Raymond Jones, who they learned was 75 years old and didn't look at all like their suspect when they pulled his driver's license photo. There was no connection between Jones and Walden, leaving them all scratching their heads how this old man was tied into this. Other than an ancient, rusted-out Chevy by the side of the cabin, there were no vehicles in sight around the residence. Greer killed the lights on the van and slowly crept along the last stretch of road before pulling into a narrow driveway. They could see Angkor's van parked by the side of the road about 100 yards away. The other agents were making the final trek through the woods to meet them. Greer killed the engine once they'd reached the small clearing past the driveway. Nora took a long look at the building, which seemed completely dark inside. Either the suspect was hiding out, or they were about to walk into a vacant cabin. Angkor flashed a light from the other side of the clearing to signal that they were in position. Let's find out what we've got here, Greer said, popping open the door. Nora followed suit, with her glock drawn and her eyes on the windows for any sign of movement. Sheets of pink insulation had been left out by a flimsy door with a gold-colored knob. Before heading right to the door, the two of them peeked around at the windows. As best they could tell, there wasn't anyone there. Nora silently chided herself. It had been just a couple of hours since they'd learned of the IP address. Why wasn't the suspect still here? After looking over the door, Greer tried the handle and picked at the rotting wood around the door frame. The place was badly in need of repairs, and it didn't help when he slammed his shoulder into the door, knocking it open. 
Nora went in behind him, and Angkor was right on her heels. The entire cabin consisted of only three rooms, which contained no person, but plenty of other curious materials. What's with all of these papers? Greer asked, sounding repulsed. Stacks of papers and mail covered nearly every surface in the cabin's main room. Scanning the area with a flashlight, Nora peeked at a stack on the couch cushions that appeared to be printed coupons and pages of advertisements torn out of old magazines. Another had bills and receipts referencing Jones's name and accounts. Brown boxes covered in Amazon Prime tape were lined neatly along the floor. There were ancient complimentary CDs for everything from AOL Internet service to tax preparation software, piled against a big computer monitor occupying a table on one side of the room. Joan seemed to be something of a hoarder, keeping junk from the mail around for decades, but the cabin's new occupant had added some personal touches. Forget the papers. Look at this, Greer noted with more alarm as he directed the flashlight to the walls. Christopher Walden right here. Nora came over right away to see that pictures of people had been taped up one next to the other along the walls, forming a ring around almost the entire room. Walden's picture was the same one they'd seen on Match.com. Farther down the line, they found a picture of Raymond Jones. Below all the pictures were printed sheets of various bits of personal information. Names, multiple passwords, bank account numbers, social security numbers, phone numbers, addresses, credit card numbers, pins, dates of birth, and more. Not all of the printouts had all of the same information. It just seemed to be whatever the imposter had been able to get his hands on. Here's Jenny Iverson, Nora said, looking over the details he had for her beneath an attractive candid shot that seemed printed from a camera, not gleaned from the Internet. He has her address and contact information, including an email account, but no passwords or pins of any kind. He seems to have chosen not to break into any of her accounts. Strange. Makes sense to me, Greer said, stepping behind Nora to look over her shoulder. If I had to guess, I'd say that because she's the target, he has a special conceptualization of her with a goal in mind that won't be satisfied by breaking into her accounts. He wanted to possess her, but sending threatening messages or deducing her passwords wasn't going to be enough. This psychological torture is an attempt to break into her mind and get control of her from within before taking her life. It was a smart comment, and Nora looked back at him and smiled, impressed. You know what I think? These pictures on the wall compose the collection he was talking about in the note mailed with the cat. We thought he simply had a collection of bodies, and maybe he does, but it's more complex than that. What he has is a collection of lives, made up of the tools we use to communicate and cohabitate in society. He can use the tools to embody his victims, string them along like puppets until he kills them. Although they found info for Iverson, there was nothing for Clausen or Robix. Continuing around the room, Nora noted one blank space on the end of the wall, where papers for another person had been torn down. Only a corner of the picture, a bit of blue paper, remained because of a piece of tape. She looked at the edge and wondered who had been here. In the kitchen, they found boxes of ketchup packets, Oreos, canned mackerel from the 60s, and a fair amount of other expired food in the cabinets. In the corner, by a dirty sink, was a bag of cat food about a quarter empty. The garbage was overflowing with plastic and paper containers of various snacks and Chinese food, but after a brief inspection, it didn't seem like any of it came from Asian delights. The last man in their foursome, an agent by the name of Gary Houghton, finally joined them inside the cabin. He was tall, lanky, and soaked from the rain. I canvassed the yard and found Raymond Jones's body partially buried in the back. If I had to guess, I'd say he's been there for a while at least through the winter. Nora stood silently for a moment as she contemplated the latest uncovered body and the situation they were looking at. What we've got to do is differentiate Jones's tendencies from our imposters. Clearly, Jones would qualify as a recluse, and at some point, 
the Walden look-alike stumbled upon him and not only assumed his identity, but killed him and took over his life. Some of these shipped boxes have recent dates and came under a dozen different names. He's been mooching off of different accounts and using free trial offers to get by. And if I had to guess, this situation has been his life for around six months. That means it started right around the time that he went out on that date with Jenny Iverson. Greer shook his head. Even in the dim light, Nora could see him scowling. This is a pretty pathetic existence, even taking into account that he was essentially able to assume another person's identity and get away with it for so long. Is the date with Iverson what drove him to kill an old man and squat in his cabin? Why decide to go after her six months later? They were good questions. Nora shined her light onto the shiny new computer, including a tower, flat-screen monitor, keyboard, wireless mouse, and printer. The computer setup was the most out-of-place thing they'd seen in the cabin. I know it's tempting, Greer said, but don't set one finger on it. That's our best chance to score his prints. If we can match those and put a name to his face, it'll only be a matter of time until we bring him in. I can wait, Nora agreed. As far as what the connection is between Iverson and this place for the suspect, I can only guess at this point. If he broke into Walden's account to reach her as he was breaking in here to live, there may have been something about her that got stuck in his memory that took six months to burst. I'll have to see if he told her anything about his living arrangements or what his life was like. Angkor continued to poke around the house and finally stopped near a fireplace across from the computer near the entrance. It had been all soot and coals when they'd come in, but Angkor used a poker to reveal that some embers were still burning. He reached down and motioned his hand over them. There's still some warmth. This fire might have been roaring even a couple of hours ago, he said. Is that how long ago you think he was here? Greer asked, taking another look at the kitchen where there was a tea kettle on the stove. Sometime today at least. Today's mail is right on top of the stack by the dresser and there's no way that got delivered all the way out here before noon. Something must have tipped him off, Nora suggested. It felt like she'd swallowed an ice cube when she began to realize how he had known they were coming. It was something he'd said to Lucinda Montague right outside of her door at the inn. It's possible he ran out for something and will be back, Greer said, disrupting her thoughts. Hold on a second. No. He'll never be back, she said, pulling out her phone and opening up her email. By going to desktop view and scrolling to the bottom, she tapped a link allowing her to see where the account was accessed from. Even before it appeared, she was kicking herself for being one step too slow. The man who had come after her at the inn had told Lucinda he had better access to her than her best friend. When the report loaded... Her eyes went immediately to one entry that was all wrong. The browser, the IP address, the location pointing to somewhere in the United Kingdom. He'd been in her account and knew the minute that the tech had ratted him out. Getting frustrated and breathless, Nora went to the section of the wall where the picture had been torn down, except for one tiny corner of blue. She pulled up the Facebook profile of Nora Wex and tapped to enlarge her own image. Using a flashlight to give her eyes a better sense of the color, she matched the shade of blue from the corner to that of the image on her screen. He hacked into my personal account, knew we'd be led to him here, and ran for it. Chapter 17 UW Medical Center After getting back from the cabin and changing out of the Kevlar, Travis drove the dinky bug over to the hospital alone in search of Lori Robix, who was likely nearing the end of her visit and would be much harder to track down later. He felt confident that the prints and other samples they procured from the cabin would uncover the suspect's identity, and then it was only a matter of time until he surfaced and they slammed him to the wall. They were watching all of the credit cards he had access to, all of the accounts. As soon as he so much as bought a stick of gum, they'd be on him. But his anticipation that the trail was heating up gave way to something more unsettling eating away at his insides. Wexler wasn't with him, because she needed to secure her personal accounts, 
and work with the computer crimes team to see if they could find any way to trace the hacker. Travis doubted they would, because with computers it was all smoke and mirrors. But the real danger was that this slip-up would push Johnson to throw her off the case again. He had the kind of fourth-quarter fire in his stomach, telling him that she needed to find a way to win. Wexler had worked her fingers to the bone on this case, even getting in harm's way by taking on the assailant by herself, and doing all that just to be dropped now wasn't right. He was going to help her reach the finish line no matter what, and he kept telling himself he wasn't doing it just because of the way her hair curled around her face. When he pulled into the hospital parking lot and got out, some guy standing beside a jeep with three-foot diameter tires raised an eyebrow at him. Travis grumbled to himself and trudged through the puddles forming on the pavement of the hospital, catching the next elevator to the fourth floor. The hallway was completely vacant, including the space near Robex's door where the police guard should have been. Travis assumed he'd come too late and that she was already gone, until he found her fully dressed but sitting in bed watching TV. Her bags were packed, and she was probably just waiting for notice of her release. Hey, you look like you're in good enough shape for a runway, he said in as friendly a manner as he could. She gave him what must have been the most half-hearted smile he'd ever seen. Maybe it had been unwelcome for him to comment on her appearance by saying she could be a model. I'm glad I caught you before you left. There's something we need to talk about, he went on. Let me stop you right there. Anything you want to say to me, you can say to my lawyer, she said, stunning Travis. He stood blankly for a moment while Lori reached into her purse where her phone must have been and handed over the card of her lawyer. Travis didn't recognize the name, but there was something about it that struck him as a blood-sucking ambulance chaser. Was she planning to sue the FBI for injuries she sustained being saved from a bomb planted in her car by a criminal organization she worked for? It seemed like madness. Laurie, listen to me. I think you're making a big mistake, he said, coming closer to the bed. The glare he got from her made it clear she now saw him as an adversary. I know you think I'm a criminal, but I'm not. You can just go right back out the way you came and leave me alone. I've got nothing to say to you. She crossed her arms as Travis squinted at her, trying to find a way to defuse the situation. Whether she thought of herself as a criminal or not, part of what she said to him was an outright lie. The lawyer had told her to admit nothing and always proclaim her innocence. What do you mean you know what I think? I know what you said about me, she said returning her attention to the TV in another signal he should leave. Travis sighed. He wasn't ready to give up on her. I'm going to tell you something important right now, Lori. I hope it gets through to you. The path you're choosing right now is not going to help you. We know that you're involved with the prescription drug ring operating in the city because two members who were caught ratted you out. That's all we need to get permission to investigate every aspect of your entire life. The charges will not be light, and this lawyer, even if he's good, won't save you from substantial jail time. Any impact he has will be squat compared to how much you could help yourself by cooperating with us now. People died from overdosing on the drugs at these parties, and you'll be held responsible for them if you don't speak up. From what I can tell, you mistook a dangerous job for an opportunity, but that mistake doesn't have to cost you the rest of your life. Help us understand how this ring works. What were you doing with the payments? Tell me why they tried to blow you up. If they are still coming after you, you'll need our help. Travis left it all on the table and waited a moment for her expression to soften and her mind to change, but neither happened. He noticed that mentioning payments drew her attention to her bag. She might have been thinking about her phone. You're wasting your time, she whispered. Travis clenched his eyes shut. Maybe she hated and mistrusted police officers in general, or just didn't like him, but it was going to cost her dearly. You're going to have to decide whether you want to be on their side or ours, he said, walking into the hallway to leave, but leaning against the wall at the first intersection he came to. 
The risk he ran coming here was that she would disappear for good, but he knew her mother was an honest woman with integrity. Some of that had to be passed down. The worst part of it was that the whole situation did not have to be like this at all. Travis didn't have to think hard to figure out who had tipped Lori Robix off about his suspicions. In truth, it made him steam. Out of frustration, Travis glanced around and saw he was standing next to the door of a room with no name tag displayed. When he pushed it open, he found Wendy hopping out of the way. The short, blonde girl's eyes and mouth betrayed a tremor of fear. Travis brusquely stepped into the doorway and glared down at her. What have you been saying to Lori, Wendy? I didn't tell her anything. I haven't been saying anything to anyone. I don't even know what you're talking about, she rambled. You do know it's a crime to interfere in FBI business, right? We're talking about obstruction of justice. My private comments to another agent are not the fodder for your gossip, especially not when you help mistakenly convince someone of my intent. You just went and made my job a lot harder than it needs to be. The girl was quaking at this point and on the verge of tears. He didn't have any intention of bringing any charges against her, but she needed to get the message quickly and not forget it. I'm sorry, she gushed. I really didn't mean any harm, and I, I promise it will never, ever happen again. You can trust me with anything. Travis pursed his lips and glanced back into the hall. At the far end, another nurse was pushing a cart with a computer on it. He returned his attention to Wendy. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Since you're so close to Lori Robix, you're going to keep in touch with her after she leaves. If I need to find her later, you have to be able to tell me where she is. I'm going to give you my number, but there's one rule you have to abide by. No personal calls. Thrown what looked like a lifeline, Wendy immediately grabbed it. Absolutely. You won't have to worry about a thing. I'll keep up with her. Alone in the elevator on the way down, Travis wondered if he was making a mistake. Giving a big-mouthed, love-struck student nurse his phone number, that was definitely a mistake. The problem was letting Lori Robix roam free throughout the city when he knew she was in danger for more retribution from the drug ring. He might be able to convince Johnson to have someone keep an eye on her. The alternative was to arrest her for her involvement and hope the DA wouldn't be too upset at having to slap a case together. But Travis had a hunch that there was more to the story, and he'd be better off with her on their side. Chapter 18 FBI Offices, Seattle Division Nora sat in a cramped room full of monitors and mainframes, with one of the Seattle Division's computer crimes experts, an overweight, under-socialized man in a shirt and tie named Gerald Hagney. They'd gone through all of Nora's online accounts, everything from her banking to her subscription to Seventeen magazine she had when she was 13. Nora clenched her teeth, feeling like she was being beaten at her own game. Is there any sign of where he is or who he is? Nora asked, frustrated. No other than the IP address tied to the cabin in the woods under the name Raymond Jones. He seems to be using a remote proxy server to cloak his identity and whereabouts. That is what's making it seem like he's in the UK. In theory, we might be able to detect where he was visiting the proxy server website from, but there are countless of them commonly used for a number of things making it impossible to differentiate him from the rest of the traffic, Hagney said in a low voice that forced Nora to lean in to hear. With access to so many people's accounts, there was a good chance he had access to just as many devices, too. Options for pinning him down were growing thin, but an idea struck Nora that could flush him out. Staring at the screens, she tried to think it through. The last thing she could afford was another mistake. Should we go ahead and change your passwords, then? Delete some of these unused accounts? Hagney went on mumbling. Nora pursed her lips. Is there any reason to think he knows we know he's in my accounts? Nora asked. Hagney coughed and adjusted his tie. It's hard to say if he knows we figured out why he wasn't at the cabin when you arrived. 
But he did say he had deep access to you when he must have known you were in earshot. And with your background, he would have to know you'd figure out there was another user with access to your email account eventually. That's true. But on the other hand, he hasn't tried sending any messages or making any noticeable moves from inside the account. He also thought it was worth ripping my information off of the wall in order to keep his access a secret. Even if he knows he has limited time before he's thrown out, he wants as much information as he can get about what I'm doing. But why? Is it simply because he's hoping for a chance to kill me? They stared at the screens for a moment, trying to put the pieces together. In just a flash, the account activity changed, registering another visit. Oh, there he is. He's checking the account, Nora said, grabbing a jacket and moving toward the door. There's something he's hoping to find out. Nora stalked out into the hall and took the stairs to Johnson's office. It was risky approaching him with another long-shot maneuver, but she knew it would work. The only question was if Johnson would trust her enough to go along with it. When she reached his office, it looked like he was just getting ready to leave for the day. She brushed past the secretary and pushed open the door. I'm sorry for the intrusion, but we found something valuable about the hacking that you need to know, she said, knowing she was already overstating her case. Johnson relaxed his shoulders and looked at her skeptically. He then dropped back into his chair. Actually... I've got some information for you, he said, pushing a folder across the desk at her. She opened it up to see a report on the fingerprints they'd recovered from the cabin earlier in the day. What was missing was any mention of a match with the databases. Are you saying between the fingerprints and the facial recognition, you still have no idea who this guy is? Nora asked. Johnson didn't seem at all pleased with the answer he was forced to deliver. The conclusion is that we're dealing with someone who has no criminal history, someone who never had his fingerprints taken, even for something as simple as being a substitute teacher. But he knows how to stay out of sight, both online and offline, and the only reason he's been held at bay is that we're keeping a round-the-clock watch on Jenny Iverson, which isn't something we can maintain forever, he explained. It was strange not having Greer at her side to support her with her proposal, but in a way, the surprising dearth of information garnered from the prince made her proposal even stronger. Then let me tell you what we found out. We've discovered the breadth of access the suspect has to my accounts, but the only one he really returns to on a regular basis is the email account. My assessment is that he's checking it for some kind of clue about what I'm going to do, particularly in relation to Jenny Iverson. What we need to do is have her email me about a potential meeting and then flush him out when he tries to intervene. Johnson leaned back and took a long look at the ceiling. His face gave away nothing, but his eyes were constantly weighing the odds. I don't want to put you or Iverson on the hook as bait, and that's the end of the story. There's still a chance we'll find something in the cabin we can trace to him. And besides, there's something else I want you to do. But he knows we'll catch on that he's broken into the account soon. We have to move quickly, she argued. I've been getting incessant calls from Ricardo Lantham's sister, Isabella, demanding updates about her brother's case. I need you to go over there and calm her down, and I'm talking about today. There's no sign that the prints from the cabin match anything from the cleaning supply warehouse. But we're still looking into how our suspect could have pulled off the murder with the potassium chloride. Glancing at the rain-speckled window, Nora saw how dark it was outside. Forgoing a chance to draw out their suspect and risk losing him for good in favor of being a face to yell at for a victim's grieving relative was a painful proposition. If I go visit Lantham's sister, can we move forward with the email ruse? Nora asked. Johnson lowered his eyes at her. He had a way of tilting his head down and looking up that made it seem like he was going to use his forehead as a battering ram. That's not how it works, Agent Wexler. We don't make deals when it comes to our orders, and I don't play chicken with murderers. Grab a van from the lot and head down to Isabella's apartment on Howell Street by the highway. It's not far. 
Nora waited until after she had exited the office to let her grumbling commence. She realized the amount of trust Johnson had in her could fit in a thimble, but he should have been able to see that taking advantage of the suspect's access to her email account was the one way to draw him out. She should have told Greer to pitch it. He had a way of being convincing. But it had been a busy day, and Nora was anxious to knock off this last task and wind down for the night with a sub and some mindless TV on the couch in the break room she'd taken over. Rolling up to a tall apartment building and staring at its cold, concrete exterior put Nora in a pessimistic mood about the endeavor. All she could think about was Ricardo Lantham's dead body and how painfully he must have died after being injected with the poison. She buzzed the box for apartment 548, gave her name, and waited for the door to unlock. Once inside, she took the elevator up to the fifth floor and followed the long and drab hallway to the proper room. The carpet had to be 40 years old and was nearly shredded in places. After knocking, Nora waited a moment until the door opened to reveal a young woman about her age who had black hair tied in a bun, a face that made her seem even younger and a body with plenty of curves to it. It seemed she'd been crying recently, but she still managed to greet Nora with a smile. Hi, Isabella. I'm Agent Wexler, and I'm here to talk about your brother, she said, pulling out her creds. I'm so glad you came, Isabella said, urging Nora to enter the modest apartment featuring tie-dyed drapes and the smell of incense. Some slow guitar music drifted in from the other room. I've been waiting for anybody to get back to me and tell me what's going on. I'm extremely sorry about that. We've had a lot going on recently, and we're hoping for something more concrete to tell you. Even that much news was enough to make the poor girl sulk against the beige couch. She had on pajama pants and a tank top. At least she was comfortable. Carr doesn't have anything going on anymore. He only waits for justice, she said. In the back of the room were boxes and boxes stacked up around the table. Some of them had clothes peeking out of the top. The pile of things was probably a constant reminder of death for this girl, who also had to struggle with a lack of answers and plenty of confusion. Nora gingerly took a seat on the couch a short distance from her. I want you to know that we're doing everything in our power to bring your brother's killer to justice. We've even had some very promising leads about where the murder weapon was procured, how it was administered, and what was going on when it happened. We even came very close to finding our prime suspect, and it's only a matter of time until he's in custody. The words were little comfort to Isabella, whose gaze wandered absently around the room. On the coffee table nearby were some open textbooks of what looked like accounting. He didn't deserve this she said, her eyes welling up. Down in Cali, we didn't have much, but managed to avoid the gangs and the drugs. Card knew that if he worked hard at school, he could get out and make it somewhere better with real opportunities. He came here, landed a good job, and even convinced me to follow him up. I always looked up to him, my big brother, the example of what you could do if you did things right. But then this is what he got for it. Killed in cold blood for no reason, like the thugs back home. Nora swallowed, getting worked up, but trying not to let it show. It was a tragedy that he'd been the victim in a play to terrorize his boss. I know there's nothing I can say to bring him back or even make it better, but that great example doesn't have to go with him. He can keep inspiring you to make a better life for yourself, even though he's gone, and maybe our society will improve a little bit right along with you. Isabella gave a perfunctory nod and reached for a glass with some steaming tea in it on the corner of the table. I knew something bad would happen when he took that job at Spick and Span. There's an ethnic slur right in the name. And it wasn't like he didn't have other offers or couldn't have done something else. He also was a DJ and was gaining popularity in the area. Even if the nightclubs didn't take him, he could have done weddings. Listening, Nora nodded. I actually knew about his relationship with his boss, and had even met her once when they came by here with that vase for my birthday, Isabella went on. It just made no sense, because he was an attractive man who didn't have a hard time finding dates. She was almost fifteen years older than him. Sure, she had money, 
but she lacked friendliness and a sense of common decency. When Card was in the bathroom, she told me I could have a job in her warehouse because I must have known household cleaning supplies. And she said it with a smile, like there wasn't anything nasty about it. This insensitive side of Aaron Clausen wasn't something Nora had seen personally, but the general coolness about her seemed to gel with the impression Isabella was giving. Then why do you think your brother participated in the relationship? Nora asked. Isabella shook her head and released a sigh. I don't know. I think she might have been using her position to manipulate him, or she was promising him something like more money or a promotion. Maybe she threatened to fire him if it didn't continue, and he felt he had no choice because it can be tough to find a new job, she said. With talk like that, it wasn't much of a stretch from threats and manipulation to murder. What if Aaron Clausen made up the story about the stomach bug and injected Lantham with the potassium chloride herself? But why would a successful woman murder her handsome young lover at his desk, not a dozen feet from hers? Have you spoken to her at all since your brother's death? Nora asked. Isabella glanced over at the pile of boxes before letting her head drop against the couch cushion. I didn't hear a word from her directly, but a couple nights after he died, some moving men showed up at my door with all his stuff. She paid them to clean out his place, which I suppose was nice enough, but now it's taking up all of this space in my living room. Nora got up to get a better view into some of the top boxes. She saw some dishware, a box full of shoes, and enough bathroom supplies to drown in. Do you know if anything from his workplace is included in here? Nora asked. Yeah, I think so. Isabella rolled off the couch and flipped open a box on one of the chairs. I knew he had this picture of our family with him at work. Nora didn't have to look for long to know that the item she searched for wasn't there. What about his laptop? Is that in any of these boxes? If we could find out what he'd been doing around the time of the murder, that might help us tremendously. I remember seeing it right next to him when I was called to the scene, she said, but Isabella only had a shrug for her. I don't know what happened to it. That's what he did his DJing on, so it's not like he'd ever accidentally misplace it. Nora crossed her arms and pretended to peek into more boxes while she tried to think through the situation. What had Aaron Clausen done with his laptop and why? Everything the woman had ever said suddenly seemed so suspicious. She claimed to have seen Jenny Iverson's stalker hanging around her warehouse and was quick to implicate Christopher Walden when they'd found his profile. What if she tried to piggyback on Jenny Iverson's misfortune to get Lantham out of the way? Then Clausen got lucky when Lori Robix was also attacked, making it seem like the threat was against the entire Founders Club when they were three unrelated incidents. Taking a deep breath, she tried not to get ahead of herself. A hunch wasn't proof, especially without a motive. She needed to find Ricardo Lantham's laptop for more clues about what might have been going on between them. After working with Isabella to look through the boxes, it was clear he didn't keep any kind of writing that would help. Isabella, I'm going to ask you something, and it needs to stay between us. Do you think your brother's boss had anything to do with his murder? The girl's eyes widened as she gasped. I thought she was wrong for him and that the relationship would never last, but she did make him happy enough and afforded him a lifestyle better than what he would have probably had otherwise. It wouldn't surprise me to learn if she'd hired him just for his looks, but she never struck me as the type to kill. Why would she do that? That's something we'll have to investigate, but unless we know more about what was going on between them, we won't know for sure. Please call me if you think of anything. Before Nora left, Isabella wrapped her in a big hug that came with a strong sense of satisfaction. All she needed was to know that someone was concerned about the situation and trying their best to pursue every conceivable possibility, and it felt good for Nora to provide that. The drive back to the office was quick, but something held her up after she parked the van and walked around to the front doors. Greer's forest green pickup truck sat at the curb. The doors opened behind her, and he walked out into the rain to meet her. He might have been inside looking at her. I've got something to tell you, he said. 
It caught Nora off guard, making her heart skip a beat. Lori Robix is definitely working with the drug ring, but she's hired a lawyer and isn't talking. Oh, Nora said, nodding seriously. I think Aaron Clausen might have killed Ricardo Lantham and tried to pin it on Jenny Iverson's stalker. Greer sighed and put his hands on his hips, looking around the street. You saying that stomach bug story was all bunk? Anyway, there's something else. I see you got your truck back, Nora said, wondering how long they were going to stand out in the rain for. Clean from top to bottom. No GPS transmitters, no explosives of any kind, no nothing. I'm sure I'll have to take one of the vans from here on out, but it makes me feel better knowing that driving through a two-foot-deep marsh won't be a problem. The thing I wanted to say, though, is that my family and I talked it over, and we decided it's just not right for you to be sleeping on an uncomfortable couch here, when back home we've got a perfectly good chicken coop. You're sticking me in the chicken coop? Nora asked, raising a smirk from Greer. Okay, we'll at least move the chickens to the spare bedroom first. But anybody snooping around my house is in for a nightmare of epic proportions. They got in the truck, and Nora wiped some of the rain from her face. The engine roared to life, and the vehicle lurched down the road. I hear the fingerprints weren't good for a match, he said. Nora nodded, waiting a moment. We're at risk of losing him. He'll lie low for a while, wait until the FBI has backed off, and then go after Jenny Iverson. I posed an idea to Johnson that she could email me to meet while he still got access to my email account, draw him out as bait. Two of his targets together would be irresistible to him. And what did Johnson have to say about that? He asked. Nora needed only to give him a deadpan look. Oh. This is how we turn the tables on him, take advantage of his access. She could tell Greer was skeptical about the plan, possibly for the same reasons as Johnson. Nora wondered if they didn't think she could handle herself in a risky situation. It made her eager to prove them wrong. We've got a lot of lines in the water, he said. One of them is sure to get a bite without doing anything drastic. They continued to cruise along the streets, the tires spraying water around them, when Nora's phone started to ring. Her first thought was that it was Isabella Lantham with something else she thought of, and her second was that it might even be the suspect who had come to her door at the inn. But it turned out to be Jenny Iverson in an awful panic. What's going on? Nora asked. All of my bank accounts are empty. I'm flat broke. And then as soon as I saw that, I was locked out. My inbox is getting inundated with spam and receipts for disturbing orders of sex toys that are being shipped to my house. I feel like I'm completely ruined, and it's all making me so furious. Nora knew that after breaking into the cabin, they'd pushed him to a new level. It didn't look like he even had any of your passwords or account numbers. He'd put you on a pedestal, Nora argued but it was clear the suppositions they had were thrown out the window. I'm certainly not feeling very high up now, Iverson said, her voice withering. Nora took a deep breath and looked over at Greer, who was practically ignoring the road ahead of them to focus on the call. There's no way Johnson would say no now, she said. Greer nodded, providing all of the permission she needed. It was time to lay the groundwork for the confrontation. What are we going to do? Iverson asked. It depends. Are you willing to do something to get back at him? Chapter 19 FBI Offices, Seattle Division Travis sat next to Wexler and Angkor during the morning meeting in the recon room. Always knowing the value of a bold move, he'd come around to Wexler's ploy to draw out their suspect through her email. Johnson, who was talking to a burly agent with short blonde hair at the front of the room, still seemed reluctant to go along with it, but it was just a matter of time until things got desperate enough that he couldn't say no. If things continued to progress in their current direction, that wouldn't take long. Listen up. We're going to do a little reorganizing today. We've all heard about the drug ring infiltrating the local schools, which the DEA has started referring to as the Talkatron dealers, 
named after the app they use to communicate anonymously with cohorts and victims. We're going to be teaming up with them to handle this case, specifically tracking and locating the leaders. Heading up our task force is Agent Mirren, but I'm sure he'll need all of your support, Johnson explained as Mirren produced a plastic smile and polite wave. Angkor scoffed audibly. What is it? Travis asked. Angkor scratched his nose to conceal his comment. Johnson's grooming him to take over the division. It must be a big case. We're officially on the back burner. Travis felt some tension in his chest at what he saw as a double slight. Not only was he being relegated to backup on a case he had cracked open, but the killer they were tracking was now at risk of being an afterthought for the special agent in charge. And he was giving up his vacation for this. Still, it gave Travis an idea how they might move forward. I'm deeply grateful for this level of trust, Agent Mirren said, shaking Johnson's hand before turning to the staff in their seats. The two were obviously close. To quickly get everyone up to speed on the latest developments, we're drawing the conclusion that the Takatron dealers have a hideout or a stockpile of drugs somewhere in the vicinity, based on two bits of data. First, the two boys in custody say that they'd most frequently been asked to move vehicles to spots north of Seattle. Second, the location of the car thefts is getting closer and closer to us, suggesting they aren't going as far to get them. Rather than try to further stifle their operation, our goal will be to locate the hideout and confront the ringleaders. Johnson nodded thoughtfully, while the rest of the agents assessed the pattern of thefts on a screen displaying a map. Something struck Travis, though, who broke the silence. And what about Lori Robix and the car bombing? he asked, drawing some looks from the people around him. Mirren raised his arm out with fingers extended, like he was about to cast a magic spell. I've looked at the situation with Lori Robix and the dealers performing acts of retribution against their low-level people, and I don't see it as a major concern. This sent a message to her that she was out and needed to keep quiet, and there haven't been any signs of trouble since, he replied. Taken aback, Travis opened his mouth to protest, but let a stern glare he happened to notice from Johnson halt him. It was possible they didn't realize she'd been deeply involved in the finances, or were overlooking the impact of it. She was the key to pinpointing the leaders, but Mirren preferred to watch them operate. Johnson cleared his throat and stepped closer to the semicircle of desks. With this case becoming a primary concern, Johnson began, immediately leading Angkor to give Travis a pointed look. We need to bring in this killer so we can refocus our attention, but at the moment he is requiring more resources than ever. Apart from the surveillance on Iverson and Clausen, plus the manpower to investigate the case, we're now having the techs work double duty cleaning up a string of hackings. The killer's M.O. has evolved completely. He's pulling all of his strings to make bogus payments and lock people out of their accounts, doing as much damage as possible along the way. We're right behind him, cleaning everything up, and there's no doubt he'll get careless and reveal his identity. In the meantime, let's continue investigating the murder of Raymond Jones, so we can add that to the list of charges when he's finally brought in. Any questions? Good. As Johnson continued with a few other items of business, Travis exchanged glances with Wexler, who seemed equally aghast. On the one hand, it was vitally important that they bag the killer, but on the other, Johnson was telling them to attend to the least pressing details of the case. There was so much going on between Iverson and Clausen that they needed more freedom to work, not less. When the time came to get up and go, Travis watched Johnson and Mirren get into a private exchange about the maps on the monitors that seemed to fully absorb them both. While they nodded and talked shoulder to shoulder, Travis grabbed the folder in front of him containing printouts of the hacking victims and carried it to the front of the room. What are you doing? Nora asked him. Hold on, he said, waving her off as he approached the two men having their own private intel session. Best he could tell, they were talking about trying to identify the car thieves. Travis stepped beside Johnson and flipped open the file. I'm sorry for interrupting, but I think you need to take a look at these bank statements, he said. 
Johnson's annoyance was palpable. Agent Greer, this isn't going to bring in our suspect. I need you to get out there and handle this, he said, turning back to Mirren, but Travis wasn't done. If you could quickly listen to this plan. Just do whatever it takes, Johnson said, his voice rising. If you say so, Travis said, backing away and retracing his steps up the aisle to Wexler and Angkor, who were standing there waiting for him. We've got the green light, carte blanche to bring our suspect in. Wexler's eyes lit up. They could move ahead with the ploy, but they weren't going to have the high level of support they'd envisioned, making it even more dangerous. Including the guy on duty watching over Iverson, there'd only be four of them in the area. You're amazing. That's a trick I'll have to remember, she said. Thank me later when you're not dead. I'll give Iverson a call now and let her know that we're on for the meeting, she said. Something struck Angkor, who raised a thin eyebrow at her. Wait, you've already sent the emails? Absolutely. Even if we couldn't go through with the trap, I wasn't about to miss a chance to mess with him, she said, getting Angkor to laugh and shake his head. Mind games. I love it, he said. Now that this is a go, we don't have much time to get ready. I'll get a hold of Iverson's surveillance team and let them know the plan. Angkor and I will also have to get some plainclothes disguises, and everyone will need a mic before we head over to the rendezvous point, Travis said. They broke for the hall, knowing they only had a couple of hours until they'd find out if their suspect would fall for the ploy. The meeting was set for an eatery in the back of the famous Pike's Market, called Whale Tales, located behind the long row of seafood and produce cellars, and with access to the walkway running along the seaside via a secluded stairwell. The plan was to spot him either walking through the market or coming up the stairwell and pick him up with minimal public disturbance, long before he made it to Iverson and Wexler's table. Greer! They'd only made it about halfway along the hallway when Travis was pulled from his thoughts. Whoever had pronounced his name made it sound like a dull roar, almost emitting the G completely. Turned out it was Agent Mirren, striding after them with his hands in his pockets and a serious look on his face. I'll catch up with you downstairs, Travis said to Wexler and Angkor. He barely had time to turn around before Mirren and his spiky blonde hair were leaning in. Did this have to do with a question he'd asked about Lori Robicks? I need to make sure you understand the game plan for this dealer's case. You're reporting to me on this one, and unless I give you something to do, you need to stay on the bench. You get me? Travis peered at him, wondering if he was for real. A little touchy about authority, he made Johnson seem like a teddy bear. It's a big mistake not to take a serious look at Lori Robicks and bring her in as an asset, Travis said, to immediate dismissal in a blatant scowl. The only thing we need to do with those little hoodlums is put them behind bars. You follow my lead on this one, or you New Yorkers will have a butthurt flight home, he said, poorly feigning a Brooklyn accent. It was possible he didn't know what division they were actually from, or thought that New York State was only composed of the city. He definitely didn't know that Travis had lived longer in Seattle than he had. Either way, it pissed Travis off, and what made it worse was that he had to bury it. Have it your way, he said. It burned to say that. Most people working with the FBI knew how to be cooperative and put the good of the mission over their own careers. But every once in a while, somebody would pop up who thought he was winning when everybody else lost. The playbook for dealing with guys like Mirren was well known. Tread carefully. After Mirren gave a smug nod and returned to Johnson in the recon room, Travis met up with the others as they were picking out their equipment. What was that about? Wexler asked him. Nothing. He wished us luck with a killer, he said knowing she was too smart to believe it. Chapter 20 Pike Place Hill Climb Walk Picking up Jenny Iverson without there being any chance of the suspect watching her at her home had taken some planning and time, but they had managed to get her into a utility van that took them to the side of a tall brick building looking down at the bustling marketplace. 
As they tested the mic on her and checked a GPS with a monitor rigged up in the van, it was clear she was nervous. Travis had wished they'd gone into more detail with her about what to wear. She wore a long, slim skirt that wouldn't allow her to run and a sweater that was tight enough to make it hard to conceal anything underneath. At least there was some optimism in her pretty brown eyes. Do you think this could actually work? she asked. Wexler looked over at him in anticipation of an answer. It depends how badly he wants you and what his plans are, he said. What if something goes wrong? she asked. Travis leaned back and bit the inside of his cheek. There was always the chance that something would go wrong. Did the suspect want to get into a shootout in the middle of Pike's Market? What if he was hiding in a nearby window, ready to fire at them from below? Travis cleared his throat. Angkor is sweeping the market, and the eyes we've had on you are covering the area. The table you'll be sitting at is in the corner of two thick walls. Nora will have her back to them for a perfect vantage point, regardless of which entry point he chooses. I'll cover the market front, and Angkor will lurk at the top of the stairs. Winger will be watching from a window in the corner building, overlooking the market. We all know the face we're looking for, and as soon as we spot him, we'll all converge on his location. Jenny nodded, and Wexler put her hand on her shoulder. We're going to get through this, she said. Trust me. I just want this whole ordeal to be over and my life to go back to normal, Iverson said. We want that for you, too, Travis added. The plan was to exit the van one at a time in the order of Wexler, Iverson, and Greer, with a surveillance man covering them as they went down to the market. They got word from Winger that the area was clear and alerted Angkor that they were getting into position. Then Wexler climbed out of the van and strolled away in the rain. Iverson had a pale look on her face. Her hands were shaking. You're being extremely brave right now. I'm right behind you. I'll have my eyes on you the entire way, Travis said. She produced a strained smile and stepped out of the van when the call came in. Travis was at the window with a tight grip on the handle, in case he needed to come out after her. But putting her head down and striding with purpose was going to get her to the market without incident. You're up to bat, Winger said. Travis stepped out himself and felt the brisk sea air against his skin. He wore jeans, a brown jacket, and an old Seahawks cap with the brim broken in. It was almost enough to make him think he was home and staying for good as he progressed down the street and into the market's north entrance. There were fresh fish displays, other meats, florist stalls, and other craft stands stretching to the end of the long hall. There were mobs of people, so many faces that each had to be appraised, in order to find the man with the chubby cheeks, light brown hair, and green eyes. So what do I do? Act natural? Iverson said over their channel. Greer smiled. It was almost adorable. I think in your situation, being nervous and frightened is perfectly natural. It must have been a real shock to check your bank account and find it completely drained, Wexler said. You have no idea, Iverson went on. At first I thought it was just some bug with the browser, so I refreshed the page. When there was still nothing there, I started to panic. Greer listened to them chat as he meandered around the front of the market, trying to both blend in and keep an eye on everyone coming and going. He never missed noticing the people who were streaming in and out of whale tails, but there were too many of them to get a clear look at all of the faces. Angkor, everything fine on your end? he asked. There are only a few people around, and I think they're all making me. Standing at the top of the stairs here pretending not to look at everyone just screams cop. Maybe I'd be better off dropping my pants and leering straight on with my tongue out. Nobody has to second-guess a crazy person, Angkor said. There's no time for you to get into your after-work routine now, Travis said. Is it time yet? I feel like it's time, Iverson said. If he doesn't show up, how long do we have to sit here? Travis glanced at his watch. It was just past the top of the hour when the meeting was set for in the email. If the suspect were going to show up, it'd have to be soon. Travis had that feeling in his gut that he would show up. 
this opportunity was too good to miss. We're not in a rush here, Wexler said. Let's take our time, stay cautious, and go through the motions until we're ready to leave. A waitress came over and took their order. Iverson ordered tea and a muffin, while Wexler decided to order bacon and eggs. When it came, her lip-smacking was audible over the channel. Oh, the things I have to do for my job, she said, biting into a crunchy piece. Travis could almost smell the bacon from the market. You're trying to torture me, aren't you? he asked, while she continued to moan about how good it was. No, I would never. Mmm. Gritting his teeth, Travis refocused on the task at hand and kept a watchful eye over the market. He was breathing deeply, fully expecting to have to jump into action at a moment's notice. One guy passed beside him that seemed like a match, but his face was just a little too droopy to fit. Anchor, anything? All clear. It crossed Travis's mind that he might have seen through the trap and known better than to come. Can I tell you something, Nora? Iverson asked, sounding serious. Sure, of course. You asked me before if I could think of anybody who might want to do this to me, and I said I couldn't imagine it from anyone I'd ever met. That included the guy from Match.com, who we know now posed as another guy to meet with me six months ago. Well, I've been thinking really hard about it, and I think I know where I know him from, Iverson said. You know who he is? Wexler asked. If she'd had an idea about whom they were dealing with, why did she wait so long to say so? It was enough to distract Travis from what he was doing. Yeah, it was this guy from... A loud crash ripped through Travis's ear, making him flinch. He frantically looked around to find out what was going on. What was that? Wexler asked, something deathly afraid in her voice. Oh, my God! Iverson said. Whoa, what happened? Angkor asked. I don't know, Travis said. There was still static coming in over the speaker. Angkor, move into cover. I'll have a look around. Winger, you there? Nothing but silence came over the channel. Winger? Angkor asked, but got no response. It was staggering to think that their suspect had been able to pinpoint Winger in the corner window and take him out while everyone was in the market. Travis burst into action, trying to push through the crowd as quickly as possible to check it out. But simply exiting the market into the street, where he could be noticed and shot, wasn't a good idea. He'd have to take the long way around. I'm going after him, Travis alerted the others. More static came over the channel, as well as what sounded like the low grumbling of someone clearing their throat. I've never liked these ear sets, especially when they're dripping blood. Hearing that voice, obviously not Winger's, was enough to knock the wind out of Travis. He looked through the windows at the front of the market, but couldn't see anything in the corner brick building. He had to get over there quickly. Some more static came over the line, likely either Wexler or Angkor, switching off to make the call in to Johnson. Nobody would get over there in time. Travis's heart was pounding. He had to end this now. Give yourself up, Travis demanded. You have no chance of getting away. Who said anything about getting away? We're all going to pay for what we've done, he said, his voice menacing and rushed as if he were speaking through clenched teeth. Leave me alone, Iverson said over the channel, a quiver in her voice. The sound that came over the channel next was almost like a hissing. Travis was at the end of the market, pumping his legs at full stride in the rain to make it to the brick building's entrance. How many times I wish I could have said that to you. You'll know before the end what it feels like to have someone ruin your life, utterly destroy you, and then later look you in the eye and not even remember that it happened, he said. What was I supposed to do? Iverson asked. Wexler was trying to calm her down. It sounded like she was in tears. This was torture, plain and simple. The stairs were getting closer, and all Travis could think about was how he'd find Winger up in that corner room with the windows, probably shot from behind and bleeding from a gash across his neck. 
the thought sent him into a rage and pushed him to corner their man before he could do any more harm. Travis leapt up the cement stairs and grabbed a rusty iron railing to pull him to the door. As he reached for the handle, the door swung open and he collided head-on with someone in black Kevlar. Travis was struck speechless when he looked up at the man's panic-stricken face. Greer, my mic cut out, Winger said. You couldn't hear anything I was saying. I'm fine. Turning back to the market, Travis's mind lurched to the next possibility. This was a ploy to draw him away from his station. Winger's fine? Then how was this channel compromised? Wexler asked as Travis and Winger started back toward the market. Sounds of laughter erupted on the line. <laughs> you say it like you're on some magical frequency that can't be singled out with a few simple scripts. Have you ever even used the Internet before? He said, mocking her. An uncomfortable silence followed as Wexler didn't respond. Travis and Winger were already moving away from the building. The body armor and dangerous-looking rifle were already drawing disturbed glances from passers-by, so Winger headed up to the van rather than into the crowded market with Travis. Tell us where you are, he said, almost shouting into the microphone. While he waited for a response, he continued toward the center of the long market hallway. Angkor stood watch in the doorway, his fingers wrapped around his glock. The look of bewilderment on his face was one no agent ever should have had. Travis had been thrown for a loop as well. So blind, all of you. It became clear they weren't going to get any more information from the suspect, who went silent and seemed to be simply playing with them from afar. But the last thing they were going to do was provide him with additional ammunition. Sharing a nod, Travis and Angkor unhooked their microphones and stuffed them in their pockets. When he stepped into Whale Tales and saw Wexler and Iverson with their backs against the walls, he signaled that they should also cut their mics. It's time to go, he said. Iverson appeared to be in a complete panic and on the verge of tears. Wexler, on the other hand, was bubbling over with rage. The way her eyebrows curved, brow curled, and lips strained were all perfect. I'm going to nail him to the wall, she seethed as they stepped into the market's long row. Travis had no idea how getting on the Internet would allow someone to scan and crack into their frequency, but regardless of its authenticity, the insult had hit the mark. The man who'd broken into their channel knew far too well how to press her buttons, and it looked like she'd snapped. Hey, we're going to get him, Travis said as they came around the corner and took to the street. He got nothing more than a glare from her. Winger pulled the van down the street and allowed them to climb in the back. The sigh of relief from Iverson, when the door finally closed and they started to drive away, could have blown out a dozen candles. I thought I was going to die, she said. Travis kicked himself for putting her in that position, but he waited to respond until Angkor finished making sure none of the van's equipment was on. Nobody could be listening in. It's all right. He was never here, and there's no way he could have gotten to you. The guy likes hiding behind the safety of his computer, but it won't protect him for long, he said. My question is how he got so good in the first place, Angkor said, aggravated. Most people don't learn killing and hacking. They pick one or the other. A pothole sent the van rocking back and forth for a moment, enough time for everyone to focus on Jenny Iverson. To say she looked anxious was a big understatement. You said you know who this is. I think it's time you tell us, Wexler said. Chapter 21 FBI Offices, Seattle Division Jenny Iverson could barely open her mouth before the van pulled into the lot behind the FBI's local headquarters. She seemed reluctant to say what she knew, but Nora couldn't guess why. It wasn't until they piled into a small conference room with a table and a few bookshelves that they had a good opportunity to let Iverson talk. It just seems completely crazy, Iverson said, looking down at her hands on the fake wooden table. Just tell us. Sometimes things that come in out of left field have the best chance of cracking a case, Greer said, 
leaning against the table with one hand. Nora always thought Jenny Iverson had a fragile, naive way about her that made the threat she faced all the more unjust. Even coming out and speaking ill about a person who promised to destroy her life before taking it didn't come easy. She swallowed and brushed a strand of hair behind her ear. I guess the only place to start is all the way back at the beginning. I graduated from the business program at UW and immediately founded my company, TeamThink. There were already a few collaboration software companies out there at the time, but I felt strongly that I could make something better than these drab interfaces connecting people over the Internet. Frankly, they needed a woman's touch. Our website design was beautiful. The colors were soothing and pleasing all over, and we included a lot of great illustrations. Customers loved the feel of the service, and we immediately started to take off. We were great at convincing existing customers of other services to switch to us as well. I was vaguely aware of what was going on with our competitors, one of whom was obviously facing imminent closure, and finally bottomed out with an embarrassing blog post from the CEO ridiculing customers for being duped by fancy colors and fonts. That company was called Remote Collaborations, and it was founded by a man named Harrison Shotterham. As far as I can tell, he disappeared completely until I met him for dinner when he was posing as Christopher Walden from Match.com. Iverson paused, squinting at Nora and Greer, as if she needed them to say if she was telling the truth. Nora believed she was, but that didn't explain why they were only hearing about a rival she'd driven out of business now. Jenny, what took you so long to tell us about this? Nora asked. Didn't you recognize him when you were having dinner? Iverson nodded and took a deep breath. I know. I should have remembered sooner. But this was just about the furthest thing from my mind until my cat showed up dead in my office and you asked me to think about enemies I've made. I've always been focused on my business and knowing all about some guy who happened to run another website with a similar service just wasn't going to happen. To be honest, I think I only really looked at his website and saw his picture once, back when I was starting out. Who's going to remember a face from a picture they saw for one second ten years before? I actually didn't even remember his name until I looked up remote collaborations in my records. For some reason, there isn't anything about it online anymore. Nora leaned back in her chair and took a moment to think. Harrison Shotterham must have been trying to cover his tracks by deleting material about his business from the web. But even if the cash for remote collaborations were somehow gone, he wouldn't be able to get rid of actual documents filed with the state. Even just having a name made Nora feel like she was so much closer to stopping him. Did you have any idea that Shotterham was a Seattle native? Greer asked. No, I couldn't have told you if he was from here or Timbuktu, Iverson said. Nora noticed Greer casting her an inquisitive look compelling her to offer at least some sort of cross-examination, even though she was already sold on the match. My question is, what set off this recent chain of events? Did Shotterham decide to go after you and then stumble upon the man who happened to look like him? Or was he already off the deep end when you became a convenient target? Honest truth, I would love to have him back on the line and shove his name right back in his face, Nora said. Greer put his hand on her shoulder. He wanted her to calm down, but she was done playing games with this guy. Since her coffee shop ploy didn't work, it was time to move on to a new idea that was fail-safe. I couldn't really tell you, Iverson said. The dinner just seemed like a boring date that I spent most of in the bathroom. It wasn't as if he skulked behind me in the shadows on the way home or did anything weird to my drink. I guess I should be thankful for that. This'll take some more research to verify, but the motive you've offered is as clear as day, Encore said, shrugging at the other agents. Agreed, Greer said. This is something we can look into and then bring to Johnson. It didn't take long once they started searching through databases to get some serious hits. The first was an old article on remote collaborations in the Seattle Times from the late 90s, with a profile picture of Harrison Shotterham providing a perfect match between his appearance and identity. Even if he'd been able to scrub the web, 
wiping this old news article calling him an Internet innovator wasn't going to happen. It seemed this innovator wasn't good enough to wipe the old newspaper archives. Other peculiar things started coming up. Shotterham had let his driver's license expire a little under a year ago, but a passport was still active. A car registration in his name for an ancient Corolla had missed its renewal date. In the last year, there were no records of him owning any property, maintaining any bank accounts, or holding any jobs. No criminal record also meant no prints. This guy's tried to vanish completely, Greer said, sounding surprised. Almost. Take a look at this, Nora said, adjusting the screen in front of her so that he could take a better look at it. Plane tickets to San Antonio immediately before and after the video footage of him in the post office there. He was hiding in plain sight while trying to point the finger at Christopher Walden, figuring no one would ever guess his identity. Wait, so he flew cross-country with a dead cat in his luggage just so he could ship it back in the mail? Greer wondered. How did that make it through the x-rays at security? Nora shrugged. When Jenny Iverson took a look at the flight itinerary she'd obtained, she shook her head. This doesn't make any sense. During his flight to San Antonio, and at the time he was in front of the post office cameras, I still had Dina at home. Realizing they were still looking at a puzzle, Nora stared at the flight times. Is there any chance he could have taken your cat after he returned? She asked. And then what? He intercepted his own package at her office door and put the body of her dead cat in it right before it got to her? Miss Iverson, are you absolutely sure there's no way your cat couldn't have been taken before he left? She must have been alive on the flight out, Greer said. Maybe he got his package before it was delivered. I really don't think I wouldn't have noticed Dina was missing another two days earlier for him to take her with him. But I guess it's possible. It didn't seem like the package had been opened and resealed, Iverson said. I'm not seeing anything here about Chotterham's luggage on any of the flights, Nora sighed, letting the mouse go and leaning back in her seat. The nice resolution she'd hoped for was getting buried under questions about whether or not the cat was in the package when it was sent and when he'd mysteriously broken into Iverson's home to get her. Angkor was at another computer with his chin against his palm. The real problem is that nothing we've uncovered about him tells us where he is now. We can get alerted if he tries to use his name again, but he could be anywhere having assumed any identity. Between the anonymous accounts and the proxy servers that mask his IP address, he's invisible, even when he's talking right to us. Nora had heard enough. She abruptly got up from her seat and went to the door, pulling out her phone on the way. Hey, where do you think you're going? We're trying to figure this out, Greer said. But Jenny Iverson's big, watchful eyes were right next to him, pushing her to do what she needed to do. You can take this to Johnson if you want. I'm going to make a phone call. When she stepped into the hall, the pressure on her seemed to mount. Mixed with apprehension, she scrolled through her contacts for a name she'd almost forgotten. What had gone unsaid after they'd fled from Pike Market was that Nora had failed again to get a hold of her suspect. She had unpleasant memories of threats from Johnson, who would use this as an excuse to boot her off the case for good. Something had to be done, and fast. Nora's thumb settled on the name Danny Polk as she pushed back into the empty conference room with the bookshelves. He was briefly a boyfriend of hers during college, forgettable for all but one thing. Last she'd heard, he was living in Portland, Oregon. Surprise, surprise. I never thought I'd be hearing from you again. Are you going to try to arrest me? His deep, rich voice still had all that allure to it. He must have been checking up on her if he knew she'd made it in with the feds. I need your help, she said. I... Stop. Not over the phone. They might be listening. I'm in Seattle. Can you... Yes, Danny said. Nervous, Nora ran her hand through her hair. It'll take me a while to get out of here, and then it's a three-hour drive. But you'll make it in two, she said, stifling a smile. Good to know I left an impression. You wish, she said, but he'd already hung up. She supposed he must have been less forgettable than she thought, 
if she knew where to meet him without saying a word. After a drive of even a few hours, Danny would invariably find himself drawn to the fluffy pancakes and blueberry syrup at IHOP. Carbs for dinner, Nora thought, checking her waist. The door popped open behind her, and she turned to find Greer barging in. I just need a minute, she said, scrambling to come up with an excuse until she saw the pale look on his face. I just got a call from Lila Robix. A group of armed men in masks broke into her home and took Lori away. We've got to get over there now. Chapter 22, 1616 30th Avenue Arriving at Lila Robix's house gave Nora chills that seemed excessive even with the cool rain. The last time she was here, a car had exploded in the driveway, but now there were only some marks on the pavement and an empty space where a burned bush had needed to be removed. This forlorn home had seen far too much chaos lately. The front of the home looked fine, so they went around back and found a door that had been knocked off its hinges and now hung at an awkward angle. Judging by a deep depression near the knob, the invasion started with some kind of battering ram, maybe even one similar to what the police would use. Nora took a look around at the fenced-in yard and wondered if anyone around thought a few loud cracks were worth checking out. If the police had been called when they were breaking in, they might have arrived before the thugs were able to escape with Lori Robix. Nora called to the house's owner when they entered, finding her sitting quietly alone in a recliner with her arms around her legs. The elegant bar owner seemed twitchy and short of breath. Greer had waited until they were well on their way here before alerting the local PD and Agent Marin about the situation, and the sirens they heard signaled their impending arrival. Greer hunched down beside Mrs. Robix and sighed. We're going to do everything we can to get Lori back, but we only have a minute to address something important between us before everyone else gets here, he said, drawing Nora's concern. What is it? Robix asked, barely able to get out the words. We think your daughter had a very special position working for the group of prescription drug dealers that rigged a bomb in her car and took her away from here. It seems she was processing the payments for them until something went wrong and they decided to turn on her. Oh, my! What are they going to do with my baby? You can't let anything happen to her! Robix began to cry. The sound of vehicles coming to a halt outside caught their ears. This is very important. When they took your daughter, did she have her phone on her? That's what she used to make all of the transfers. Do you know where it is? Greer asked. Robix looked at them with a confused squint. I don't have the slightest idea, she said. She was upstairs in her room when they came. The nod from her was all the permission they needed to move for the stairs, which Nora took three at a time on her way up. Greer was right behind her, and together they peeked into the various rooms until they came to one bedroom with posters of hip-hop dancers on the walls and enough clothes around to outfit an entire high school. The room was also a mess. They stepped cautiously onto the thin carpet where beads and bits of broken glass were everywhere. Most of what must have been on the desk had been swept off the side into a space against the wall. Dresser drawers had been pulled open and emptied in what looked like a frantic search. They heard Agent Mira knock on the door below and demand that it be opened immediately. When I last saw her at the hospital, I believe she understood we knew about the payment transfers on her phone. Now it's the only way we're going to find her. I hope she was smart enough to hide it here. Nora pulled apart the bed sheets and checked in crevices for the phone. Greer ducked into the closet and sifted through the clothes. It seemed to Nora that the criminals knew they needed her phone just as much as Lori. The only question was if they got it and took it with them. Hearing Lila Robix talk to Mirren downstairs, Nora went to the pile next to the desk and reached around among the mixture of pens, books, calculator, and empty soda cans until her hand closed on something. Here, she said, turning with the slim smartphone in hand. Greer was there with a look of ecstatic relief on his face. He took the phone and slid it into his pocket, just as Agent Mirren stepped into the doorway in front of them. I thought I heard something up here, he said. 
You find anything? There was definitely a struggle, Greer said. Lori Robix didn't go easy, that's for sure. No sign of blood from what I can tell. Nero looked around, rolled his eyes, and grumbled. Do you two know anything? The next time you open your mouth, try putting a thought or two behind it first. This whole thing was staged. It's an act designed to make us think the girl was taken by force, when in reality, she's more in league with them than ever. For all we know, she might be part of the Takatron dealer's leadership. Nora blinked, having difficulty believing that Mirren could have really come up with that conclusion. As it turned out, she wasn't alone in her confusion. What about the car bomb that almost killed her? Was that also an act? Mirren didn't take kindly to the question, glaring hard at both of them. Did you ever stop to think about that car bomb, Wexler? Why rig the bomb to arm the remote starter and not the actual ignition of the engine, which would only go off when she had to be in the car? It was a hoax to make it seem like she was in danger. You don't know this because it wasn't necessary for me to share it with you, but we found traces of some of the drugs in the trunk of her car. When you came here the first time to confront Lori Robix, she hit the detonator and blew up her car on purpose in order to destroy the evidence. It bought her enough time to ride out a stay in the hospital until she could vanish for good with her cronies, all under the guise that she had been attacked, Mirren said. Nora's mouth hung open a bit, but not because it was a plausible theory. She had been right there when the car had exploded, and knew in her heart that Lori Robix had every intention of getting behind the steering wheel before it blew up. The girl had no idea the car had been rigged with explosives, and if she had, she must have known it would have brought a ton of scrutiny. What if they wanted the car to explode without her in it, so they could scare her into keeping their information safe? I guess either way, this adds a lot of urgency to tracking them down, Nora said, trying to be judicious about it in the hopes that Miran would lead himself to the truth. There's no either way about it, and this has been an urgent matter from the beginning. Why don't you leave this one to the professionals and give us some space? In my opinion, new agents aren't good for much more than fetching coffee and filling in reports. I'll let you know if I need either of those things done. Mirren said, shaking his head as he stepped out of the doorway and went back downstairs. Between the harebrained theory and the unnecessary insults, Nora suddenly felt much more comfortable with holding Lori Robix's phone. If it helped them track down the dealer's hideout, she'd find a way to shove it in Mirren's face. The search began right as soon as they'd returned to their van. While Greer was driving, Nora took the liberty of searching through the phone and accessing the Talkatron app. Nora breathed a sigh of relief when she saw that the passwords had been auto-filled and she had full access to everything. Scrolling through the messages, she immediately found the ones that the two boys arrested by the DEA had talked about. Addresses were cryptically sent to her from an anonymous user, which she would then hand over after receiving payments from other high schoolers, for what seemed like an astronomical sum. You were right, Nora said, feeling excited and apprehensive at the same time. She was accepting payments for party attendees. What these kids were sending her added up to thousands and thousands of dollars every week, and this has been going on for a while. She must have been forwarding the money straight to the dealers from her phone. Are there records for that? Are the transfers anonymous too? Greer asked turning up the windshield wipers to handle the increasing volume of rain. Nora continued to scroll down and check different items in Lori Robix's history. Yes, there are probably 50 to 100 incoming payments for every one outgoing bulk payment, Nora said, tapping on one. But there's nothing masking the transfers. The account and routing number for every transaction is listed right here, including for the dealers. With this information, We'll be able to find out who is behind the drug ring, shut down the account, and maybe even figure out where they are. It was exciting, and Nora could barely sit still in her seat. Let's hope we can do all that before anything happens to Lori Robix, Greer said. He was smiling that adorable smile he had. Nora nodded as she continued to look through the app. Something struck her, and she pulled up her phone's calculator function. What is it? Greer asked. 
Hold on a sec, Nora replied, trying to concentrate. It took a few minutes to add up the transactions. When it hit her, Nora gasped. What was Lori thinking? What? Travis, there is a big difference between the amount of money Lori Robix received and the amount she sent back to the dealers. How much do you figure her cut was supposed to be? Greer shrugged. I could only guess. A couple hundred bucks a party? Maybe two percent, five percent? Ten at the absolute most. For this one party, there's a difference of several thousand dollars. If she worked it the same way each week, we're talking about tens of thousands skimmed off the top. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? I am, Nora said, staring blankly at the rain hitting the windshield. Greer chuckled. I like this girl a lot more now. It had to take some balls for her to steal from thieves, he said, slapping the steering wheel. Why do people say it takes balls to do something tough? That doesn't make any sense. When you think about it, vaginas have to be really tough, Nora mused. Are you saying you have a tough vagina? Greer asked. Nora could feel her cheeks reddening, but she wasn't about to back down. Wouldn't you like to know? A moment passed in silence. Nora checked the clock while Greer pulled the van into the parking lot. Anyway, I don't have to guess to know that the dealers caught on that Lori was keeping too much of the money for herself. That explains the car bomb, why she tried to run from the hospital, and why she was abducted, Nora went on. Greer glanced over at her in feigned surprise. Wait, so it wasn't all just an act to hide how close they're working together? That Miron guy needs his head screwed on straight, Greer said. They exited the vehicle and headed into the building, immediately getting a few guys together to start digging into the messages and bank transfers. What they found was nothing short of spectacular. The addresses sent to Lori all matched those of the parties. Tracing the smaller transactions gave them insight into everyone who attended, as well as some leads on other people who might be involved in the operation. But the biggest finds were, of course, related to the dealer's account, which belonged to a man named Hector Gonzalez. Information on him wasn't difficult to find because he had a long history of minor offenses related to drug trafficking and petty crime. He'd spent time in prison in three different states. There were suspected connections to murders and organized crime that he'd never answered for. But everything had stopped a few years ago after he was last let out. Looks like Hector wanted to come back and make a splash, Greer said, looking over Nora's shoulder at the screen. Across the floor, they could hear that Agent Mirren had returned from Lila Robix's home. He didn't look happy, sending a cold glare in their direction before storming for the elevators, probably to see Johnson. Nora flipped back to Hector Gonzalez's bank statements. Look at this. They make regular Friday afternoon withdrawals from a local branch and apparently they've already found someone to replace Lori Robix. Another deposit was just sent in today for this weekend's party, Nora noted, her eyes growing large. Good to know they're still in business. This is exactly how we take them down. Come on, it's time to take this upstairs, Greer said. Nora could hardly get out of her chair fast enough, and soon they were standing together alone in the elevator, already feeling so charged. She noticed Greer was looking at her in a way he hadn't before. Nora? Yeah? A ping from the elevator announced they'd reached their destination. Greer blinked and shook his head as he stepped out. Confused, Nora followed him into Johnson's office, where the special agent in charge was having another gab fest with Mirren. What is it? Johnson said. A scowl settled on Mirren's chiseled face. There's something we need to tell you about the Lori Robix kidnapping and the Talkatron dealers, Greer said. Mirren cleared his throat and got up from his seat. We've got that situation taken care of. A nearby security cam picked up the license plate of the vehicle while it was on its way to the Robix's residence. That was news to Nora, who noted the smug look on Mirren's face as he said it. Exactly, Johnson concurred. Once we locate that vehicle and can get the driver to talk, we'll have a good chance of pinpointing where their hideout is. We'll let you know if there's anything we need help with. 
Mirren crossed his arms, practically beaming. I could use some coffee, he said, rubbing it in. Nora had heard enough. With all due respect, sir, we've got something better, she said, pulling out Lori's phone. We were able to locate the victim's phone, which has a full record of transactions she made with the dealers. Not only does it prove that her kidnapping was retribution for pocketing a portion of the profits, it also gave us details about the dealer's bank accounts. You're kidding, Johnson said. The smile dropped from Mirren's face, barely concealed rage taking its place. But he wasn't about to say anything in front of Johnson. What's more, we've already identified the dealer of the drug ring, Hector Gonzalez, and know where they make regular withdrawals from, Nora said. All we have to do is be there when they make the withdrawal tomorrow and follow them back to their hideout. If that's not where they're heading, we can take them in. It's that simple, Greer added. Johnson seemed taken aback. Crossing his arms, he glanced over at Mirren and then returned his attention to Nora and Greer. I don't think there's any point in denying that this does sound promising. Let's put the license plate search on hold and get everybody in position to move following the bank withdrawal. Find out where the hideout is, gather what information you can before moving in safely, and do your best to get that girl out alive, Johnson said. Yes, sir, Marin agreed, giving a curt nod to the boss before abruptly exiting the office. Hey, this is good, Johnson said to Nora. It sounded like a confession. We could use something like this to bag Harrison Shotterham. Nora didn't let Johnson's parting shot dispel her high spirits after leaving the office and returning to the elevator. She saw Greer had the same furtive grin on his face, no doubt enjoying a mental victory lap after pulling the plug on Mirren's power trip. Once the elevator doors closed, they shared a spontaneous high five that sent tingles down her spine. Did you see the look on his face when you told them about the phone? The reason he ran out was that he needed a change of underwear, Greer said. Maybe next time he'll think twice before insulting people he doesn't know, Nora added. It was hard to think of another moment in the FBI that she'd rather revel in, but it came to an end when she glanced at her watch and saw that it was past time she made it over to meet with Danny. They reached the ground floor, but rather than follow Greer to the lot in the back, she went right for the front doors, hoping to catch a cab that would take her to IHOP. He noticed and called back to her in the uncrowded lobby. Hey, hold on a second, he said, waiting until she turned back to face him. Why don't we celebrate with a bite to eat somewhere? He had a raised eyebrow that was nothing short of fetching, and something warm coalesced in her chest, that made her realize how much she would have liked that. A smile came unbidden to her lips, making him perk up even more, with his stubbly cheeks and model-worthy skin. But it was a signal she shouldn't have sent. Actually, I can't, she said, wondering if she was the only woman who'd ever been stupid enough to turn him down. Greer looked at her like the response was a joke. Really? It's not like you know anybody else around here or have been doing anything other than work. Come on, I know a great place where we can let loose a little, he said. I'm meeting someone, she said. That warm feeling had turned to a burning sensation, but he'd pressed her and there was no way but to tell him. Oh, gotcha. It's not going to be weird when I show up later at your place, is it? Nora asked. I guess it depends how late it is. Awkward, Nora thought. Could be a night in the chicken coop. Greer's invitation seemed so casual at first, but there was more going on if they had to wade through these tangled emotions. Why did he have to pick this minute to ask her out? I'll see you later, she said, turning for the doors and exiting the building before it could get any worse. Chapter 23 International House of Pancakes, 950 East Madison Street Nora had found a cab to take her to the restaurant, which seemed to be serving customers at about half capacity. That was probably a high turnout for such a rainy night, but perhaps the town's pension for long stretches of rain meant it didn't influence people's behavior as it did other places. Stepping inside, 
past a few poster-sized ads featuring giant stacks of pancakes and waffles. She momentarily ignored the hostess in order to search the dining room for Danny Polk. Alone at a corner booth sat a slender guy with brown hair that hung over his ears and forehead. Danny wore an unbuttoned dress shirt, exposing a white tee underneath. He was a little geeky, but had never shown the slightest bit of shame about it. From the looks of it, Danny was mixing sugar packets into syrup on a coffee saucer. Smiling at the hostess, Nora passed her by to take a seat opposite Danny at the booth. When he noticed her coming, he looked her over from top to bottom, but gave no other expression. "'Have you been waiting long?' Nora asked, shaking some more of the rain off and settling in. "'What does it matter? We're here now,' he said. Already Nora was having flashbacks to awkward conversations and bizarre, illogical statements that had been common while they were dating. Danny was attractive, smart, and talented, but his ability to empathize always needed work. Still, he came when she called. I need your help, she said, looking into his brown eyes. He nodded and leaned back. There was only one kind of help he could provide. You said that already. What's the problem? We're looking for someone, a killer who's trying to take revenge on a business owner here. He's like a ghost, getting into everything without leaving a trail back to him, Nora said thinking about that feeling of fear she had when he was outside her door at the inn or hearing him come on the line. Shotterham was ruthless and had to be stopped. How good is he? Danny asked. He dragged a spoon around the mixture of sugar and syrup. Good, breaking into accounts for dozens of people, including me. He tapped into our radio channel, assuming other people's identities, knows his way around proxy servers, he also founded a software company in the late 90s. So, not that good, Danny said, scoffing. Only Paul could thumb his nose at someone who had given the FBI's computer crimes unit the runaround. Can you lead us to him? Nora asked. I can, but the question is if you really want me to. What do you mean? Danny looked around at some of the other patrons. A waitress passed them with a tray full of food. You know just as well as I do that you're running the risk of blowing your entire investigation just by talking to me now. Criminals have been let off the hook just because the arresting officer posted that he was feeling mischievous on Facebook. The moment I get involved, if anything comes up in court about the investigation that you can't talk about or explain, your killer will be back on the street Walking around scot-free, Danny said. Nora knew he was right, but she couldn't let Shotterham go on torturing people. Sometimes it took a hacker to catch one. I know, she said. And what do you think's going to happen to you when the big shots at the FBI found out you've been breaking the rules? This could cost you your job, Danny said, smiling in a matter-of-fact way. No, it won't she said. Why not? Because you're not going to break any laws, and you're not even going to catch him yourself. You're going to figure out how, and then tell me so I can do it, she said. Danny puckered his lips in the way he always did when he was thinking. Way to take all the fun out of it for me, he said. I can't guarantee anything, not if I'm basically doing all of the same stuff your other people are doing. But if he surfaces anywhere, I'm probably the only one who would notice. Still, what's in it for me? Nora spent an uncomfortable moment staring at a poster on the wall. I'll tell you what, if you're willing to help out, then the pancakes are on me, she said. Maybe if they were literally on you with plenty of syrup. But come on, you can do better than that, Danny said, cringing with his head to the side. It's not like I can pay you to do this. What about the warm feeling of satisfaction from stopping a killer and saving a life, she said, knowing that would be more than enough for her. If that's what I wanted, I'd become a cop, he said. The way he glanced over at the door made her think she was losing him. She wanted to scream at him and ask him what he wanted, 
but she began to think about what compelled him to drop what he was doing and drive all the way to Seattle. He did it because of her. Nora also recalled that conversation with Greer, after he'd shamelessly flaunted his scorching appearance to coax answers out of Aaron Clausen. When she'd grumbled to him about it, he said it was only a matter of time until she would have to press the same button. As best she could tell, that day had come. She pulled off her jacket and ran her hand through her hair, hoping the effect of stripping in front of him would hit the mark, despite not having anything particularly sexy on underneath. A gentle smile and an even gaze came next, the kind reserved for someone special. She shrugged with straight arms down to accentuate her bust as she pretended to look over a menu. This wasn't the kind of detective work Nora had planned on doing, but she'd be lying if she said she didn't have a knack for it. Can't you do it for me? she asked, looking at him again. Danny paused, his scowl melting in front of her. He made that kissy face again as he thought, but Nora knew it was already a foregone conclusion. I always had a soft spot for you, Nora. Back in college we weren't together for long, but when we were, every other programmer was insanely jealous that I had you. I owe you for that at least. Nora's smile grew into something more effusive. With Danny on board, Harrison Shotterham was about to meet his match. I'd say there were perks of being with you, too. I wouldn't know half of what I do about computers without you. It's one one-thousandth of what you could know, he said, becoming more serious. But tell me about this guy. I don't like the favors I do to drag on forever, when I could be making money. Straightening up and setting her elbows on the table, Nora went through the entire history of what they knew about Shotterham, Iverson's cat Dina, the impersonation of Christopher Walden, the visit to the Rainier Inn, the cabin on Spur 10 Gate Road, the other account intrusions, and the radio channel they'd used at Pike's Market. It's only a matter of time until he feels he's picked away at Jenny Iverson's sense of security enough that it's time to finish her off. We need to bring Shotteram in quickly before he makes another move, she concluded. A few moments passed. Danny dumped another packet of sugar into the saucer. Well, can you get him? she asked when she couldn't wait any longer. Yes, I can get him, he said, nodding. Nora clapped her hands in triumph. Great! Now let's eat some pancakes. Chapter 24 Greer Residence, 5 Southwest 144th Place Day before a big hunt, figured you'd be cleaning your weapons, Travis's father said to him that night. He told his old man about the likelihood of armed conflict after following Gonzales or a henchman back from the bank to the hideout. But instead of preparing his equipment, he was fooling around on the family computer, an old iMac that took nearly a minute to load a single web page. I know that's what I should be doing, but I feel like I have to get up to date on these programs and networks I keep hearing about, he said. He'd looked at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Talkatron, and a few others, and didn't really know where to begin or what to do. You mean you heard about them from Nora, Loretta said, coming in from the dining room table where she had been doing some of her woodworking. Some of the stuff she's doing and talking about, he said, shaking his head. I'm getting left behind. These cases haven't been your typical smash-and-grab operations, he said, wondering if he'd ever be able to get a feel for everything on the web before new sites took their place. Where is she, anyway? Isn't it about time she come home to roost? Loretta added. It wasn't a question Travis was excited to answer. Being brushed off after he'd asked her to dinner left him puzzled and a little dumbstruck. He could have sworn she felt something for him, at least enough to spend a little time together. But then it turned out she was already seeing someone, surely a guy from the way she said it. She's really wrapped up in the cases, he said, staring blankly at the computer screen. Figuring out how he felt about her was another matter. 
She was opening up a whole new field of investigative work to him, and he had to admit it was as exciting and cutting-edge as she'd said when he first met her. One stalker, one unsolved murder, and one tech-savvy drug ring. All of them would have been so much harder to crack without Nora. Was he just impressed, or did he feel like he needed her in his life? Either way, she was so much more than a pretty face. Well, click away on your mouse all you want, Marshall said, settling back into a chair in the living room. Rain or shine, Kent and I are going duck hunting tomorrow up around Padilla Bay. Don't tell me you don't wish you could join us. Soft ripples of the water, light mist around the reeds in the marsh, waterfowl all around, ready to jump on a dinner plate. You know I don't need much to tempt me. I'd really love at least one trip out before I head back east, Travis said, as Kent walked in the room carrying a rifle and wearing camo. We'll be trying out a few new firearms as well. Might also drop by the range, depending on how things are at the bay, Kent declared, full of enthusiasm. Travis's brother had some seizures a while back that kept him out of any active duty. Plus, he wasn't exactly the sharpest tool in the shed. But he still did what he could with the Army Reserve and the County Sheriff's Office. In truth, Travis was glad Kent had been spared the things he'd seen in Iraq and that his father had seen a generation before as an Army Ranger. Brave to the bone, both were excellent shots that Travis trusted with his life. Just be careful. I hear ducks are catching on to hunters and might try to bite you back. Travis joked. Chaw, I'd like to see them try. Anyone that does will get a spot on the grill and a lemon wedge for its trouble, Kent chuckled. As the evening wore on, Travis felt like he was missing out on everything. When Nora showed up shortly before he planned to get to sleep, they hardly said anything. He wasn't sure what she was hiding, but it tipped off his suspicions, and he didn't like it. He had to rely on the promise of making a colossal bust the next day to tide him over. Chapter 25 FBI Offices, Seattle Division Travis arrived at the office with his game face on, ready for whatever the day would bring. Despite an awkward ride over with Nora, during which no one said anything about the night before, he'd had enough practice at keeping the personal stuff out of his line of sight to focus on what he had to do. Getting distracted could cost him his life when the bullets started flying. They arrived at the recon room and took seats next to Angkor, who had taken the liberty of getting them some chai tea for the meeting. It was a nice gesture, especially since he'd be spending the day chewing through Aaron Clausen's case, looking for clues about the murder of Ricardo Lantham. Clausen's fingerprints are all over the storage closet containing the potassium chloride, but so are those of about half a dozen other employees, even Lantham. No unusual prints were found. Unless she hands over the syringe she used to inject the poison, everything is circumstantial, Angkor said. The lack of motive is just as big a problem, Travis whispered, with Wexler nodding alongside. Lantham's sister is a wreck about the whole thing, and who could blame her? She said she didn't think Clausen was right for him, but she admitted she made him happy. We don't know what could have happened to spur her to kill him, she said. The details of that case had to be promptly pushed to the side when Johnson, Mirren, and Agent Amory from the DEA strolled into the front of the room to debrief the group about the day's plans. More than just agents and techs, some of the lab workers and other support staff had also packed into the room. This was going to be a significant operation that required a lot of hands. Johnson immediately handed the floor to Mirren, who looked even more like a Ken doll than usual. We've got a fix on a new point of contact for the Talkatron dealers that we'll be pursuing today, thanks to some new intelligence, Mirren said, failing to thank those who had cultivated the intelligence. Based on past behavior, we have good reason to believe a member of the gang's leadership will make a lunch hour withdrawal from the Bank of America branch at 2555 Beacon Avenue South. If you look here on the monitor, we've already procured surveillance footage from prior visits of a man in his early 20s who has access to Hector Gonzalez's account. We've yet to ID him, 
but we do have the expectation that his exit path will take him north and onto I-5. Please turn your attention to this street map. In addition to placing someone inside the bank with eyes on the ATM and drone support, we'll have a trio of unmarked vehicles in the area, here, here, and here. One will get onto I-5 ahead of the mark, while the other two will follow from behind. If the mark reveals the location of the dealer's hideout, we want to be able to have the option to move in immediately, should that prove the most compelling possibility, Mirren explained. The way a subtle grin momentarily flashed at the end left Travis 100% positive that Mirren would lead a strike into the hideout, regardless of the situation. Brash and eager for glory were not qualities that went well together. What about Lori Robicks? Wexler asked, drawing a stern glare from Mirren. Travis could just imagine Lila Robicks smacking him in the face for being so wrong about her daughter. The question of whether Robicks is complicit in the operation, or a captive, is a topic of debate that won't be settled until we find out what's going on inside the hideout. What we know so far is that Robicks willingly abetted the scheme by laundering funds for the dealers. Those infractions can't just be forgotten about. But she left her phone for us to find so we could uncover their accounts, Wexler argued. Agent, Mirren said sternly, there's an equally strong possibility that the abduction was staged and that the phone was left on purpose to set a trap for us. The funds in the bank account are not commensurate with what you'd expect to find financing a prescription drug ring generating revenue in the millions. We have to be prepared for every scenario. That prudent platitude and a quick nod to the boss was enough to get Johnson to clear his throat and step in. Quite right. One way or another, this operation will come to a screeching halt today. We'll be freezing the account once the withdrawal is made, but we'll also be shutting down the retail facade, as Agent Amory will tell us, Johnson said. Thank you, Amory said, with an easy smile that hid any sense of discomfort from the preceding disagreement. Let me say first that the DEA is thrilled to be working with the FBI on this mission to keep Washington State and its teens free of illicit drugs. Your work exposing the inner workings of the Takatron Dealers criminal organization has been invaluable. Now that we have a complete list of frequent party attendees, as well as knowledge about how those parties are created and stocked, we'll be locking this next one down before it even gets started. That means we'll be intercepting students as soon as they know the party location, obstructing the drug deliveries, and taking anyone involved in for questioning. By the time tomorrow rolls around, everyone will know that these buffet-style drug events are a thing of the past. The meeting covered a few more details about the operation before everyone was let out to get ready for the coming operation. On the way downstairs to get suited up, Wexler got a call on her phone that Travis happened to recognize as an Oregon number. She clicked it off and put it back in her pocket. What was that? Who knows? I'll let it go to voicemail. The plan for Travis and Wexler was that they would be in one of the follow cars with a couple of DEA guys. Mirren would be running the sting from another vehicle over a communications channel, which they'd been assured wouldn't see any unwanted intrusions. They'd be decked out in bulletproof Kevlar vests and armed with AK-47s and Glocks. For missions like this, Travis liked to have a Schrade BT-01 survival knife tucked against the side of his thigh, in case the fighting got personal. That kind of thing had come in handy more times than he cared to remember. When Travis and Wexler entered the supply locker to get suited up, he noticed her fidgeting with her bootlaces. This was different than going into a cabin that might have had a lone occupant. Odds were, they'd be facing down a large group of armed thugs who had no qualms with killing law enforcement agents who got in their way. It took mental fortitude that only came with experience to overcome the pressure. Has your aim gotten any better? Travis asked, trying to diffuse her nerves. She picked up her Glock and pushed a magazine through the handle. No but with enough shots, I am liable to hit something. You'll do fine. Just remember the drills back at Quantico. Keep your head down, wait for your opportunity, 
and make every shot count. When it came time to move out, the team descended to the ground floor and the car lot, where a trio of sedans of different makes and models sat in the center of the pavement. A handful of DEA agents accompanied them, some decked out in SWAT gear and some with plain clothes over their vests. Mirren led the group out into the rain, which had lightened some, before holding the FBI agents up and allowing Amory to get some distance. When Mirren looked them over, it was like he found it a personal affront that they were with him. I'm going to make this quick. No one screws up today, you understand me? No mistakes from anyone, he said, glancing at Travis and Wexler. I don't care if you're an out-of-towner or a rookie who's never pulled a trigger before. If I see or hear anything to indicate that you've compromised the success of this mission, I'll make sure it means the end of your careers. Travis fought back the urge to smack him in the face for his distrusting pep talk. When he and Wexler hopped in the back of the old Honda Civic, after the agent stored the larger weapons and equipment in the trunks, Travis felt the need to subtly shake his head at her about it. That kind of attitude wasn't about anything other than Mirren's ego, and it needed much stronger condemnation than they had time for. Amory was at the wheel, driving them down to the Bank of America on an unusually gloomy Friday. They ran through some radio checks and got caught up with the techs in the recon room, who were controlling the drones and keeping an eye out around the bank. They came around to the front of it from the south side, parking over a block away where the bank's entrance was barely visible. Mirren's vehicle came to a halt in a CVS parking lot, closer to the bank but across the street. The third vehicle dropped off one man to enter the bank and then went on ahead to get into position out of sight toward the on-ramp for I-5. Travis checked his watch and found it was a few minutes after noon. Amory leaned back in his seat in front of Travis and rolled his head to get a better look out of the side mirror. The table is set. Come and get it, he said. The agent in the front passenger seat shifted the rear-view mirror to get a better look at the road behind them. His name was Barry Ethan, and he wore a puffy jacket over his Kevlar and had dark circles under his eyes. Show me a red 2003 Ford Thunderbird, Ethan said, when the hum of a vehicle behind them arose. He shook his head when it turned out to be an SUV. I used to have a Thunderbird back in the 90s. I slaved away at a pizza oven for over a year during high school to get it, but the way that car turned heads made it worth it 100 times over. I think I'd worn out the seat cushions by graduation, if you know what I mean. Let's cut the chatter and leave the tall tales for another time. He should be coming any minute, Johnson said over the comm. That actually happened, Ethan insisted. I'm telling you, I was knee-deep in... Nobody cares what you did in high school, Mirren said, for once sounding sensible. But I was a legend. I played third base, but never got stuck there. The incredulous look Travis got from Wexler made him uncomfortable. Hearing about the sexual exploits of team members during their teens wasn't making her feel included in the operation. Listen to Johnson and everybody give it a rest, Travis said. He wondered for a moment if Mirren would snap back at him, but thankfully silence pervaded the line for the next ten minutes. Travis started to feel antsy when they'd eclipsed the time the withdrawals had previously been made. Anything from the air? Mirren asked, sounding frustrated. The response that came back from the command room was a negative. Do you think they caught wind we were onto them? Johnson asked. The entire operation suddenly seemed at risk of being all for nothing. I don't see how, Nora answered. Nothing was done to the account that could have tipped them off. There's no way they could know. Travis looked out the window at the rain splattering against the street. He wondered about Lori Robix, whose life depended on being recovered as soon as possible. It had already been almost 24 hours since her abduction. If they wanted to kill her, or worse, they would have had ample time to do it. Here we go. The voice of one of the techs back at control was music to their ears. Nobody had a clue why the crony had shown up to make the withdrawal a half hour late but the wait had only amped up the tension for Travis, who was ready to get the operation underway. A red Thunderbird with a single occupant 
cruised by and swung into an open parking space near the front of the bank. Everyone in Travis's car craned their necks to see a man in a sleek black rain jacket with a hood up skulk into the bank's entryway to visit the ATM. We've got a match on the license plate. This car is registered in Hector Gonzalez's name, Johnson said. That's clutch, Mirren said, sounding exultant. Between the car, the account, and the deposits coming from the app, they'd have no trouble tying him to the entire operation. Once they got him in custody, they'd bury him in charges. Any eyes on the driver? Johnson asked. A response from the agent inside the bank came a moment later. Light skin, lanky, and it looks like there's a tattoo on the back of his left hand, the agent said. Not Gonzalez, Marin said, stating the obvious. We've got a ping from the account. He's made the transaction, another voice added. Target is now exiting the building, the agent inside the bank said. Amory glanced at Ethan and looked over his shoulder at Travis and Wexler. Let's get ready to ride, he said, grinning. He started the vehicle, shifted it into gear, and turned the wheel in preparation of pulling out onto the road. Already Mirren's car was in motion across the street in the parking lot. Travis peered through the window at the man in the black rain jacket, stepping into the road and pulling open the door to the Thunderbird. As best he could tell, the man didn't so much as look around, quickly climbing into the car and jerking it onto Beacon Avenue headed north. Lead car, you're a go, Johnson said, and they heard a moment later that the frontrunners had made it onto I-5. Amory pulled onto the street, cruising a comfortable distance behind the Thunderbird. Mirren's car was nearby in the next lane over. Let's sit tight and see where he takes us, Amory said. Travis was used to the anticipation of it, but he noticed Wexler tapping her toes against the floor. She also had her hand on her gun. It was unlikely the target would catch on and the drive would evolve into a chase, bullets flying back and forth. But anything was possible. The follow cars continued their clandestine pursuit of the Red Thunderbird up the ramp and onto I-5. A few rays of sunlight peeked through the gaps in the clouds, illuminating the downtown skyscrapers here and shining off of the sound. The drive took them past the Space Needle and the north end of town. Seattle was an undeniably gorgeous city. Where do you think they're going? Wexler asked once the city was behind them and the increasingly rural region running alongside the sound awaited ahead. Didn't those two boys take that stolen vehicle up here during the chase? Travis recalled. The two DEA agents in the front seat exchanged a glance. They did and made it all the way to Mount Vernon before we stopped them. It seemed like they were running for the border, especially after they swore they didn't know where any of the leaders were camped. But we might have to ask them a few more questions, depending on where this fellow goes, Amory said. He tapped his thumbs against the top of the steering wheel in an agitated manner. The procession continued along the highway, everyone keeping in radio contact and maintaining a healthy distance from their mark. They passed through Everett and Marysville, past dilapidated shacks and run-down gas stations along the side of the road. Everyone was wondering how far out this guy was going to drive. Any chance we're being led on a wild goose chase? Mirren posed. What if this is a distraction for something going on in town? The tantalizing possibility of a trick must have been eating away at his confidence. Stay on him, Johnson ordered. We're keeping eyes from above. When they passed the point close to Mount Vernon where the car chase had ended, it really felt like they were venturing into uncharted territory. But it wasn't much longer before the sleepy drive kicked into a higher gear. Look at that! He just turned left onto Route 20 and ran a red light, Amory said, as they came to a halt near the turn. The lead car had gone on too far and needed to turn around. Hang back out of sight, Johnson called. Slowly proceed east on Route 20. We'll tell you where he's headed. Travis happened to look through his window when he noticed Mirren peering back at him from the other car. Amory dropped back and let the others take the lead, as they meandered along the winding road leading away from Burlington. You think they're out on one of the islands? Ethan asked. 
Amory craned his neck and scoped out the nearby grassland stretching out toward the water. I hope not. If he's able to quickly hop on a boat, then taking him in may be too much to ask for, Amory said. Another possibility is that they're holed up somewhere near Deception Pass State Park, Travis said, recalling where Route 20 led. They continued on for a few more minutes alongside bits of marshland and elegant but dense forest. Up ahead, they were coming to a narrow point at the bottom of the bay that formed a basin. They took a ride off 20 onto what appears to be an unmarked dirt access road, two miles ahead of your location, one of the techs said over the line. Any idea where he's heading for? Mirren asked. Travis tried to remember the coast along this area, but couldn't recall any other modes of transportation coming through here. This long chase was coming to a quick end. It looks like there's an old abandoned marina at the end of the road against the water. No boats, but we can see about a dozen cars. Either those are the stolen cars they're using to transport the drugs, or a whole lot of people are hanging out inside. Other than the driver, we don't see anyone else moving around outside, Johnson explained. The three vehicles reached the dirt road and came to a halt, and everyone stepped out to survey the area. From Route 20, their view of the marina was obstructed by trees and deep brush. What's the plan? Amory asked. Travis found it unfortunate the question was directed at Mirren, who put his hands on his hips and sighed. The rain drizzled through his short blonde hair onto his face. After tonight's party gets busted, we'll never have as good a shot at getting them all together in one place. We've got to at least move in enough to get a look at the place. Agreed? Travis nodded reluctantly. There was something that made him apprehensive, but he couldn't quite put his finger on it. With a dozen agents spread out along the perimeter, taking the marina didn't seem like it would be too great a feat. In case they needed to make a quick getaway, the vehicles proceeded backward down the dirt road and then fanned out a comfortable distance from the marina in a small clearing. When it came time to get out and stake positions in the muck and tall grass, Travis patted Wexler on the shoulder. You're as much an agent as any of us, he said. Thanks. I've got your back, she said with confidence to spare. The incessant rain made the ground soft and squishy. Travis had difficulty taking a single step without making a racket or getting stuck, but eventually he made it to the edge of brush and cast a long look at the ancient marina in front of them. The light blue paint was chipping away, and only some of the windows still had glass panes in them. Large cardboard boxes piled up on the side deck may well have been stockpiles of stolen drugs. Anyone see any activity inside? Eyes on Robix? Mirren asked. Looks dark and vacant from my position, Ethan answered, their whispers coming in softly through Travis's earpiece. We know there's at least one bogey in there, maybe more, and the last thing we want is for them to be able to fortify a position inside, with us out here hiding behind sticks and straw. I've got eyes on four entry points, including that empty window in the southeastern corner. On my mark, let's have the foursome from Amory's car get in there. Move in. Now that it was time for business, Travis put all thoughts about if Mirren was purposefully putting him in harm's way out of his mind. Keeping the squeaking of his boots to a minimum, he stepped out into the open and signaled that he was moving for the side door. Glock held tight in his hands. He moved in while the others flanked him on the right. He made it about a dozen steps before he heard rumbling in front of him and froze. Before he could even look for cover, the door in front of him popped open to reveal the driver in the black rain jacket. He had a pistol in his hand that he raised in surprise at Travis, who saw that a shot was coming and dove left to the ground. The bullet came almost as close to his ear as the sound of the gunshot, whizzing past in no more than a heartbeat. He hit the ground hard and struggled to aim at the man in the doorway in front of him, but another shot rang out that struck the target square in the chest and knocked him back against the cracked door, which crumbled into pieces. Still stunned by how fast it had all happened, Travis jerked his head left to see Wexler holding the gun straight out in front of her. She kept a firm stance with one knee against the ground, as if she couldn't believe it herself. 
For all Travis knew, she'd just saved his life. All units move in, Mirren called. The rest of the team emerged from the bushes and raced for all sides of the marina. Travis got onto his elbow and began to get up when he found Wexler suddenly at his side standing over him. You need a hand? she asked, extending one. He slapped his palm against hers and took the support. That was quite a shot, Travis said, taking a deep breath. No more cracks about my aim, okay? You got it. Now come on, he said, breaking into a jog for the open door in front of him. If anyone had been inside, the gunshots would have drawn them out. But instead, they swarmed the large boathouse and found it empty of human life. Creaky floorboards along the back deck, the sound of federal agents sliding in through the windows, and commands as they scoured the premises were the only things they heard as they made it into the dark structure. Just inside, they found the driver had fallen onto the dusty wooden floor. Travis checked for a pulse and found none. He's gone, he said, as Amory swiftly crept past through the marina's expansive main compartment. Flashlight beams crisscrossed the area, shedding light onto a sea dew that had seen better days, clunking against a berth. Across from the entrance Travis had used, a door had been left wide open even before any of the agents entered and was swaying in the wind. Travis and Wexler got in behind Ethan and Amory as they ascended a staircase and searched through the second floor. They found sleeping pads, empty bottles of expensive booze, and garbage from food packaging pushed into a corner. Look at this, Wexler said, drawing them to a magnificent old grandfather clock in the corner with a door to the pendulum case hanging open. The pendulum had been torn out and in its place was a rifle leaning against the side. Travis peeked his head in and shined his light at the bottom of the compartment. They've been using this as a gun case. Probably had several of these in here, maybe some semi-automatics, he said. But they're gone now. But where were they? In the area, they found empty boxes of ammo and clips mixed in with comic books and DVDs they'd been watching on a TV right next to the sink. After opening a few doors to adjacent rooms, including a truly odious bathroom that had been heavily used, despite non-functioning plumbing, they'd effectively finished searching the marina. All clear up here, Amory said, leading the way back downstairs to the main room, where Mirren and the other agents were waiting. They definitely made this their base of operations, Mirren concluded. But if they're not here, where are they? It looks like a considerable amount of firepower and ammunition are missing from storage areas on the second floor, Travis said. They continued to scan the dusty room, flipping open the compartments on the boat and coolers full of cash hidden under the stairs. Old furniture and bits of torn rope were scattered around the center of the room. The DEA agents were particularly interested in the boxes on the deck, which they popped open to find millions of dollars worth of prescription drugs. This stockpile could have kept them in business for more than a year, Amory said, sighing as he dropped a bag full of pills back in the box. This is packaging right out of the manufacturing plant as well, where they must have been stealing these from. Maybe they've got a trucker at the plant working with them. We'll be able to trace it, but at least we know it's not all being stolen from patients or sold by a crooked doctor. An anticlimactic feeling overcame Travis. He found it so odd that the driver had returned to an empty house. He remembered Mirren suggesting it was a diversion, which seemed ridiculous, but considering the rest of the dealers and a stockpile of guns were out there somewhere, he began to dread hearing about a nasty flare-up happening back in the city. Walking around the back deck to the northeastern side of the building, where the door had been hanging open, he happened to take a long, admiring glance at the bay, with its craggy rocks, murky wetlands, and thick brush. His line of sight lowered until he was looking at the stretch of ground leading from the side of the marina to the wetlands, where probably ten sets of footprints were visible in the mud. Travis smiled. I think I know where the party went, Travis said, but he wasn't the only one who had stumbled upon something. Lori Robix was here. Wexler announced over the line, drawing Travis back inside. She was kneeling beside the wooden chair in the center of the room, 
near the torn bits of rope. You can see some of her black curly hair here and some blood splattered against the wall. She was tied to this chair and beaten, but the chair had a jagged edge she used to cut through the old rope and escape. Mirren stood over the scene, shaking his head. Or they beat her to death and cut her loose so they could dispose of the body somewhere, he said. If she is still alive, where could she have gone? I can answer that, Travis spoke up. Come out here and look at all of the footprints leading into the marsh. It doesn't take ten men to dispose of a body, and it wouldn't require them to all carry heavy artillery. Lori Robix found a chance to get away and made it into the marsh, and the entire gang is going after her. The agents leaned against the deck's railing, peering as far as they could see out into the rugged terrain. Travis noticed a couple of ducks paddling around in the water. If Robix is still alive and the gang is leaving themselves open in pursuit of her, we've got to take this chance to stop them. Let's move into the marsh and engage, Mirren said. We're sending back up immediately, Johnson said over the line. Travis had a terrible feeling that had nothing to do with asking for a firefight out in the wetlands. Amory, can you jog my memory and remind me the name of the bay here? We're looking at Padilla Bay. Travis clenched his teeth and fists. I thought so. My father and brother are out there, hunting for waterfowl, he said, drawing a few apprehensive looks from the other agents. Between a dozen agents, a dozen drug dealers, a pair of hunters, all armed to the teeth and completely unaware of each other's locations, and one injured young woman, it would take a miracle for it not to go disastrously wrong. Chapter 26 The Dilla Bay Marsh As the group of DEA and FBI agents started out for the expansive marsh area running along the side of the bay, Nora felt strongly that she did not want to let Greer down. For some reason, the possibility of disappointing him burned within her, possibly because he was so poised and confident. No matter what they technically were, he was her partner, and she was determined to pull her weight. And for the most part, so far she'd had plenty of reason to be pleased with how it had gone. She'd personally taken out the single assailant they'd encountered, and immediately afterward made the discovery about Robix that set them on their present course, boosting her confidence. But Nora admitted to herself that she'd hesitated when that door had burst open and the cloaked man behind it had appeared. For an instant, she'd assumed that someone else would get him, and it had almost cost Greer his life. Next time, there could be no hesitation. Greer, we've put in calls to your brother's cell phone, but he's not picking up. We don't know where they are and have no way to reach them, Johnson said over the line. I'm sure Kent left it in the truck to make sure nothing disturbed the ducks, Greer grumbled a short distance to Nora's left. Up ahead, the trees swayed as the rainy breeze came in off the bay. The uneven terrain, deep brush, and sloppy muck everywhere were all so inhospitable. Nora took a step and her foot sank into the mud up to her ankle. Gritting her teeth, she pulled herself out and pushed on. The footsteps that had led them toward the bay had split off in different directions, and there were no signs of blood or clothing from Lori Robix. At least they didn't hear sounds of gunfire in the distance. What do you think, Greer? Would you trade the desert in Iraq for this? Amory asked in hushed tones from somewhere off to the right. Already the agents were starting to fan out to cover more of the marsh. Nothing's worse than the desert, being exposed from every direction. I'll never go back, he said. Let's keep it mum unless we spot someone, Mirren said. For Nora, every step forward brought a dramatic shift in the terrain that made it hard to cover all of the angles. Each tree had to be examined, each mound crept around, with the assumption that someone was hiding right on the opposite side. Her hands were getting clammy, and she knew they'd go on until the shooting erupted all at once in a chaotic firefight that would leave her with little control. The silence was the most uncomfortable part, even more so than the water inside of her boot. She couldn't understand how so many people could be out here without any of them making any sounds. 
the thick grass and reeds ahead danced in the wind as freely as if they had the planet to themselves. Ten o'clock, Ethan said, drawing them on and to the left, closer to the water's edge. Nora tiptoed as silently as she could, having no idea what Ethan had seen. Tucked in among the brush was a squat hunting blind made up of rotten wooden boards. Greer crouched down near an opening. Nobody's been here for ages. Let's move on, he said, dampening their spirits. They were far enough out into the marsh that conceivably the entire gang of dealers could sneak around them to the far right without getting noticed. If they did somehow make it back to the marina in the distance, it would be up to the backup Johnson had sent to take care of them. A rocky slope that curved deeper into the marsh waited ahead. The top must have offered an excellent vantage point, but it also would have invited anyone with a gun to use it as a target. Mirren and a few others moved along the slope, while Nora's group continued closer to the bay. Somewhere in between, the brush shifted suspiciously. Another step forward revealed a flash of red clothing and then a black barrel pointing toward the right. In the bush, put your hands up, Ethan shouted, moving in that direction. The man inside got off an errant shot at the agents against the rock slope before Mirren took him out and quickly called for everyone to hold before they created more of a racket. Mirren and a few others raced over to see whom they'd found. Looks like this one's for me, Mirren gloated. Let's keep our guard up and continue the sweep. But the blood-curdling scream of a young woman in the distance encouraged a change of plans. Suddenly they were racing in a northeasterly direction, where the scream had come from. Several gunshots and other clatter followed, leaving Nora mortified about what had taken place nearby, but just out of reach. They were running at full speed through the mud toward the conflict zone. It seemed like a group of dealers had pinned Robix down among a few boulders and were moving in. I count at least five. Stay sharp and take cover, Amory said, sounding out of breath. Greer, Nora called, when she saw the thick trunk of a fallen tree in her path ahead. He swerved right to join her, as did Ethan and another agent, all of whom slid for cover as the other half of their force came to a mound jutting up beside a section of swamp. Federal agents, put your weapons down, Mirren called, leaning against the earth with his gun pointed at the men in the glade beyond. They immediately started firing, forcing him to duck for cover and let the other agents take their shots. Greer staked out a position near the fallen tree's roots, while Nora peeked above the edge to see their targets crouched in thickets or running for cover. They were shouting, calling for help from the others, who could have been anywhere in the area. Nora and the other agents beside her began firing, but the thump of bullets against the tree forced them to duck back down. The thuds were right in front of Nora, who found herself extremely appreciative of the tree's density. Nora was sure she'd missed, but someone else had connected with a shot and caused one man to holler in agony. The man continued to fire at them and even left his cover until another shot took him out completely. Another one went down shortly after, when he tried to swing wide and take on the agents from the side. We're stuck with this water in front of us, Mirren said. Can one of you get over to Robix's position? They're burning through a lot of ammo. We might just be able to wait them out, Ethan said. The remaining dealers had found enough cover to allow them to fire back with relative safety. They were farther away than when they had started, leaving Robix in the middle but off to the side. Best Nora could tell, she'd wisely ducked down and kept quiet, but waiting too long could be a problem if she needed medical attention. Can somebody get me an update on Robix? Johnson called over the line. I can't see her. My view's blocked, Nora said. The drones are showing a few more figures moving to your location from farther to the northeast, Johnson continued. That's going to compromise our position, Mirren grumbled. What's the ETA on the backup? You're way out there, Johnson said. I don't advise waiting for them. All right, listen to this, Nora said, crouching near the tangled branches of the tree's top. I can get over to her if you can cover me. Once I'm there, we'll be able to shift and be in better position for an attack from the northeast. 
On one level, she couldn't believe she was volunteering to take on so much risk herself, but she knew it was the right move to make, and she was the one in position to do it. Nora looked sidelong at Greer, who nodded cautiously. You got it. One, two, three, go, Mirren called. The shots rang loud in Nora's ears as she got up and scrambled among the tree branches and exploded through a wall of leaves in a dead run for the craggy area concealing Lori Robix. More shots volleyed back and forth, and Nora was sure some of them were intended for her. The boulder in front of her looked something like a giant egg, a place where she'd be safe if only she could get to it. Coming around a little farther, she saw Robix nestled in a depression behind the boulders. Her eyes widened when she saw Nora hightailing it toward her. After a leap over a narrow ditch, Nora hit the side of the rock and spun closer to the hole. She kneeled next to Robix, taking a few breaths to recover. You found it? Robix asked, her dark skin smeared with mud. The dried blood on her face, which had a few deep bruises and cuts on it, was more horrible to Nora than anything else she'd seen. Your phone? We did. That's what brought us here. We're going to get you out, Nora said. A faint smile emerged on the girl's lips, more than was warranted, considering they were still in an intense firefight. Drawing her gun, Nora went to the northernmost edge of the boulder chain, where she was able to get a clear view at one of the dealers firing back at the fallen tree. She took a shot at him, which hit his shin and forced him to stagger away from his cover. Another agent immediately finished him off. By Nora's count, the opposition had dwindled to two, one of whom went down after a shot to the head. All shooting ceased as the last remaining member of the group remained tucked behind an overturned rowboat that happened to be abandoned there. Put your weapon down and come out with your hands up, Mirren ordered. It looked like the worst was over, but Nora wouldn't be relieved until they were back in the cars headed to Seattle. He's not coming out, Ethan noted. You've still got a couple more approaching from the northeast, Johnson informed them. Come out now, Mirren demanded again, but got no response. Nora wasn't in good position to see what he was doing behind the boat, which was about twenty paces away from the edge of the swamp. Robix was sniffling and shivering, and Nora didn't want to leave her. We've got him pinned down, but someone's going to have to move in and take him before his buddies give him a second chance to fight. Amory said. It was a dangerous situation. We're stuck here with the swamp in the way. Going around would take too long and give him a clear shot at us, Mirren said. Ethan and I will do it, Greer said, making Nora bite her lip. Ethan, flank me on the left. We're going in. From her vantage point, she could see them creep over the fallen tree and continue down a short slope to the glade beside the murky swamp. There were about a dozen guns pointed at the silver steel exterior of the rowboat as Greer and Ethan took deliberate, silent strides forward. Nora dared to peek a little further around the rock and got a better glimpse of Mirren and the others perched on top of the mound, the other side of which dropped into the swamp. She wondered if any of the men they'd killed included Hector Gonzalez, who was not likely to let himself be taken alive. As Greer and Ethan crossed in front of her field of vision, Nora noticed something shifting behind them in the back of the swamp against the mound's edge. It looked like a piece of bark until she realized it had a nose just above the water level. Two eyes opened, and she put together that the figure held a gun a short distance away. Her heart nearly stopped. Travis, look out! she shouted. Three shots were fired one after another. Pop, pop, pop. With Travis and Ethan right in the way, it was impossible for her to return fire, and one of the shots ricocheted against the boulder in front of Nora, forcing her to take cover. The groan that echoed over the radio was heart-wrenching. Ethan scrambled toward the brush where the other men had been hiding. I'm hit, Greer said, shuddering as he lurched onto the ground. The figure in the swamp emerged from the water with the barrel of his gun pointing right at Greer, who was now completely exposed. Some sort of rage swelled within Nora, compelling her to step out from behind the boulder to try to take on the shooter. With everyone else stuck behind the mound or the tree, it was up to her. Nora held her arms straight and took aim, 
when the loud crack of a rifle shot hit her ears. The man in the swamp was struck dead center in the chest, pushing him back against the mound until he slid into the water. She hadn't fired a shot and didn't know what was going on. Suddenly, the man behind the rowboat stood up and pointed his gun somewhere toward the northeast, but he was barely able to raise his barrel before he, too, received a single shot to the chest. Two men in camo jackets emerged from the brush, and Nora instantly recognized them as Marshall and Kent Greer. Hold your fire, Nora said. It's his family. The area is secure, Johnson said which was more than enough reason for Nora to break cover and move for Greer's location in the center of the glade, where he was lurched on his side and straining. She kneeled beside him, looking at the pained expression marring his face. He got me in the arm, Greer said. He took deep breaths and wisely avoided glancing at the blood dribbling out of him. Suddenly the entire crew, the two hunters, and Lori Robix were crowding around, everyone trying to help wrap the wound. It didn't look good, but it could have been a lot worse. You'll be fine, but we don't want to waste any time having this looked at, Amory said. Can't believe I went through two tours in Iraq unscathed, only for some goon hiding in a swamp to get me, Greer said. I'm just glad you're going to be okay, Nora said, trying not to sound too emotional about it. Nora and a few others went on to inspect the half-submerged body. The man was filthy, but identifiable. That's Gonzalez, no doubt about it, Mirren said. It's safe to say that this operation is fully kaput. The backup arrived just in time to assist with a swift evacuation, and soon Nora was riding with the Greers in the back of a van, headed toward the medical center in Seattle. You two couldn't have bagged that duck a little earlier? Travis asked, goading the others. Kent scratched his beard and shrugged. You were the ones saying the ducks were starting to fight back, but you didn't say anything about them having guns, Marshall said. He was concerned about his son, but still managed a little irreverence. Why didn't you guys just hang back at the marina and let us wipe them all out? We would have gotten it done twice as fast, and you wouldn't have a bullet lodged in your bicep. Travis turned to Nora, rolling his eyes. I'm sure by now you're aware that the Greers are known the world over for their modesty, he said. But she was just so euphoric that everything had worked out passably. You'll probably think twice about taking their company for granted when you're being cared for by the attentive and affectionate Wendy, Nora said, smirking at the horror-stricken look on his face. Get me my gun. Chapter 27 UW Medical Center Loretta Greer arrived at the hospital shortly before her son was scheduled to have the bullet removed. Travis's father and brother hadn't left his side since they'd returned from Padilla Bay, but Nora had only rejoined them a little earlier, after taking care of some final business relating to the day's events. It seemed like everyone was in a calm state of being until Loretta burst through the door, with her hair still in curlers and an apron covered in splattered blood. What on earth happened to my boy? She cried, shuffling toward the bed and the rest of the group. Someone had given Travis a laptop to use, and when he looked up from the screen, his face bore a mixture of alarm and embarrassment. We went after a group of drug dealers near the bay, and one of them got me in the arm, he said, groaning. Loretta put her hands on her generous hips. No, I know that. I can't wrap my head around how a dozen agents would get in a gunfight and my oldest son would be the only one who gets shot, she said. Travis cleared his throat and cast pleading glances at his brother. I was moving in on what we thought was the last of them when it turned out the leader was hiding just on the other side of our cover in a swamp. He got me as I went past, Travis explained. Breaking down into tears, Loretta shook her head. But you know better than that, Trav. Don't you remember the children's story I used to tell you when you were kids? Travis looked down in regret, nodding. Always cover your six. That's right. I've taught you since you boys were too short to see above the kitchen table to watch your back at all times. You're lucky it wasn't worse, she scolded him. I don't know how I forgot, Travis said momentary lapse in judgment. 
Fortunately, Dad and Kent were there to take him out before he could fire off another shot at me. Another second, and I swear I would have had him, Nora said, still kicking herself or hesitating. She had to get over that before the price she paid for it was measured in lives. Hey, stop that, Travis urged her. You'd already saved my life once today. Twice would just be greedy. Nora smiled as she let the compliment sink in. She ran her hand through her hair, trying to be nonchalant about it. I just happened to be in the right position. Anybody would have done the same. But really, you were a champ all the way through. Mirren might have been barking the orders, but you were the one taking the lead. I think everybody was impressed, he said. It was so nice to hear that she had no chance of hiding its effect on her. Nurse Wendy entered the room to do a little bit of prep work before Travis's procedure. While shooting Nora a hostile look, the young nurse with the bleach blonde hair took Travis's blood pressure and drew a little blood for tests, and all the while he tried to pretend to be distracted by typing on a laptop. What are you doing on that computer now? Marshall asked, leaning back in dismay from one of the chairs in the room. I was just reading a little bit about some of the data-driven techniques law enforcement officers are using to catch criminals. It seems like almost any kind of behavior can be monitored and tracked with the right system in place, Travis said. This was like music to Nora's ears, but the rest of his family looked at him like he'd sprouted a new head. I don't know how to say this, but there's something about this woman that's really rubbed off on you, Loretta said, sending a gentle smile Nora's way. Wendy abruptly exited the room. Well, I'm not sure about that, Travis quibbled. He's right, Nora spoke up before anyone had too much time to think about who'd rubbed off on whom. There was a murder in Charleston I read about, where they traced a killer to a certain hotel and were able to track him down by figuring out who had used their key cards to open a door at the exact time the suspect could have returned there from the murder. That one bit of evidence can make an entire case. They spent a few more minutes chatting before Wendy boldly interrupted them to say it was time for Travis to go in for his procedure. Careful of his arm, he gave hugs to everyone, including Nora, and offered a quick salute before stepping into the hall. It does mean a lot that you all have come by, but getting a bullet out really isn't anything to worry about. I'll be patched up, bandaged, and as good as new in no time, I promise, he said. He looked weary and in some pain, but the grit and determination that Nora had come to know so well still shone through. After he was off, Nora grabbed her bag and prepared to leave. She still had to return that call from Danny Polk, who was probably livid that she hadn't gotten a hold of him by now. No need to run off, Loretta said, after Nora had taken a few steps. You're welcome to grab a late dinner with us and get cleaned up at home. It looks like Trav will be spending at least the night here, but that doesn't mean we wouldn't still love to have you stay with us. Nora mustered a rueful smile as she looked at the Greers. They were vastly different from her family, but the love they had for each other was unmistakable. That's so incredibly kind of you to offer, but I really have a few more things I need to take care of before I can call it a day. Letting me stay with you has been more generous than anything I could have asked for, and I hope you don't find it disrespectful that I keep coming back late. It's work, you know. Loretta nodded reluctantly. I hope I didn't make you uncomfortable when I said you might have rubbed off on Trav. He's just never given a fig about computers before. No, it's completely fine. That's the great thing about being in the FBI with so many talented professionals with different skill sets. You get exposed to new things. Travis has given me a broader view of what this kind of investigative work is all about, something I never could have learned in a classroom. Nora waved and took another step back for the doorway before another voice halted her. This time it was Kent in the corner, who still had a fair amount of mud smeared into his beard. Do you like him like you want to go on a date with him? Kent, Marshall snapped, but watched Nora carefully all the same. Um, that's a good question, she said, wondering if she was really going to explore her feelings and verbalize them on the fly with his entire family right there. She couldn't have said what made her keep talking. There are some people in life who sort of stand out from the crowd. 
and I think I knew immediately that Travis would be one of those people for me. I respect and admire him, no question about it, but what form those feelings take really isn't up to me. We have an important job to do, and to be honest, there are some people around who aren't exactly confident in my abilities. I wouldn't want to put him in a position where he shared the burden of my faults. It was a flimsy excuse. Putting it all on her job is the reason they couldn't be together, and she could tell they all knew it. Oh, Nora, Loretta said, but even hearing that much disappointment was too much to bear. What were they going to do, urge her to rethink it and push for a relationship, even though Travis didn't seem the least bit ready for one? She didn't wait around to find out, waving quickly and backing out of the room. It all felt so uncomfortable, and she wondered if she'd made a mistake even talking about it. Travis seemed like the kind of guy who would pull her in and take her if he wanted to, but he hadn't done anything of the sort. Nora hadn't ever had trouble attracting men, but she might not be his type. Anxious to get her mind on something that made a little more sense, she pulled out her phone when she was in the elevator and returned Danny's call. If he was as good as she remembered, it was possible he already knew exactly where Harrison Shotterham was. But her call was never answered, and instead, when she reached the hospital's main lobby, she received a text message from him containing only an address. It made Nora wonder if Danny knew anything about the Talkatron gang, or maybe sending cryptic addresses via text was the natural behavior of everyone worried about being overheard. The address happened to be for the Space Needle, as it turned out, hinting that Danny might have been simply sightseeing. It was dark by the time she reached the grassy grounds of Seattle's most famous landmark, the spindly needle stretching over 600 feet into the sky, but she didn't have time to admire the way the lights and the rain gave it a surreal glow. On the way over, she'd heard from Angkor that he needed to speak to her immediately back at the division office about Aaron Clausen. It sounded like something big, but there was no way it was bigger than pinning down Shotterham and freeing Jenny Iverson from his torment. Standing directly underneath the needle, just inside where giant raindrops cascaded from its edge, Danny Polk stood about innocently in a soaked T-shirt and jeans. His hands were stuffed in his pockets and he must have been freezing. I couldn't talk about it on the phone, he said. I know. Someone could be listening. Danny couldn't be too careful when it came to eavesdropping, but making sure he didn't die of a chill from being dressed inappropriately was beyond him. Have you located him yet? Danny was taken aback, raising his eyebrows. I'm a hacker, not a miracle worker, he said, doing his best McCoy impression. He took his hands out of his pockets and crossed them in front of his chest. Besides, I thought you wanted me to tell you what we were going to do before we did it. Wishful thinking, I guess. I really just want to nail this guy and see the look on his face when he knows he won't be getting away with anything he's done. Right, Danny nodded. The best way to do that is to figure out whose identity he's going to compromise next. You see... At this point, he's like a parasite. He knows any use of his own name is certain doom. That means he's forced to live off of other people without their knowledge. I get that, Nora agreed, urging him to go on. So, all we have to do is cast a wider net and wait for him to break into another account. What we do is set it up so that we're monitoring the contacts of the current set of victims, who also live in Seattle, for intrusions. We might even go so far as two degrees of separation. If there's any suspicious behavior, we'll know. Nora cringed. She could tell he was phrasing it in the nicest way possible, but what he really wanted to do was to break into those accounts himself and monitor them from the inside to see who else traipsed through. She sighed when she realized it wouldn't work, even if they put the ethical part of it aside. But Danny, he's using proxy service to cloak his whereabouts. You're not going to find out where he is this way, she said. But a sly smile crept onto his sinewy boy band face. That's only part of how they work. Yes, once a user goes to a proxy server site, they can use it to troll around freely. But there's still a ping from their actual IP address when they go to access the server's site. 
I can tell from the previous fake IPs which one he's using. The trick is to identify who visited the proxy server right before one of these accounts we're monitoring gets compromised. Nora nodded, not surprised that he had a better understanding of how these things work than she did. I still don't want to do it, she said. We've got to find another way than to break the laws we're trying to uphold in the hopes Shotterham happens to pick a new target that you've already breached. I said nothing illegal. Danny scowled and wiped some of the water from his hair. Nora, this guy isn't sloppy about what he does. We've got to fight fire with fire or else he'll be able to go on with impunity for as long as he wants. I'm telling you, if we keep our eyes on enough people, we'll eventually get him. No, we're not going to do it. Find something else, she said, looking him directly in his eyes. He'd said it himself before, that if they caught him in a way they couldn't explain to a jury, it would cost them the entire case, plus her job. Come on, Nora. We can make this work, he pleaded. No, let me know when you have something else. She turned and marched along the sloping lawn, leaving him there in the dark behind her. The terms of the job had been clear, but he'd risked it all by proposing a plan that would fly afoul of cybercrime laws. Nora knew it didn't have to be done like that, but she was lost for an alternative. Given enough time, Danny would come up with a stroke of genius. The pressure got to her as she returned to the FBI offices to meet with Angkor. She pulled the van into the lot, turned the engine off, and slumped against the steering wheel. Too much had happened today, including the bloody end of the prescription drug dealers, but they were still spinning their wheels when it came to Harrison Shotterham, who was somewhere in the city, stalking and killing under any number of aliases. Angkor had a private office on the building's fifth floor that was decorated with a golden statue of a Buddha figure. When she stepped in, he met her with a friendly smile and urged her to take a seat in the black chair beside his desk. You look pretty strung out. I heard your day had plenty of fireworks, he said. It did, she said, straightening up. Strung out was not how she wanted to come across. What's going to happen to young Miss Robex? A lot of that is going to depend on what the DA decides. She was involved with her operation, but she was instrumental in taking it down. Most likely she'll have some penalty to pay, especially if Mirren continues to put his thumb on the scale. The most important thing is that she'll have her life and a chance to move on. Angkor nodded thoughtfully and adjusted his tie. He seemed all too comfortable working into the evening on a Friday, as she was. This job seemed to draw people who couldn't manage to call it a day. I wanted to meet with you in person, because I've discovered a few things about Aaron Clausen that might cast some light on what happened to Ricardo Lantham. I try not to show it, but this case is one I've taken personally. My family immigrated to this country when I was six years old. We had nothing and were living in near slums, but with a lot of hard work and help, I was able to make it up to where I am now, supporting my elderly parents and working to give my kids the best shot possible at a good life. So I sympathize with anyone trying to start a new life and make it here. When Ricardo's sister Isabella first put us onto the possibility that Clausen had a hand in his death, that she was responsible and had injected the poison herself right at his desk, it gave me chills. But the thing we couldn't figure out is why she would do that to her boyfriend. I've spent some time checking her out, and what I've found doesn't look good at all. What did you find? Nora asked, leaning forward. She remembered the things Isabella Lantham had said about Clausen, who had lied right to Nora's face about seeing their suspect hanging around her place of work and having been in the bathroom when the potassium chloride had stopped his heart. It had all been an act to throw them off the scent. Angkor glanced at the computer screen and the spreadsheets it displayed. We know that Erin Clausen started her cleaning supply shipping business Spick and Span once she left college, but what we didn't know was how she has been using the company as her own private piggy bank. I've been looking closely at the profit and loss statements, tax filings, and Clausen's own accounts. She's been stealing from her own company for what looks like unrestrained greed, and there's no way that additional income was reported properly on her own taxes, he explained. Nora nodded. 
She knew enough about business to know that startups and small companies did often have all of their profits flow directly to the owner. But once the business grows, the owners have to take a salary like everyone else, which can be hard to accept. Okay, but where does Ricardo Lantham fit into that? she asked. Angkor already had the answer on the tip of his tongue. Since he was her personal assistant, he had access to all of the company's financial data. From what I understand, Clausen still did a lot of the accounting herself, for obvious reasons. But at some point, he must have stumbled onto what she was doing, which threatened the livelihood of everyone at the company if it suddenly doesn't have the necessary cash to operate. My guess is Clausen found out. They may have had an angry fight in which he mentioned exposing her, and she took the opportunity to piggyback on Jenny Iverson's misfortune to commit murder and claim to be the victim, Angkor said. But do we know for certain that he had knowledge of Clausen's embezzlement? she asked, deflating some of Angkor's enthusiasm. It would certainly be a lot easier to tell if we had his laptop, which would absolutely have a record of the various documents he'd opened and worked on. If we aren't able to find it, some of that data may be stored in emails and in cloud storage. It'll take a lot more work, some subpoenas, and Clausen's full awareness that we're going after her. But I think we can do it. Depending on how fast the paperwork turns out, we might put the cuffs on her late next week, he said. Nora had wondered about what had happened to that laptop since Isabella pointed out it wasn't with the rest of Ricardo's belongings. If murder and embezzlement weren't enough, what was stopping her from trying to dispose of the evidence? Homicide aside, what kind of penalty does Clausen face for what she's done taking her own company's money? Nora asked. Angkor shrugged and leaned back in his chair to think. It depends on the full scope of it. But just for misusing the funds, the letter of the law would mean quite a bit of jail time and fines equal to the sum taken. Assuming she was able to cut a deal, as would be likely to happen if that was hypothetically her only charge, she'd probably dodge the jail time for community service and be stuck with the fines for that charge and some for tax evasion. How that would shake out within her company would have a lot to do with whether she was contrite about it. Considering how strong-willed Clausen had been to the federal agents working her case, Nora wasn't sure she had it in her to apologize for such a big mistake. Either way, with the murder charge added in, Clausen would spend a substantial portion of the rest of her life behind bars. So what do we do from here? I think it's fine to give it the weekend to continue to think about it and then work on getting those documents next week. There are still more questions to be answered, like where the syringe that was used to kill Lantham is? But because she's tied to the business, I'd say Aaron Clausen is a low flight risk. We can wait until we have the case wrapped up with a bow before bringing her in. He smiled in satisfaction, a feeling that Nora could share wholeheartedly. It's just such a strange feeling, you know, getting into the FBI to find out the truth and having people lie straight to your face, make up stories, and then tamper with evidence that you didn't know you needed. I expected it, but it's another thing to experience it. I couldn't imagine lying to an officer, knowing what the consequences would be for that alone, Nora lamented. Hey, now you're starting to think like a criminal. There are people out there that you'll come in close contact with who will think they can profit by hiding it. They think they are the ones who will be able to outsmart you, like you're just a dumb foreigner who happened to land a plum government job for diversity reasons. There's no real science to knowing who's lying and who's telling the truth. You have to feel it in your gut and use that feeling to keep your head above the lies, Angkor said. It was something worth thinking about that he'd obviously gained over his years at the Bureau. Nora smiled. Working with a professional like you has been a pleasure. I'm going to miss you when I return to Albany. Chapter 28 Greer Residence 5 Southwest 144th Place When Nora returned to Casa de Greer, roughly around 10 o'clock, she felt so exhausted her body was threatening to shut down without her permission. But when she opened the door and found Loretta, Marshall, and Kent still up together in the living room, she felt obligated to delay her trip to bed until she'd asked how Travis was doing. The procedure went fine, and then they ran a few tests, Marshall said. And he passed those, too, with a 65, 
Kent added. That's great, Nora said, summoning some cheerfulness. So you think you'll have a complete recovery? I'd agonize over it for the rest of my life if I'd been right there and hadn't prevented it when he received a wound that wouldn't go away. Loretta leaned back in her chair and set down her book. He'll be right as rain, and a bullet to the arm isn't nearly the worst thing my boys have gotten themselves into. Back when he was ten, Trav decided he was going to climb up Bridal Vale Falls barehanded. He made it up most of the way before losing his grip and falling forty feet into the river. Course, Kent's no better. He once put a deer lick under a tree, waited from a branch until one came by, and jumped down and tried to ride it. But that's enough gab for me. How are you? Just fine, thanks. It's been a tiring day, she said, noticing that all three of them were watching her with a look of concern in their eyes. Is there anything we can get for you? Hot tea? Bath? I could harvest a few veggies from the garden and whip up a quick omelet, Marshall offered. I think I'm just ready to call it a night. All right, then. Sleep tight. We went ahead and cleaned your sheets and did your laundry. Hope you don't mind. Looked like you were a little low on hairpins, so I gave you some of mine, Loretta said. That's nice. Thank you. As Nora started back for the stairs and wished them a good night, she eked enough perception from her foggy mind to recognize that the concern they had and the kind things they did were because they were worried about her. It was similar to what she saw in them right before they had parted at the hospital, when Kent had blurted out the possibility of a relationship. Now they were practically trembling with fear that they'd ruined it for Travis. Heading up the stairs and leaving them behind, she pondered how ridiculous that was. Travis was the kind of guy who could get a girlfriend at the snap of his fingers. So why were they so worried that his chances were damaged with her? And what had she really done to impress his family that much, anyway? They'd made dinner and talked here or there. None of it made sense. What did it mean that they thought she'd be so put off by one question that she'd completely eliminate the possibility of a relationship anyway? It wasn't like it was even completely up to her. The moment when she crawled into bed couldn't come soon enough. She felt the soft, clean sheets against her thighs as she climbed in and pulled the covers up. The lights were off and her mind started to unwind. When it was all behind her and she began to drift from consciousness, her phone started ringing. The sound bored its way through her ear and into her mind. She briefly considered ignoring it, but it kept beeping. Finally, she lurched out of bed and fumbled in the dark for it. The call was from Isabella Lantham. Hello, she said, trying not to sound too groggy. I... I'm sorry for calling so late, but I needed to talk to you, Isabella said. Her voice sounded strained, making Nora wonder what was going on. Maybe some more of Clausen's moving men came back to her apartment. Don't worry about it. I told you to call whenever you needed to. Just tell me what's going on. A pause ensued that endured long enough to suggest that there hadn't been anything spurring the call. There's something strange going on, Isabella said at last. One of the ways my brother and I would chat with each other was on AOL Instant Messenger, using the same accounts we used to chat across classrooms when we were kids. You remember it? We're probably the last ones in the world still using it. Sure, I know what it is. But the thing is that his account appears to be active every once in a while as if he's online. It happened first a couple of days ago, and I thought I was imagining things. But it just happened again, and I'm kind of freaking out. I tried sending a message, but there was no response. Does this mean he's out there somewhere, like he's not really dead? Isabella's voice grew more emotionally fraught. It was painful for Nora to see her leap to conclusions that were so utterly impossible. I really appreciate you calling me about this. There's no way this changes anything about what happened to your brother. But it does mean someone is out there using his laptop. AIM is relentless about finding an Internet connection right as soon as the computer is activated. I'm willing to bet the person using the laptop wasn't even aware that program was running in the background, Nora said. 
Oh, I see, Isabella said. But who do you think has it? I've got a good guess. But I also think that this is your brother's way of pointing us straight to his killer, even after he's gone. Chapter 29, 701 North 36th Street, Fremont Neighborhood, Seattle Are you sure you want to go in there alone? Angkor asked Nora. They were in a van parked on the side of the street outside Aaron Clausen's house which was a short distance away from the famous Fremont Troll under the bridge. It was late Saturday morning. Nora took one more look at the pleasant two-story home with the lilac bushes out front dripping from the rain. After a deep breath, she nodded. It'll be better this way. She won't feel so backed into a corner where she might lash out, Nora said. Plus, I've got the wire. I'll be listening. If anything happens, I'll be in there in a heartbeat. And there's something I've learned from my experience. You never know who the fighters are. In her current state, with everything she's done, she might do something unpredictable and irrational. Be prepared for it and don't turn your back on her. Nora nodded and popped the door to the van open. Knowingly putting herself in a room with the killer was another thing she'd never thought she'd do. But after all that she'd learned about Aaron Clausen and Ricardo Lantham, one last shot to connect and get her to voluntarily turn over the laptop and come in wasn't too much to ask for. The stone path had small lights at its sides and led to a blue door. Everything was immaculately maintained, pristine even, which was a wonder considering how busy Clausen was with her business. Nora stepped underneath an awning and wrapped her knuckles against the door's exterior. For a moment she wondered if Clausen would pretend not to be home, despite her shiny new BMW parked clearly in the driveway. Had she paid for that car with money she'd siphoned out of her own business? The door in front of Nora opened slowly, making her sure she'd find out soon enough. Agent Wexler, Clausen began with visible annoyance. What are you doing here? Is there something I can help you with? Clausen wore a faded T-shirt, pajama pants, and slippers, so very different than the pants suit she always had on at her place of business. But beyond her casual clothing, what really caught Nora's attention were her red eyes. She'd been crying, and Nora surmised it was either out of guilt or fear. You don't mind if I come in and ask you a couple of questions, do you? There are a few things we didn't cover, she replied. Glancing past Nora to the van parked by the street, Clausen set her jaw and reached to close the door. I'd really rather not. Can't it wait until Monday when we can speak at my office? I know my rights and I don't have to let you in, she said. Seeing her chance at having a real conversation slip away made Nora's heart jump. If she had to leave empty-handed, it would give Clausen a chance to dispose of the laptop. Is that because you're hiding something? Nora blurted out, eliciting a response that bordered on antipathy. Clausen stopped closing the door. I knew it was only a matter of time until you came around to pointing the finger at me. You want to come in? Fine. Aaron Clausen stepped away from the door, leaving it open as she retreated into the house. Nora stepped inside and quickly wiped her shoes on the mat before continuing on to the light green carpet in the living room which had shelves decorated with dozens and dozens of ceramic dolls. They were everywhere, on the coffee table, filling shelves on the walls, and in an old cedar cabinet not a foot away from the chair Clausen occupied. Nora took a seat on the edge of the couch. Her host seemed relaxed enough, but she couldn't let her guard down for a second. Otherwise, she might find herself with one or more of those dolls smashed against her skull. The pair sat in silence for a moment. Nora was content to let her speak first, sure it would give her the upper hand. After a minute, Clausen rolled her eyes and cracked. Why don't you tell me all about how I killed my boyfriend at his desk where he worked? Clausen was getting worked up, as was expected, but Nora remained calm. There was a way to get the truth out of her. Aaron, don't call me that. We're not friends here having brunch together on the weekend. Just tell me. Nora took it in stride, letting the anger in the curt tone wash over her. This doesn't have to be difficult or contentious. I'm really only here to talk. 
I'm going to tell you how it looks. You can tell me your side of it, and we can decide what to do from there together. Go ahead. How did I kill him? I figured you'd run out of other possibilities and end up arresting me when you had nothing else to go on. Nora smiled faintly and nodded out of understanding, not agreement. Let me tell you what I know. There isn't a doubt in my mind that you cared very deeply for Ricardo Lentham. It might not have seemed a natural fit because of your differences in age and background, but love transcends all boundaries, and the two of you drifted together more quickly than you ever expected. You decided to keep the relationship a secret, not because you were ashamed of it, but because you were both professionals who didn't want to make your colleagues uncomfortable, Nora said. Clausen flinched and shook her head. That's not what I asked for. I know you're here because you think I poisoned him. Come on, get to the point already. Nora cleared her throat and took a deep breath. The calmer she was, the more agitated it seemed to make Clausen. I had an interesting experience talking to Ricardo's sister, Isabella. From what she said, it seemed like you never expected to end up with a Latin man, and maybe hadn't even spent that much time around people from diverse heritages. What I want to know is if you found it difficult to let him into your life. Can you tell me about that? Clausen threw a hand into the air and let it drop onto the top of her head. You don't really care about any of that. You want to know about the potassium chloride in the warehouse, whether or not I was really in the bathroom with the vent on while he was dying, and if I did it in some kind of response to Jenny Iverson's fiasco, Clausen rambled. Bells were going off in Nora's head, but she kept playing it cool as Clausen spoke with almost no inhibition, already voluntarily adding vital credence to some of the theories they'd had about the murder. But it would take just a little more for the floodgates to break. Had you ever contemplated getting married to him? Yes, I did. Guilty as charged. Is that what you're going to arrest me for? You talked about how hard it must have been for me to let him into my life. But what you should really be asking about was if he let me into his. There was so much I never knew about him that he wrote in those secret files. What files? Nora asked. So close. The files on his laptop! Now it was time to turn the tables. So you admit that you have his laptop, that you confiscated it, and withheld it from the investigation, because you knew it contained evidence that Lantham was aware of the financial improprieties you perpetrated against your company. That was why you entered the warehouse and extracted a bottle of potassium chloride, injecting it into him at his desk when he came back with lunch from Asian Delights. It was the day after the package arrived at Iverson's office, and you saw a way to hide your crime in the shadow of her tragedy. Trying to throw us off the trail only became easier when Christopher Walden formed a link between you and the other Founders Club members. Isn't that right? Nora asked. It was too late for Clausen now, who stayed eerily still. She'd unknowingly put together the final link in the chain connecting her to the murder. Her faint smile and nod was enough for Nora to start thinking she'd be making the arrest within two minutes. That's pretty good, Clausen admitted. It sounds like you've got it all figured out. There's just one tiny problem with your theory. And what's that? Nora asked. It's all wrong! I never set a finger on card out of anything other than love, and I certainly didn't poison him and stand there watching him die, she said. This time it was Nora nodding confidently. Lawson had been lying to them from the beginning, and it began to look like she'd keep on lying right until they locked her in a cell. Forgive me if I don't believe you when all of this evidence suggests otherwise. You were there when he died. Your fingerprints were on the potassium chloride boxes in the warehouse, and you've got a darn good reason to want him to keep his mouth shut. Forever. But please, go right ahead if you need to indulge yourself. If you didn't kill Ricardo Lantham, who did? Nora asked. Lawson plucked a ceramic doll holding an umbrella and a cane from the shelf next to her and set it in her lap. Believe it or not, but the truth is I haven't told you a single lie. I was in the bathroom sick to my stomach when he died. My fingerprints showed up in the basement because I have my hands on everything that comes in and out of that warehouse. What? 
Do you think I spent all day cooped up in my office? I'm sure you found cards there as well and thought nothing of it. The fact is, he had no clue about any of the business's top-level financials. And it's a company laptop that I have every right to retain, Clausen said, her words beginning to grate on Nora. Now you're dodging the question. If you didn't kill him, who did? Clausen almost laughed, covering her mouth and grinning. <laughs> it's right there in front of your face, Agent Wexler. Though I guess I can't blame you too much for your ignorance, since I didn't start to figure it out until a couple of days ago when I started poking around on his laptop and found those files. Some kind of personal journal or memoir hybrid he'd been writing. You can't take it anymore, can you? You have to know right now. Ricardo Lantham killed himself at his own desk during lunch with the syringe and the potassium chloride. Nora flatly shook her head. No, that doesn't make sense. It's impossible. You say that because you still have no idea about the context, Clausen said, leaning forward. She seemed like a boss dictating to an employee, not the position Nora wanted to be in. But at the moment, she had no choice but to listen. What I had no idea about until I began reading his notes was that he constantly battled a deep and inescapable depression. Imagine my surprise being so close to a guy who was such an extrovert, a snappy dresser who enjoyed going out and socializing, one who had so much promise in his life. He suffered alone, never telling anyone that inside his head was an ocean of self-doubt, just waiting to pull him under. If I'd known, if he'd ever given me the slightest clue that he had feelings of worthlessness and isolation, I would have done so much differently. Everything I saw in him was optimism and potential. He had it in him to be so much more than a personal assistant. He had greatness in him. That's why I pushed him to apply for better jobs that would challenge him to grow. It was a struggle, but I didn't let him give up, even though the rejections were consuming him from the inside. Nora was awestruck, more sold on its authenticity by Clausen's watery eyes and gravelly voice than by the story. But why that day? Why right then, during lunch? When it became clear that other employers didn't see the potential in him I did, I realized that he needed to follow more in my footsteps by starting his own business. He had the charm, passion, and the skill to create something in the entertainment industry with his DJing that was bound to take off. We spent a lot of time putting the proposal together so he could apply for the entrepreneurship program at UW, the same one I took. It was his last best chance. But that day he found out in an email he'd been rejected. There was one final note on the laptop saying that he decided long before that if he didn't get in, he was going to kill himself because it would mean he was a failure and would never amount to anything. When Clausen finished her story and set the doll back on the shelf, Nora was speechless. Was it possible Lantham had really kept his depression from everyone? That he never sought help from his sister, his girlfriend, or any professional? I'll... I'll have to verify all of this, Nora said, getting choked up. Of course you will. The laptop is in the other room, and the file is named The Life and Times of a True Card. You're welcome to take it, but I recommend you have a box of tissues with you when you read it. It's a real tearjerker. The two of them sat there for a short time in silence. Nora pondered what Angkor was thinking about all of this back in the van. He'd been as sure she was a killer as anyone, but now, if what she said was true, she'd be almost off the hook. But what about taking money out of your own company? When you assign yourself a salary, you have to stick to it. What you've done has endangered everything you've been building for over a decade, Nora said. It was possible Clausen would try to lie or argue now that she faced a new threat, but everything she'd said about Lantham left her depleted of the will to fight. When I was growing up, my mother was an editor at a magazine making half as much as men doing the same job. She knew all about it but never said anything for reasons that I can't begin to imagine. But I've just always felt that I wasn't earning enough, that I was owed something more for the work that I've done. I know it was wrong, 
Lawson said, adjusting her thick glasses and brushing her black hair behind her shoulder. There are going to be consequences for that. I know. Silence ensued that was broken by a knock at the door, which turned out to be Angkor. He came in and checked out the laptop while they were still on the premises, and saw for themselves files amounting to nearly 100 pages, documenting everything from his move to Seattle from California to meeting Aaron Clausen to his downward spiral into a very dark place. Nora had been good about holding back her own tears until they finally left Clausen's home, with the understanding that officials would be in touch with her later about the financial improprieties. She felt for the first time they had really had the truth about what happened to Ricardo Lantham, a lonely soul who was always the center of the party. Suddenly, her phone buzzed in her pocket. Finding it was a call from Greer, she was ready to answer with bubbly questions about how he was doing after getting the bullet out of his arm, until he let her know he had something more serious to talk about. I've got it. I've figured out how to find Harrison Shotterham. There was something we missed, a clue he left behind that he can't hide from. Chapter 30 FBI Offices, Seattle Division Travis was chatting with the one tech specialist on duty that Saturday afternoon when Wexler and Angkor returned to the office. Her eyes wide and mouth open a little, she seemed almost tormented by the question of what he had discovered that would lead them to the killer. But even that degree of focus was shattered when she saw him standing there with his arm in a navy blue sling. My goodness, are you okay? she asked. What? I thought you might find it attractive. You know, a sexy sling? Maybe an eye patch to go with it? He said. That's enough with the jokes. I'm going to be fine, but it's a little tender and needs to stay in place for a while. At least I don't have some massive cast on it. Wexler shook her head and glanced at the computer screen. He'd been talking to the tech about the purchases from the stolen credit card numbers, but they were having a hard time getting the data he needed. Are you ready to get back into the van? We're going to go for a drive, he said, grabbing a jacket from the back of a chair. Where are we going? What did you find? I'll tell you on the way. We don't have any time to waste. Wexler didn't put up a fight, instead turning on her heel and moving with him for the doors. Ancor waved them off. I'm going to follow up with this cloth and stuff, he said, catching Travis's curiosity. It seemed like they'd been busy while he was trapped in the hospital. No wonder Nora had bolted from there earlier. As soon as someone went in the hospital, all of the good stuff happened. What did I miss? Travis asked. Nora shot him a quick look. Lantham was a suicide, she answered. Really? I wouldn't have guessed. We'd just come back from Clausen's house with the intention to arrest her for it. She had the laptop, which you saw in Ancor's hands. On it, there's this long journal from Lantham, cataloging a history of depression he hid from everyone. When he got rejected from a business program, he decided to end it. Travis continued along, doing his mental calculations with this new information. He'd have to get filled in on the rest of the details later, but he took her word for it that murder was no longer on the table when it came to Ricardo Lantham, and the case would wind down quickly. Anything about the location of the syringe? he asked. No idea. We'd search the area from top to bottom upon arrival. Might have to just give it up for lost. With that done, we're left with Harrison Shotterham, Nora said. Travis smiled. She was going to love what he came up with. And if this works the way it should, we might be able to reel him in very quickly. He got another inquisitive glance from Nora, but he was content to let her sweat it out as they got in the van and started east away from the city. She was still far from an expert when it came to navigating northwest Washington, but it didn't take long for her to recognize where they were heading. The cabin? Why are we heading there? We took down all of the profiles on the walls, grabbed the computer, and even went through most of the mail, she said, sounding incredulous. We missed something. There's a pattern we can use to identify him. By the time they made it to the old cabin out in the middle of nowhere on Gate Road, it was dim and drizzly out. The cabin was dark, 
and best they could tell, not a soul was around, though the backyard appeared torn up after they'd excavated the body of Raymond Jones. Even though Travis was an FBI agent with nearly a decade of experience, the sling over his arm gave him pause. I'm not going to be able to hit the broadside of a barn like this. On the off chance he came back, or there's someone around, you're going to have to be the one with your finger on the trigger. Nora nodded and readied her Glock as they got out and moved for the cabin. The door creaked as it opened, revealing the room of messy papers in tall stacks everywhere, exactly as they'd left it. Greer managed a flashlight just fine and confirmed the place was vacant. So what's this big find you came up with? I'm not seeing anything here that he hasn't been able to run from. Come with me to the kitchen, he said, stepping onto its dirty tile floor. He began opening the various cabinets and drawers, poking around in the garbage for wrappers. The bag of cat food was still there. Nora's eyes widened. She was already beginning to get it. Look at all this stuff he bought. There are packages of Oreos, goldfish, hot dog packages, Thomas's English muffins, single servings of butter. In the fridge, there's a two-liter bottle of Diet Dr. Pepper, mayonnaise, and a few cans of tuna fish. And for everything that's here, you can find packages of the same stuff in the trash. This is what he likes to eat, and he's buying it over and over, some of this stuff on a daily basis. I've been reading about data tracking programs and algorithms that flag patterns. What we need to do is catalog all of the stuff here, the kind of food, the brands, right down to the barcode number. Then we can run a program that scans area grocery stores for matches. It'll alert us any time these items are bought together, no matter whose card he's using. We might even find out from these previous purchases where he shops most frequently. Then, once he turns up, we go in and take him in. What do you think? The look on Nora Wexler's face couldn't have been happier. I think it's genius, she said, throwing her arms out and giving him a hug. Ow, oh, he said when she jostled his sling. Sorry about that. Anyway, let's get to work, she said, pulling out a pad and starting to jot down everything that was around them. I hope the tech guys don't take too long to put this together. Only one of them will be around this weekend, and it seemed like he had a lot on his plate already, Travis said. Wexler set the pencil down and turned to him, her eyes full of doubt. He couldn't figure out what it was or why she continued to look at him as the pause became increasingly prolonged. We can't have the FBI's tech guys do this. It'll take them too long, and to be perfectly honest, they aren't the best. We can't screw this up and miss our chance to get shot or him. What are you talking about? Travis asked. She took a reluctant step closer to him and looked into his eyes, asking for forgiveness with a look. There's a guy I've been meeting with about this. He's an old friend who's an expert at this sort of thing, she said. An old friend? An ex-boyfriend from college, actually. Now that it all made sense to Travis why she was sneaking off in the evenings and getting strange messages, the only thing that seemed to stick in his mind was relief that she wasn't seeing somebody else. And what do you mean, he's an expert? He's extremely good with computers, and there isn't much of anything he can't do on the Internet. To be perfectly honest, he's been involved with some hacking groups that have outstanding warrants against them she said. Travis took a step away and then doubled back with his hand over his mouth. He wouldn't have believed it if he hadn't heard it from her himself. He's a wanted hacker? Nora, are you out of your mind? You can't just feed people classified information about cases currently under investigation. I trust him, she shot back, putting her hand on her chest. But the FBI doesn't, especially if he's got a criminal history or if he's done anything illegal. It could ruin the whole case, not to mention cost you your job. It's your first year with the Bureau. If you'd been doing this for a decade like me, it'd be harder to get rid of you and you might get off with a slap on the wrist, he said. It was plain reckless, not the way he liked to do things. But your plan is so perfect because there's nothing illegal about it. We'll be able to get access to checkout orders as they're made, 
and even without any personal information, we'll know whether or not it's the guy we're looking for. One call to Danny, and we'll have this running before the day is over. If you bring this back to the techs at the office, say goodbye to the next few days. We could be going home by then with his case closed. It's your call. Wexler stared directly into his eyes and wasn't about to back down. Travis clenched his jaw, trying to find a way around it, but he knew just as well as she did that they needed some extraordinary help to pull this off. Fine, he said. There'd be implications for this. Keeping secrets from Johnson wasn't going to be easy. They might need some kind of story for this Danny fellow that made him sound like a more legitimate kind of expert one who could reasonably be considered an asset worthy of participating in an official investigation. As Travis stewed, Wexler made the call and began to describe the plan until she was cut off and told to meet them in person. They finished cataloging the contents of the kitchen and drove back into town toward an IHOP, where they met a skinny, brooding guy in his early twenties who looked like he hadn't seen the sun in his entire life. Travis reluctantly shook Danny Polk's hand and watched him pull out a laptop and start to get to work right there. You're sure this is going to work? Travis asked as they lounged in the booth while the hacker did his thing. Danny stopped typing and narrowed his eyes at Travis. Just as sure as your social security number is 0681589934, he said. I like to know who I'm working with. Travis clenched his fist, ready to reach over the table and wring his neck, until Wexler caught his arm around hers and held him back. She shot him a what-did-you-expect-for-insulting-him kind of look. He grumbled and leaned back against the seat, glancing out the window, when he happened to see Mirren walk by with a woman whose hair was just as bleach-blonde as his. Unbelievable, he said, sliding down in his seat. What? Wexler asked. Travis held her from looking back over her shoulder. It's Mirren. We have to leave immediately. Who would have thought everybody would be showing up at IHOP? Do you think he saw us? I have no idea, but a couple of agents meeting in secret with a guy pounding away at a laptop isn't going to lead to any good questions. Let's go through the back. Now. Travis dropped a $50 bill on the table and slid out of the booth. Danny, muttering to himself, closed the laptop and pulled the power cord from the plug before following them into the kitchen. When they walked through the door, they saw a guy in a filthy apron standing by the griddle, with a spatula in one hand and a cigarette in his mouth. He looked like he'd seen a ghost. Take that out of your mouth and never smoke in here again, or the only food you'll see will be served to you in prison, Wexler said stopping just long enough to make her point before she was dragged out of the nearby rear exit. The odds of Mirren recognizing one of the black FBI vans in the parking lot were too good to bet against, but there was nothing to be done but resume operations in a Starbucks a few blocks away, after Travis parked around back. It took another couple of hours that Travis spent watching the windows like a hawk, but finally their trap was in place. Based on these serial numbers... I can tell that there are three grocery stores that Shotterham frequents. I have set the program up so that it'll send you an SMS message every time three or more of these items are purchased together at any of these locations. You're right that some of the snack food and soda he likes would get bought at the same time on a regular basis, but they are also things that a lot of people might buy together. What you'll really want to look for is a combination of the snacks and the other items we found, like the hot dog packs, the butter, and the artichokes he has a thing for. Wexler nodded, taking out her phone to find the program had already sent its first message, a text displaying the time, the list of items, and the address of the grocery store. All right. We wait until we hear about a match. We get to the store as quickly as possible, we use what we know about Chotterham's chubby-cheeked appearance to identify him, and then we grind his balls in a mortar until they're a paste, she said a little too cheerfully. Everything except that last part, Travis added, but her enthusiasm wasn't dampened at all. This is going to be easy, right? Chapter 31 
Safeway, 1410 East John Street. The stores had closed for the night shortly after their meeting concluded, making it easy to grab a night's sleep without feeling like they were missing anything. But Travis and Wexler barely took time to scarf down some bacon and eggs the next morning before heading to one of the grocery stores to stake the place out in an unmarked Jeep Grand Cherokee. Leery of filling Johnson in on the details of their sting operation, they figured they'd camp out at the Safeway on East John and take the 33% chance that Harrison Shotterham would show up there. The other stores were a significant ways up and downtown, but if they moved quickly, they'd be able to get there in time to make the arrest and conclude the manhunt without any assistance. It wasn't long until Wexler's phone on the dashboard buzzed for the first time, sending them racing uptown for what turned out to be a false alarm. After two more went off almost simultaneously in two different locations, they realized that three-item matches were not going to be enough to pinpoint their target. A four-item match sent them driving downtown around 10 o'clock, but they concluded it was also a false alarm, even though they weren't 100% sure who had even made the purchase. This is getting ridiculous. That customer could be in their car a block away by the time we got here, Travis said. It would stand to reason that he'd come and get most of the things he needed at once, not a few at a time, morning, noon, and night, Wexler said. Deciding to raise the bar once again until they got a high-level match and then put everything they had into making it count, they drove back to Travis's home, where they could wait for the alarm a little more comfortably. With Travis at the wheel and a siren going, any of the grocery stores would be a three- to five-minute drive away. I'll tell you, what has this world come to when you can get arrested buying Cheetos at the Safeway? Marshall groaned. Oh, hush! You'd be happy as a clam as long as they let you keep the bag, Loretta said. The entire family, plus Wexler, were all sitting in folding chairs out on the front lawn, the agents seated not two feet away from the open car doors. The rain had finally come to an end, and except for a thick sheet of clouds above, it was almost nice out. But think about the loss of privacy. Now everybody's got to know everything I'm buying, Marshall went on. That level of privacy disappears once you start threatening bodily harm to other people. This guy has a history of killing people and taking over their identities. Are you saying we shouldn't do anything possible to try to bring him in? Travis asked, turning his head when Wexler's phone went off. Just three, she said, setting it on her leg. You know I don't have any tolerance for criminals, Marshall said, but it's just staggering to me that this killer's whole elaborate operation of identities and accounts could come crashing down just by having to get something to eat at the store. What's next? Little microchippies in the tap water to tell the feds if you didn't return your neighbor's lawnmower? You'd die of thirst, Pa, Kent said. He'll get it back when I'm good and ready. Well, it hasn't worked yet, Travis said, checking his watch. The rest of Sunday passed with only one more four-item match, which they decided to chase down just in case. It turned out to be a little old lady buying junk food for her tubby grandson, whom she was more than happy to talk about. But that left the entire day a waste without any credible leads. Soon enough, they were forced to return to the office for Monday morning's briefing, which presented the uneasy prospect of having to bolt for the door if it turned out Shotterham liked to stock his pantry at 8 a.m. Mirren was there as well, sending intermittent nasty looks their way, but Travis had no idea if he knew anything. When it was their turn to report, all Travis said was that they were continuing to protect Jenny Iverson while keeping an eye out for more identity thefts and fraudulent purchases that would point them to Shotterham. The meeting broke without any new alarm, but they didn't make it out of the recon room before Johnson stopped them. About Jenny Iverson, I'm pulling the surveillance team, he said, drawing a devastated gasp from Wexler. But you can't do that yet. We just need a little longer, and I know we'll have Shotterham neutralized, she said. Really? And why is that? You didn't report any new developments, he said, crossing his thick arms in front of his chest. Travis watched her carefully, wondering if she'd tell him what they were up to. 
On the one hand, Johnson really only cared about results. But his head might burst if he got a whiff people in his agency were working with someone they were trying to arrest. I just have a feeling we're going to get him soon, she said. It was all Johnson needed to pounce. That's all this case is now, feelings and guesses. There's been no communication since you tried luring him to Pike's Market, and no hint of his whereabouts since you discovered the cabin. There's been no attempt to contact or pursue Iverson for far too long to think he's still actively threatening her. But he told us he's waiting for us to back off. And who knows how many other people he's killing in the meantime, Wexler argued. But Travis could tell from the look on Johnson's face that it was over. Keeping tabs on her 24-7 doesn't make sense at this point. But if there's even a hint that she's in danger, we'll be there before you can say banana split. I think if we could just keep the surveillance for another couple of days, it would make all the difference, she said. Moving on, it's time to talk about your return tickets to Albany. Now that this case is on the back burner, we can handle it if anything pops up. The Ricardo Lantham suicide has been closed, and the Takatron drug ring has been eliminated. It's been a pleasure working with you here, and I wish you both the best with your careers from this point on. Travis shook Johnson's hand. I appreciate you letting us help you out with this one, Travis said. He shook Johnson's hand, but already the unsatisfied feeling had begun seeping into his stomach. Going home without catching the killer wasn't an ideal prospect. Shotterham needed to make his next run to the grocery store soon, or they wouldn't even be around to catch him when he did. I'm grateful for all your support, Wexler said, shaking his hand as well. Johnson passed on, and the pair strolled into the hall. Travis could tell Wexler felt stunned at being summarily dismissed from the case. He put his arm over her shoulder. Hey, we did some good work here. I'm sure we can put off the flight until Wednesday, just in case Shotterham turns up. Maybe it's irrational, but I don't think I can leave Jenny Iverson until I know she's safe, she said. I know what you mean. The magnetic way she smiles whenever you say something to her. The drive she has to start and run her own business. It's crazy that some competitor from so long ago would take losing to heart so much that he has been trying to give her life the most tortured end possible, he said. It sounds like you're starting to fall for her, Wexler said, raising an eyebrow. Some strands of her hair hung over her cheek like rays of sunlight. Travis shook his head. I wouldn't say that. I much prefer a woman in uniform. They headed down to their office space, where they found Angkor waiting for them with a note in his hand. What's this, some kind of going-away present? Wexler asked. Not so much. It's a thank-you note from Aaron Clausen that came in just a little while ago. Figured it might be something nice to remember those of us in Seattle by after you've had it home, Angkor said. The note came in a crisp, cream-colored envelope that Angkor handed over to Wexler. When she unfolded the paper, Travis saw the stilted, jagged handwriting Clausen had used to write it. As soon as Wexler started to read, she covered her mouth with one hand. What's it say? Travis asked. Getting thank you cards from victims or people involved in cases wasn't unheard of, but he'd never figured Aaron Clausen would be the type to express this much appreciation. She says she deeply appreciates all of the work we put into helping solve Ricardo Lantham's case, that her only regret is not finding the journal file sooner to save us so much of the trouble. She applauds our professionalism and diligence and doesn't hold anything against us. Then, at the end, she wishes us a future full of professional and personal success. That's nice, Travis said, shrugging at Angkor. He was already thinking about buying those tickets. It's all rotten baloney. Every bit of this is a lie, Wexler said. She raised her voice and clenched her fists. What? I could tell almost immediately. I just got this sense reading this note that I'd heard that voice, that style of writing before. It was from Lantham's memoir. She wrote both texts. Angkor's gawking expression turned into one of mirth. You've got to be kidding me. Are you saying she wrote all 100 pages of his journal 
just so she could try to cover up his murder as a suicide? And then once she got away with it, she blew it all by writing a thank you note? He asked, having trouble holding back the chuckles. That's exactly what I'm saying. In linguistic analysis, this is the equivalent of a smoking gun, Wexler confirmed. That means she did it all. Either Lantham knew about the embezzling or was bound to find out. So Clausen spent months fabricating this journal to keep the heat off of her when she finally did him in. And this note is just her smug way of rubbing it in. Although Wexler was steaming, Travis found some amusement in it as well. Trying to spike the football on us ended up proving her guilt. I guess we know what we need to do now. Within an hour, they had everything they needed to make the trip up to Spick and Span on Queen Anne Avenue, where they found Erin Clausen working studiously at her desk. When Agent Wexler stormed into her office, Clausen shot up from her seat with an open-mouthed look of terror on her face. Don't waste your breath with another lie, Wexler said. You're under arrest. Nearly every employee in the building saw their boss make the walk of shame through the hallways with her head down, to the vans parked by the street. Clausen made a few sputtering protests when she had taken a seat and thought for a moment in the vehicle, but the last lingering doubt anyone might have had about Wexler's discovery was soon washed away when they returned to Clausen's home on North 36th Street with a search warrant. By then, there were half a dozen agents with them, conducting a much more exhaustive search than the quick walkthrough they'd made when Lantham's death had appeared to be a suicide. In the basement, they found a syringe wrapped in a garbage bag full of towels. The murder weapon had both Clausen's prints and some of Lantham's blood on it. A little potassium chloride was still in the chamber, tying it all together with a neat little bow. Once the search had concluded and it came time to leave, they discovered news trucks were packed so thick outside that they were blocking the street. Whether someone in the department or a spick-and-span employee had tipped them off, no one would know, but it would cast an uncomfortable spotlight on the operation. They could defer a public statement to Johnson, but neither Travis nor Wexler were anxious to leave Clausen's living room to wade through a swarm of reporters. No doubt they were already filming live for the major news networks. When further delaying their exit was no longer a possibility, Wexler's phone buzzed in her pocket. What number is it? Travis asked, thinking about the nightmare of trying to make it away from the packed street and race across town with a dozen news trucks in tow, all while they still had Aaron Clausen waiting in the back seat. But Wexler shook her head when she glanced at her phone. It's a call from Jenny Iverson, she said before answering. Hello? Travis stood around while Wexler conversed with Iverson. The dialogue he heard consisted mostly of yas and ahas, all of them strained, until she finished by telling Iverson they'd have somebody right there. Don't tell me, Travis said. Wexler pursed her lips. She got another email from Shotterham while she was having lunch at home. He's promised to kill her within the next 24 hours, she said. Unbelievable. Do you think he noticed this news coverage and saw an opening? He asked. Wexler nodded as he went on. Let's get somebody to round her up and bring her to the offices. She shook her head. That's not all. She read one line to me from him, warning her not to hide with her FBI friends in their pig pen before it goes boom. All feeling short of grim determination drained from Travis, who couldn't imagine a bigger catastrophe than the bombing of the city's FBI offices. Shotterham had no inhibitions anymore. Nothing was holding him back. Either he was going to execute his plan, or they were going to find him first. Chapter 32, 701 North 36th Street After sharing the terrible news of Shotterham's threat with Johnson, Travis learned that they were in even more of a bind than they thought. Johnson immediately ordered them to return to the offices to help with an evacuation, while they searched the building and the area for any trace of explosives. Everyone would be doing that as well as setting up a perimeter in case someone planned to drive a car full of explosives into the building, leaving absolutely no one to help Jenny Iverson, since her surveillance detail had already been dismissed. Travis recalled that Shotterham had previously broken into Iverson's home without a trace, 
meaning he'd easily be able to do it again. What do you think? Angkor asked. His arms were crossed over his chest and he appeared nervous. Travis and Nora exchanged glances. Angkor, we need you to take the van with Clausen in it to the Seattle PD's lockup before heading back to help. We're going to pick up Iverson ourselves. Nodding in agreement, they exited the building and went for their vehicles. The rain had started up again, but did little to dissuade the journalists from hounding them. They'd only become more ravenous when they knew a much larger threat was still looming over them. But first, they needed to make it over to Iverson's home near Genesee Park. Shouldn't I drive? Wexler asked, gesturing to the sling around his arm. Travis bristled at the implication. This won't slow us down at all. Get in. Once they climbed in the van and shut the doors, Travis hit the gas pedal and jumped the curb to get around some of the pesky news trucks, tearing up quite a bit of marshy lawn near two adjacent houses. The thick sheet of clouds above made it feel like dusk, and after just a few blocks, the rain started coming down so hard that visibility became a handicap that even Travis had to accept. What if Shotterham gets there before we do? Wexler asked, exacerbating his sense their drive was progressing at a snail's pace. Call Iverson and tell her to lock the doors, then lock herself in her bedroom, barricade it with whatever furniture she can, and then hide somewhere away from the doors or windows. Call Seattle PD and see if there's anybody in the area that can get there before we do. Call your buddy Danny and see if there's any way he can tap into the home security system and let us know if there's an intrusion. Travis, this phone can only make one call at a time, Wexler said, frustrated. Then technology needs to fix that. He finally pulled the van onto I-5 and started south on the elevated highway. It took them close enough to the downtown area and the FBI office that they could see the traffic backed up around a flurry of flashing emergency lights. They only caught a glimpse before they sped on down the road, but it looked like the bomb threat had thrown everyone into chaos. Jenny, I need you to listen to me. We're coming as fast as we can, but you have to lock yourself in your bedroom until we get there. No, we don't know what he's going to do. Once you're in the bedroom, push your dresser in front of the door and hide in the closet. Don't say or do anything until you hear that we're there. Do you understand? A pause followed in which Travis presumed Iverson was getting herself in position. Okay, good. Yes, it's going to be fine. Wait, what? I can't hear you, Wexler said, pulling the phone away from her ear and seeing the call was dead. Trying to get Iverson back on the phone proved impossible. When Wexler turned to Travis, she looked disturbingly pale. I think her phone went dead. Flooring the gas and swerving around another vehicle, Travis wasn't going to lose a second getting there. They pulled off the highway a moment later and started east across town, blowing through a red light and missing a truck by inches. Traffic diminished as they got closer, but the minutes were still ticking away. We're almost there, Wexler said as they turned another corner. He might be in there, but there's no way he's gotten out yet, Travis surmised. The horrible thing about having Iverson lock the doors was it would do more to slow them down than Shotterham. When they pulled up in front of her home, the rain made it difficult to tell if anything had happened. No other vehicles were parked nearby. Wexler still couldn't connect to Iverson's phone. They jumped out of the van and went for the front door. Wexler had her Glock in hand, while Greer used his elbow to smash the small section of window in the door closest to the handle. He reached through and unlocked the door. Let me go first, she said, pushing open the door and stepping into the foyer. Travis was right behind clutching his gun in his left hand and really hoping he didn't need to use it. They found nothing while moving through the ground floor to the stairs, arriving at the bedroom door, which was also intact. While Travis guarded the door, Wexler checked the other rooms and signaled when she was sure the coast was clear. Jenny Iverson, we're here. You can come out now, he hollered. It took a few minutes for Iverson to dislodge everything she'd crammed against the door, but when they finally saw her, she appeared more than a little shaken. It felt like you were never going to get here, she said, sighing her relief. I'm sorry about that, and for the window, Travis said. 
We were convinced that Shotterham's plan was to distract the various law enforcement agencies with the bomb threat while he tracked you down. But now it seems like his plan involves something else that will happen later, before the 24 hours is up. What happened to your phone? Wexler asked. I don't know. It just cut out. It had me completely panicking, and it probably didn't help when I started banging it against the dresser top, Iverson said. He must have gotten access to it somehow. You'll want to leave it behind, break it in order to make sure that he doesn't have information about where you are or what you're doing with it. I can do that, Iverson said. Travis and Wexler returned to the ground floor, where they kept an eye on the front and back entrances from the hallway. What do you think his plan is? Wexler asked. Travis could only shake his head. He pulled his phone out of his pocket and dialed Angkor, not Johnson, and asked for an update on the situation at the offices. We found a half-dozen cars with fertilizer packing the trunks parked around the block. All of them stolen, and best we can tell, they've been on the street here for days. Every nearby building had to be evacuated. Hundreds of people were in the streets until just a little while ago, but they're starting to disperse, Angkor said. Any other signs? Working theories? Travis asked, getting a deep sigh that he could almost feel through the phone. We're not sure. There weren't any electronic detonators or explosives to complement the fertilizer. It's possible that could be delivered later, but he must have known we'd easily find these cars, Angkor said. Wexler turned suddenly, her hair rolling over her shoulder as she faced Travis. What if the boom he's talking about isn't physical? Maybe he's gotten into the FBI servers somehow and is planning to shut them down, she said. It was a far better possibility than anything Travis could have come up with. Did you hear that? You're going to want to get the servers checked out. There's a chance he's trying to knock out all of our equipment. But if that's the setup or the knockout punch is anybody's guess. Travis ended the call right before Iverson came downstairs carrying her phone in pieces, which they unceremoniously dumped in the garbage. They spent a few minutes trying to calm her nerves and work out where they could take her that would be safe, since the offices were not an option. I heard about what Aaron Clausen did. I can't believe I was friends with a killer. Do you remember when we were all looking at the Match.com profiles? She was trying to cover it up right in front of me. Sometimes you never know what someone's capable of, Travis said. She just couldn't seem to help herself. She went to such lengths to lie about what happened and keep her secrets buried. But it was never going to be enough, Wexler said. Wexler's phone buzzed in her pocket, hitting Travis with another jolt of annoyance. You can tell Danny he's a little late on the intrusion, he said. Wexler absently shook her head as she stared down at the rectangular glowing screen. No, it's the shopping program. The match is a six. Downtown, she said. Something grave was in her voice, and when they exchanged glances, something electric passed between them. It had to be him. Chapter 33, 4202-42nd Avenue South Nora watched Greer get up and move for the door. They had precious seconds to get over there if they were going to have any chance of catching Shotterham. The Safeway was only a handful of blocks away, but there was still no time to lose. We can't just leave her here, Nora called to Greer, halting him as his hand clasped the doorknob. Then what are we going to do? Have her hide in the back seat? Can someone please tell me what is going on? Iverson asked. We have a program running that will tell us when the items that Shotterham frequently buys are purchased together. A six is the highest match we've ever seen, she said. Iverson got to her feet and Nora followed her to the door, where Greer appeared to be coming unglued from the inaction. He could be in the parking lot by now. And he could be coming here right after. He won't have any trouble getting inside with that broken window, Nora said. Greer set his jaw. Fine, but taking her right to him is something that'll be questioned later. Won't he recognize the big black van? Iverson asked. She was putting on a gray rain jacket with a hood. Nora and Greer exchanged another look. It depends, she said. 
Let's take my car. It won't be as conspicuous, Iverson added. Suddenly Nora had second thoughts about bringing her along. No matter where they cornered him, it could be dangerous. Odds were he was armed. Are you sure you want to come? We don't have time for this, Greer said, pulling open the door. I'm not going to lose him. Me neither, Iverson said. The fire in her eyes surprised Nora, who followed them out of the door and into the rain. Greer took the keys from Iverson and climbed into the driver's seat of her dark blue Toyota Prius. Nora hadn't even shut the door when the vehicle started backing out of the driveway and spun onto the road. The sudden acceleration knocked her back against her seat. In seconds, they were doing over 50 down city streets, paying no heed to stop signs or red lights. Do you think he was stocking up for something? Nora wondered. Maybe he was getting supplies for whatever night of terror he'd planned. I don't know. I just hope he isn't rushing away from the checkout. We waited far too long to get moving, Greer said. Pain appeared on his strained lips, which Nora guessed was from clenching the bottom of the steering wheel and putting a sling in an awkward position. The rain continued to pour, fogging up the windows and making visibility low, even though the wipers were on high. Greer hit the horn and veered into the wrong lane to pass a truck. While there was hardly any traffic to speak of around 42nd Avenue, the area of Rainier Square Plaza, including the Safeway, was a bustling hub with dozens of shops and large parking lots. Turning another corner, they got stuck at a light where they could see the entire complex, including hundreds of cars sitting in the rain. Though they were merely specks in the distance, people could be seen rushing in and out of the Safeway in a steady stream. An unpleasant dose of pessimism paralyzed Nora. We're not going to be able to find him, she said. Come on, it's not over yet. We have a chance, Greer said, but it did little to buoy her. There were too many people around, too much time had passed, and he could be anywhere. Feeling drained of hope, she slumped against the door's armrest and put her face in her hand. She wondered if this light would ever change when she cast a disinterested glance at the vehicles passing in front of them from the right to turn the opposite way. One of the cars was an old brown BMW with a single male occupant that snapped Nora out of her lethargy. It's him! He's in that car! she said, nearly bursting. In the back seat, Iverson almost snapped her neck looking back as the car sped away. Are you sure? Greer asked. His hand was on her leg. I have no doubt. The cheeks, the short brown hair, and I even saw the birthmark near his ear. That's good enough for me, Greer said, pounding the gas pedal and swinging the wheel. He pulled out into the intersection and muscled in among the cars turning the opposite way. Horns blared, but he paid them no attention. Both Nora and Iverson craned their necks to keep the brown BMW in their sights. How many ahead is he? Greer asked. Six cars, I think. Okay, good. As long as we don't lose him, he'll have trouble spotting us from this far back. Call Ankor and tell him you've got a lock. He can get a police cruiser to back us up if they're still busy at the offices. While Nora juggled getting Ankor on the phone and keeping Shotterham in her sights from the passenger seat, they continued cruising in a southerly direction along Rainier Avenue, past where one would have gotten off to get to Iverson's home. At least he wasn't going to my place after all, she said from the back seat. But where else would he be going? Greer asked. A few of the cars in between them and their target turned off, but Greer hung back at a distance. He glanced over at Nora when she got off the phone. Angkor said he'll get somebody to head this way, or he'll find a way to sneak off himself. But Johnson is still keeping a tight leash on everyone. Angkor was surprised we didn't want to tell Johnson we had a sighting, Nora said. Greer bristled and adjusted the jacket around his neck. I'd like to avoid disclosing anything that would lead back to Danny, and happening to simply spot him in a car like this isn't going to fly. We need a better explanation, he said. It was awful to have to propose concocting a story right in front of the victim, but at the moment they didn't have any other choice. We can say he drove by Iverson's and we chased him, she said. 
Greer nodded. When the brown BMW turned left off of Rainier Avenue into a neighborhood around South Graham Street, there were no other cars left to conceal that they were trailing him. The well-to-do houses of the area were impressive, making Nora realize what an odd choice a vintage BMW would have been for Shotterham. Where do you think he's headed? Nora asked. Looks like up on the hill onto 52nd. Some of these houses go for way more than a million dollars, and you'd be hard-pressed to find a crack in anybody's driveway. I think he moved into another victim's home, someone with a lot of money, she said. Greer nodded. He casually spun the wheel to the left and took the turn up the curving road. Elegant abodes lined each side, often accompanied by hedges and tall trees. Which one is he stopping at? Greer asked when the brown BMW turned off the road and vanished into a driveway. The car slowed long enough for them to take a thorough look as they passed. House number 18. Let me see if I can find who owns it, Nora said, reaching for her phone. That's him, no doubt about it, Greer said. Nora glanced up to see Shotterham hauling his grocery bag away from the car and toward a porch with white pillars and a side door. Greer went past the house until he found another driveway, turned around, and came to a stop by the curb just out of sight. The house is owned by Mr. and Mrs. Yannick Rand. They're both in their 80s, like Raymond Jones. Greer gripped the steering wheel and released a deep breath. If Nora didn't know any better, she'd say he was feeling some nerves. Going after anybody is bad, but knocking off the elderly? It doesn't get scummier than that. I bet he put on some overalls and told them he was from the phone company or something and had to check on their line. Then when their backs were turned, he did them in. Because of their age, the banks might be used to people calling on their behalf anyway, he said, clearly revolted. I doubt the neighbors noticed much if they went missing for a while. It's only been a week or so since we forced him to abandon the cabin in the woods, Nora said. She glanced over her shoulder to see Jenny Iverson shivering in the back seat, her arms wrapped tightly around her waist. What are we going to do now? Iverson asked. Nora noticed Greer watching her and pulled back to face the rain drizzling across the windshield. A hedge blocked their view of the home. We wait or we go in, Nora said. Leaving her here alone is not an option, Greer said to Nora. There was no word from Angkor about anybody coming. Before she realized what she was doing, Nora clasped the passenger door's handle and popped it open. Suddenly, Greer had his hand on her shoulder. Going in there alone is not a good idea, Nora. I won't be able to help you with this one, he said. The way he ran his top row of teeth over his bottom lip was a curious display of affection. He was worried about her. But if she let him make sure nothing happened to her, she'd never be in a position to make anything happen. Nora had joined the FBI to stand up and take the fight to criminals, not to cower and calculate when they'd finally been cornered. Shotterham went right after me in my room at the inn. It's time I returned the favor, she said. Her resolution was absolute. Watch your back, he said, but he appeared increasingly tense. Thank you, Nora. Stay strong, Iverson said behind her. She stepped into the cascade of fat raindrops, holding her gun tight between her hands as she crept around the hedge. That night at the inn, when she'd headed inside to go after him alone, had been terrifying. But now she was focused and confident. Even though she'd never been in it, the house felt comfortable, like she already knew its layout and entry points. Sneaking alongside the front porch and continuing along the side, she ducked under a few windows and waited for any sign that her target was nearby. Quick glances through the glass showed her a dark, spacious interior, with carpeted floors and fancy artwork on the walls. The home had a large fireplace and wood stacked on tile in the corner. Coming around to the rear, she found the back deck had a screen lining and a walkway leading to the garage. Despite the incessant rain, everything felt so still. The flimsy door to the deck screen exterior had no lock and made no sound as she nudged it open. Being out of the rain was a relief. It felt warmer, too. 
After taking a careful look through the window at the reading room butting against the back of the house, she felt comfortable going to the back door. Its knob had been taken apart, requiring that she only push to open it. So much for Greer's theory that he'd conned the owners into letting him in. Once inside the house, Nora immediately became aware of some humming coming from the basement. It didn't sound like a water heater exactly, more like an extremely loud fan. She checked the living room and the kitchen, finding the grocery bag he'd returned with from the Safeway. The bag of Oreos was open on the counter. Several were missing. There was still no hint of Shotterham's location. Nora went to a door near the kitchen that she believed led to the basement, putting her ear against it and letting her fingers graze the handle. The humming was louder, but so was her breathing. Lifting the latch and pulling open the door revealed wood-paneled walls and a set of carpeted stairs leading down to a gaming room with a pool table. Some lights below cast a gentle glow. Nora crept down the narrow stairs, feeling completely dependent on her hearing to keep her alive. She was already imagining what would happen next in her mind. He'd be sitting at the computer when she appeared behind him with her gun drawn. She'd tell him to put his hands behind his head and submit. Maybe he'd cooperate, or maybe he'd make an ill-advised move, and she'd have no choice but to pull the trigger. When she reached the bottom and leaned far enough out to see the side of the room, she realized the glowing computer screens were farther away. She heard chewing sounds amid the humming, too. Her adrenaline began pumping, but before going toward the light, she glanced the other way when something hit her nose. The game room connected to a laundry room. Its door cracked open enough to give her an eyeful of two bodies on the floor by the washer and dryer. The rams had been covered in bleach and other chemicals in a crude attempt to cover their smell or aid in their decomposition. Either way, the sight was enough to make Nora gag. Enough was enough. She started the other way, silently stepping past the pool table and around the corner toward the origin of the light. The chewing sounds persisted. Nora raised her weapon and pressed forward until she could see the edge of one of the computer screens which displayed some computer code he must have been in the middle of writing. She opened her mouth in preparation to shout her orders until she took one more step and found the chair at the desk was empty. Coming a little closer, she saw that chewing sounds were from a YouTube video called Man Eating an Entire Bag of Chips. The munching sounds continued to grind through the speakers. Nora's phone buzzed in her pocket sending a tremor of fear rippling down her spine. Holding her gun out at the darkness around her, she reached for it and saw a text ID'd as coming from Yannick Rand. I still know you better than you know yourself. Chapter 34, 18 52nd Avenue That corner of the basement felt so far away from the rest of the world. The shadows, the stillness, the hum of the computers behind her. It was enough to pull her apart. She needed help before the trap was sprung on her. Using her thumb to navigate the phone without letting her attention drift from her surroundings completely, she tried to call Travis. She didn't know how, but he'd find a way to back her up. After pressing the button twice and then a third time, it still wouldn't connect. Don't you know three's a crowd, read another text that came in a moment later. Nora clenched her teeth, furious that he'd gotten into her phone as well as her email. She wondered how long he'd been monitoring it, if Shotterham had known they were following him from the Safeway. The solution struck her to buy more time. Once Angkor and a few others arrived, they'd storm the building like they did at the old marina. You're trapped in here, Harrison. The building is surrounded, she wrote, trying to calm her breathing when her phone signaled that he had begun composing a reply. It was a long one, making Nora wonder if she could get him so focused on the typing that it would distract him enough for her to get out of the basement. How can I be trapped in here when I'm all over the city in dozens of phones, wallets, and email accounts? What you don't realize is how tenuous the link is between your body and your life. When your body is cold and buried, 
I'll make sure your life goes on without you. You'll be part of my collection, one of my many tendrils. The aggravation grew in the back of Nora's throat. As best she could tell, the stairs were the only way down to the basement. Unless he was already down there with her, he'd have to come down that way to get her. She began typing a response, but the screen quickly flipped to a new text message, one to Travis Greer. Hey, it's over. One shot to the chest when he pulled a gun on me upstairs. The front door is unlocked. Nora watched in horror as the message went out to Greer, who'd be likely to stroll right into Shotterham's sights, all because she told him the coast was clear. Trying to bang out another text warning him to stay away was futile. None of the keys managed to function. Don't move, Nora. After that last note flashed across the screen, the entire phone went dead. Nora could barely breathe with the thought of seeing her partner gunned down by the front door in her mind. She was going to stop him no matter what it took. Sure the basement was vacant if Shotterham was covering the front door, she moved swiftly through the shadows and around the corner to the gaming room. A quick glance at the stairwell was enough to tell her the coast was clear, and in seconds she had ascended to the ground floor, where she could either go right to the front door or arc around through the kitchen and the living room. Best she could guess, the living room would give him the best chance to attack anyone who entered. Her body made decisions faster than her mind, leading her through the kitchen and dining room on her way to the living room. The carpet muffled her footsteps. Both hands were locked onto her weapon. The rain drizzled against the windows along the side of the house. When she moved into the living room, with its clear view of the front door, she found it to be empty. Almost. The click of the revolver's hammer came an instant before the cold steel of its barrel was pressed against the side of her skull. Let's try that again. Don't move, Shotterham said from inches away when she tried to tilt her head to look at him. He even sounded exactly like Christopher Walden, the man he impersonated. Nora shifted her focus to the front door, which remained fully closed. She'd entered the living room too quickly, allowing Shotterham to get behind her from his place near the wall. He was expecting someone to enter from the dining room, not the front door. What do you want? she asked. Her heart was pounding. I want you to realize what a fool you've been. If you'd really known anything, you'd know that text was only sent out to a contact labeled Travis Greer, not to his actual number. The message is floating around in the black ether of space, never to be found, he said. The arrogance started to come through in his voice, warping it into something coarse and repulsive. What are you going to do? He was breathing heavily behind her through his nose, possibly smelling her. I'm going to take your body, Mr. Greer's, and that vile wretch Jenny Iverson's, and put them all in the laundry room for cleaning. Then I'm going to take her car, which is parked right outside, and drive it out of town, where I'll trade it for another car I've stashed. After that, I'll be leaving the country, using some identification and funds from another gentleman who looks like me, he said. He had a shot at getting away with it all. The killings, the computer crimes, everything. If he slipped away now, tracking him down again would be like spotting a ghost in the morning mist. She wanted to see him and find some opening she could exploit, but tilting her head brought it harder against the barrel of the gun. Her mind raced. There's one problem with your plan. We're not alone, she said. At the sound of the gunshot, Nora ducked and dove for the floor. She fell on her side and watched another two shots knock Shotterham over the side of a nearby recliner. The gun slid out of his hand at the same time his eyes lost focus and all expression faded from his face. Travis stepped into the doorway, gritting his teeth. He'd left the sling behind, but his right arm still appeared to be killing him. Despite the injury, the shots had found their mark. Now we're even for that one you got at the marina, he said, holstering his gun. He touched his arm tenderly. Nora was still in disbelief. 
But how did you know? she asked, rising to her feet. It didn't make sense that he would be standing right there and had arrived just in time to save her for a change. He took a reluctant step forward, shaking his head. I realized I couldn't let you do this alone. I'd never be able to forgive myself if anything happened to you in here, not when I was so close and could have done something about it. And I say that, not just because of how it would rob you of an incredible life. It would have meant something terrible for me. How could I go on with my life, knowing the best part of it was gone forever? He asked. His stubbly cheeks and tousled hair were magnetic, but it was his eyes that got to her. The feeling they conveyed went straight to the core. What are you saying? She hadn't noticed how close he'd gotten until he was right there in front of her. He had a sheepish grin that could have melted ice. A hand pressed against her back, nudging her closer. It's standard practice to bury your emotions in the line of duty. But you have to trust your instincts to let you know when you're on the right track. Her lips parted to ask him what his instincts were telling him, excited and afraid to find out if he'd really go through with it. But she couldn't get out a single syllable before his mouth stopped her from saying anything. She closed her eyes and let the soft feel of his lips and his strong arms carry her away. She opened her eyes and he was still there, possibly even more handsome than before. Saving his life was one thing, but having saved each other locked them together. Everything was silent and still for a moment before reality started to creep back in. Is it weird we just kissed in front of the dead body? she asked. Travis scratched the back of his neck without looking away from her. Oh, you know, I almost forgot about him, he said, winking. He was telling me about how unnecessary a body is to having a life. I wonder how that's working out for him. Nora and Travis were still standing close enough that their sides were touching. There was so much work to do to wrap up the investigation, but Shotterham's killing and hacking spree was over, and Jenny Iverson was safe. They'd only managed to search his pockets when they heard a sound coming from the stairs. A long meow. Chapter 35, 18 52nd Avenue The rain continued to splash against the dark blue Prius, its owner huddling on the back seat. Travis crossed the lawn after retracing his steps through the home's back door, all the while thinking of how lucky he'd been that things turned out the way they did. If Shotterham had realized they'd left her out alone and managed to sneak out and get to her, his career would have vanished in a puff of smoke. He continued around the hedge and tapped four times against the rear windshield, giving her the signal that she should get out from under a blanket and unlock the doors. When she poked her head out to see him, she had a look of nervous anticipation on her face. He wouldn't have traded what he had to tell her for a million bucks. You can come out now. Shotterham has been shot and killed. There's nothing to worry about, he said. Iverson nodded, but still didn't seem to believe it. It took her nearly a minute to open the side door and climb out. Her chest rose and fell with each deep breath. What happened? Where's Nora? she asked. She's fine and will be coming out in a moment. We found something interesting you might want to see for yourself. I'm sorry for leaving you out here, but I'll be honest and disclose that if I hadn't gone in, things might be much worse than they are. Iverson waved her hand like she was brushing away a fly. Forget about that. What did you find? Travis reached into his pocket and held up a small silver key. This was lying on a dresser in a second-floor lounge near some computer equipment. If I'm not mistaken, I bet it's the same one he used to break into your house without a trace. It's possible that during your date, you went to the bathroom or something, and he was able to make an imprint and copy it, Travis said. Taking the key in her hand and taking a close look at its grooves, Iverson assumed a puzzled expression. I mean, it might be for my house. I'd have to check it against my key. But unless you know what my key looks like, what makes you think this was used to get into my house? She asked. Travis grinned. That's a good question. Come over here, he said, 
urging Iverson away from the hedge and toward the front lawn of the home he'd so recently entered. Nora stood in the window until she spotted them and then exited through the front door, which she left open. How are you holding up? Nora asked. From what I hear, we're all safe and sound, ready to put all of this behind us and move on, Iverson said. There's something you might not want to put behind you. A fluffy ball of orange fur crept through the doorway and meandered along the side of the front porch, both happy to be outside and yet adamant about not getting near the rain. Iverson gasped, her hand on her chest. Her eyes were welling up with tears. It's Dina, but... Travis put his hands in his pockets and chuckled to himself. Of course it would be impossible for Shotterham to send you your cat from San Antonio and have the package arrive even before you knew she was missing. What he did was find an identical-looking cat that he took with him when he flew there, sent its body in the mail, and then flew back and immediately abducted yours with that key while you were away at work. And it was all to try to channel attention for his threats on Christopher Walden, drawing us across the country while Shotterham continued to operate in Seattle. What's strange is that he decided to keep it as a pet, presumably as a psychological proxy, in lieu of actually having you. The cat food we found in the cabin was a tip-off, and that was one of the things he bought earlier today at the Safeway. For better or for worse, and regardless of how aware he was of it, his decision to hold on to Dina and keep her alive was part of what unraveled his web of identity thefts. At this point, Jenny Iverson had a smile so warm it could have melted ice cream. She sprang forward to the porch, jogged the stairs, and lifted the cat into her arms. Dina, did you hear that? You saved the day, she said, hugging the feline tightly to her chest. But maybe next time, if you want to get into trouble, you can just get yourself stuck in a tree. Travis strolled across the lawn and climbed the steps to join them. He took a long look at Nora, which he hoped would be one of many in the future. Why don't we try giving another call back to the Bureau? Maybe they'll finally decide they can spare someone downtown, now that we've neutralized the threat. Can't, Nora shook her head. My phone is busted. He managed to deactivate it. I'll make the call then, he said. Wait, something else is different, Iverson said, checking them out with the cat in her arms. You two have got quite the rosy cheeks. It must have gotten pretty heated in there. Is this normal for FBI officers when you finally caught the criminals? Or is something else going on? Travis and Nora exchanged quick looks. He was content to let her call the shots on this one. It's always such a rush to know you've made a difference in someone's life, she said, smiling. Travis nodded. I see. I agree that you've certainly made a difference in mine, she said. Why don't we all bring it in for a hug? Iverson threw out her available arm and wrapped it over Nora's shoulder. During the embrace, Travis decided it was high time to kick back a little and grab a drink. I think I'm about due for a break. These vacations are hard work. Chapter 36 Seattle Tacoma International Airport. I can't believe you're going to leave, Loretta said near the airport's security gate, wrapping Nora in a hug so strong it could have crushed stone. It's almost like you're part of the family. I know, Nora said, gasping for breath. I'll never flinch at the sight of a chicken getting its head chopped off again. When Loretta finally released her, Nora needed to lean against her bag's extended handle for support. And you. Next time you come out here, don't tell anybody. They're only going to make you work. Loretta gave Travis a similarly strenuous hug while the other Greers and Nora looked on. Travis caught eyes with Nora and smiled. Late the previous night, Nora had wondered if he'd stop by her room, but she'd never heard so much as a knock. It might have been that he was put off by doing anything in his parents' home, but Nora felt that taking it slow was more a matter of patience, a sexy sense of being in control. There had been other chaste kisses, but it didn't take seeing them for the Greer family to know sparks were flying. His family members weren't the only ones who had an idea of what was developing between her and Travis. After taking out Shotterham on 52nd Avenue, 
Nora discovered that Tanny Polk had already blown town and returned to Portland. It was a relief not having to have a tough conversation about why they couldn't get back together just because he'd done her a favor, but he was the kind of guy who'd be liable to ask her for something in return down the line. Without Danny, they might have never caught up to Shotterham, whose plans for that night after the bomb threat to the FBI offices was horrifying. They found evidence he'd been trying to develop a computer virus that would infect the FBI's mainframes and spill tons of confidential information all over the web. The fertilizer was a diversionary tactic, intended to create a flurry of communications that he could use to breach their systems. If that didn't get him anywhere, the automatic weapons and IED made it seem like he was bent on making something happen that day, even if it cost him his life. The prospect of a suicide bomber in downtown Seattle gave everyone pause. So what was wrong with that fella anyway that he kept going after that one woman? Marshall asked, stroking his beard. Why didn't he just start another computer company or what have you? Nora sighed and glanced at Travis. It wasn't until after the dust settled that we were able to find out a little more about him. It wasn't just that Jenny Iverson forced his company to go under, Nora explained. He'd taken out loans in the hundreds of thousands of dollars for it, most of which he still owed and was evading by taking on these other guises. Bankruptcy would have prevented him from gathering the capital necessary to open any other kind of legitimate service, so he decided to go underground. But there's more to why he fixated on Iverson. He was a lonely guy, feeling completely detached from the rules of society who had posed as Christopher Walden on other occasions to go on dates with women. She was attractive, successful, and roughly his age. From everything we've learned about him, this guy couldn't stand that she had bested him, and the way he chose to try to even the score was through online intimidation that spilled into theft and death threats. If I ever go crazy, at least I'll go out into the woods and not bother anybody, Kent said, getting a tap on the back and a smile from Travis. If that heifer has already been put out to pasture, Marshall said. The clock was ticking, and the time to get through security and board the plane for the long flight was approaching rapidly. Nora was about to open her mouth and say they needed to get moving when she spotted a tall man with a dark complexion and a snappy suit wading through the crisscrossing travelers. Look who it is, she said to Travis, who turned to look behind him. Johnson had a big smile on his face when he met up with them. You didn't tell me you were leaving now. I almost had to say there was a criminal on the plane to stall you, he said. Nora was surprised that he'd come at all after the pressure and doubts he'd thrown at them. We figured you'd be glad to have us out of your hair, she said. Johnson grimaced and shook his head. I know I tend to put my agents in a vice, but that's only because I know it can lead to better results. It's nothing personal. In this case, I'd say it worked perfectly. You helped close three different tricky cases, and I couldn't be prouder of the job you've done. I'm glad you feel that way, Nora said, starting to warm up to him. Johnson paused for a moment and leaned back on his heels. I questioned you early on, Nora, but those questions have all been answered for me. You've got what it takes to be in the criminal investigative division, and your knowledge of the Internet and social media has only been a plus. Don't let Boffman back in Albany tell you any different. Jenny Iverson, the Lanthams, and even Lori Robix all owe you a huge debt of gratitude, he said. After all that, Nora's head felt like it had been pumped full of helium. That's very kind of you to say, she said trying to suppress any excess giddiness. Johnson turned to shake the hands of Marshall and Loretta Greer. The two of you have raised a fine, talented man here. The two of you must be very proud. Thank you, said Kent, getting an elbow from his father. Absolutely, sir, we are. Agent Greer, we're lucky to have you with us at the Bureau. Truth be told, I think you forced Mirren to raise his game, he said. Nora held back a scoff, wondering what Mirren's game looked like when it wasn't raised. It's been a pleasure, Travis said, shaking Johnson's hand. You should be congratulating yourself for these victories as well. 
Your guidance and support were crucial. Johnson nodded and took a look around the terminal. In that case, maybe I'll celebrate by stopping off at the airport bar. The two of you have a safe flight and keep yourselves out of trouble, he said, waving to the group as he departed. Nora was still awestruck by the entire conversation. Maybe being tough was Johnson's way of pushing them to be better. After a few more hugs and salutations, Nora and Travis got in the security line for the flight. A short time later, Nora came to the end of the line, where a TSA agent stood behind a podium with a light. Identification, please, the woman said. Travis grinned as Nora pulled her creds from her pocket and showed them off. I'm Nora Wexler of the FBI. This has been Deadly Accounts, Agent Nora Wexler Mysteries, written by Jason Letts, narrated by Trudy Nodler. Copyright 2016 to 2020 by Jason Letts. Production copyright 2020 by Jason Letts.